Chapter 1 of The Money Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter 1. Which, being the first, is very properly the shortest chapter in the book. When Sylvia Marchmont went to Europe, George Bellew, being at the same time desirous of testing his newest acquired yacht, followed her, and mutual friends in New York, Newport, and elsewhere confidently awaited news of their engagement. Great, therefore, was their surprise when they learnt of her approaching marriage to the Duke of Ryde. Bellew, being young and rich, had many friends, very naturally, who, while they sympathised with his loss, yet agreed among themselves that, despite Bellew's millions, Sylvia had done vastly well for herself, seeing that a duke is always a duke, especially in America. There were also divers ladies in New York, Newport, and elsewhere, and celebrated for their palatial homes, their jewels, and their daughters, who were anxious to know how Bellew would comport himself under his new disappointment. Some leaned to the idea that he would immediately blow his brains out. Others opined that he would promptly set off on another of his exploring expeditions, and get himself torn to pieces by lions and tigers, or devoured by alligators. While others again feared greatly that, in a fit of pique, he would marry some young person unknown, and therefore, of course, utterly unworthy. How far these worthy ladies were right or wrong in their surmises, they who take the trouble to turn the following pages shall find out. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Two How George Bellew Sought Counsel of His Valet. The first intimation Bellew received of the futility of his hopes was the following letter, which he received one morning as he sat at breakfast in his chambers in St. James's Street, West. My dear George, I am writing to tell you that I like you so much that I am quite sure I could never marry you. It would be too ridiculous. Liking, you see, George, is not love, is it? Though personally, I think all that sort of thing went out of fashion with our great-grandmother's hoops and crinolines. So, George, I have decided to marry the Duke of Ryde. The ceremony will take place in three weeks' time at St. George's Hanover Square, and every one will be there, of course. If you care to come too, so much the better.' I won't say that I hope you will forget me, because I don't, but I'm sure you will find someone to console you, because you're such a dear, good fellow, and so ridiculously rich. So good-bye, and best wishes, ever yours most sincerely, Sylvia. Now, under such circumstances, had Bellew sought oblivion and consolation from bottles, or gone headlong to the devil in any other numerous ways that are more or less inviting, deluded people would have pitied him, and shaken grave heads over him. For it seems that disappointment, more especially in love, may condone many offences, and cover as many sins as charity. But Bellew, knowing nothing of that latter-day hysteria which wears the disguise and calls itself temperament, and being only a rather ordinary young man, did nothing of the kind. Having lighted his pipe and read the letter through again, he rang instead for Baxter, his valet. Baxter was small and slight and dapper as to person, clean-shaven, alert of eye, and soft of movement. In a word, Baxter was the cream of gentleman's gentleman, and the very acme of what a valet should be, from the very precise parting of his glossy hair to the trim toes of his glossy boots. Baxter, as has been said, was his valet, and had been his father's valet before him, and as to age, might have been thirty, or forty, or fifty, as he stood there beside the table, with one eyebrow raised a trifle higher than the other, waiting for Bellew to speak. Baxter. Sir. Take a seat. Thank you, sir. And Baxter sat down, not too near his master, nor too far off, but exactly at the right and proper distance. Baxter, I wish to consult with you. As between master and servant, sir. As between man and man, Baxter. Very good, Mr. George, sir. I should like to hear your opinion, Baxter, as to what is the proper and most accredited course to adopt when one has been uh, crossed in love. Why, sir, began Baxter, slightly wrinkling his smooth brow, 
So far as I can call to mind, the courses usually adapted by despairing lovers are in number four. Name them, Baxter. First, Mr. George, there is what I may term the course retaliatory, which is marriage. Marriage? With another party, sir, on the principle that there are as good fish in the sea as ever came out, and uh, pebbles on the beach, sir. You understand me, sir? Perfectly. Go on. Secondly, there is the army, sir. I have known of a good many enlistments on account of blighted affections, Mr. George, sir. Indeed, the army is very popular. Ah, said Bellow, settling the tobacco in his pipe with the aid of the salt spoon. Proceed, Baxter. Thirdly, Mr. George, there are those who are content to to, to merely disappear. Ah, oh, said Bellew. And lastly, sir, though it is usually the first, there is dissipation, Mr. George. Drink, sir, the consolation of bottles, and— Exactly, nodded Bellew. Now, Baxter, he pursued, beginning to draw diagrams on the tablecloth with the salt spoon, knowing me as you do, what course should you advise me to adopt? You mean, Mr. George, uh, speaking as between man and man, of course, you mean that you are in the unfortunate position of being crossed in your affection, sir? Also heartbroken, Baxter. Certainly, sir. Miss Marchmont marries the Duke of Hyde. In three weeks, Baxter. Indeed, sir. You were, I believe, aware of the fact that Miss Marchmont and I were as good as engaged. I had <laughs> gathered as much, sir. Then confound it all, Baxter. Why aren't you surprised? I am quite overcome, sir, said Baxter, stooping to recover the salt spoon which had slipped to the floor. Consequently, pursued Bellew, I am uh, broken-hearted, as I told you. Certainly, sir. Crushed, despondent, and utterly hopeless, Baxter, and shall be henceforth pursued by the um, haunting spectre of the might-have-been. Very natural, sir, indeed. I could have hoped, Baxter, that, having served me so long, not to mention my father, you should have shown just a, a shade more feeling in the matter. And if you were to ask me, as between man and man, sir, why I don't share more feeling, then, speaking as the old servant of your respected father, Master George, sir, I should beg most respectfully to say that, regarding the lady in question, her conduct is not in the least surprising, Miss Marchmont being a beauty and aware of the fact, Mr. George. Referring to your heart, sir, I am ready to swear that it is not even cracked. And now, sir, what clothes do you propose to wear this morning? And pray, why should you be so confident of regarding the, the condition of my heart? Because, sir, speaking as your father's old servant, Master George, I make bold to say that I don't believe that you have ever been in love, or even know what love is, Master George, sir. Bellew picked up the salt spoon, balanced it very carefully upon his finger, and put it down again. Uh, nevertheless, said he, shaking his head, I can see for myself but the dreary perspective of a hopeless future, Baxter, blasted by the haunting spectre of might have been. I'll trouble you to push the cigarettes a little nearer. Uh, and now, sir, said Baxter, as he rose to strike and apply the necessary match, what suit would you wear today? Oh, something in tweeds? Tweeds, sir? Uh, surely you forget your appointment with the Lady Cecily Prynne and her party. Lord Mountclair had me on the telephone last night. Also a good heavy walking stick, Baxter, and a knapsack. A knapsack, sir? I shall set out on a walking tour in an hour's time. Certainly, sir. Where to, sir? Haven't the least idea, Baxter, but I'm going in an hour. On the whole of the four courses you describe for one whose life is blighted, whose heart, I say, whose heart, Baxter, is broken, utterly smashed, and uh, shivered beyond repair, I prefer to disappear in an hour, Baxter. Shall you drive the touring car, sir, or the new racer? I shall walk, Baxter, alone, in an hour. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 3, which concerns itself with a hay-cart and a belligerent wagoner. It was upon a certain August morning that George Bellew shook the dust of London from his feet and, leaving chance or destiny to direct him, followed a haphazard course, careless alike of how or when or where, sighing as often and as heavily as he considered his heartbroken condition required, which was very often and very heavily, yet heeding for all that the glory of the sun 
and the stir and bustle of the streets about him. Thus it was that, being careless of his ultimate destination, Fortune condescended to take him under her wing, if she has one, and guided his steps across the river into the lovely land of Kent, that county of gentle hills and broad pleasant valleys, of winding streams and shady woods, of rich meadows and smiling pastures, of grassy lanes and fragrant hedgerows, that most delightful land which has been called, and very rightly, the Garden of England. It was thus, as has been said, upon a fair August morning, that Bellew set out on what he termed a walking tour. The reservation is necessary because Bellew's idea of a walking tour is original and quaint. He began very well for Bellew. In the morning he walked very nearly five miles, and in the afternoon, before he was discovered, he accomplished ten more on a hay-cart that happened to be going in his direction. He swung himself up among the hay, unobserved by the somnolent driver, and had ridden thus an hour or more in that delicious state between waking and sleeping, ere the wagoner discovered him, whereupon ensued the following colloquy. The wagoner, indignantly, "'Hello there, what might you be a-thinking of in my hay?' Bellew, drowsily, drowsily, "'Enjoying myself immensely,' the wagoner, growling, "'Well, you get out of that and sharp about it.' Bellew, yawning, "'Not on your life, no, sir, not for Cadwallader and all his goats.' The wagoner, "'You just get down out of my hay. Now come.' Bellew, sleepily, "'Enough, good fellow, go to, thy voice offends mine ear.' The wagoner, threateningly, "'Ear be blowed. If you don't get down out of my hay, I'll come and throw ye out.' Bellew, drowsily, "'Twould be an act of wanton aggression that likes me not.' The wagoner, dubiously, "'Where you be going?' Bellew, "'Where have you like to take me? Thy way shall be my way, and uh, thy people. Uh, so drive on, my rustic Jehu, and heaven's blessings prosper thee.' Saying which, Bellew closed his eyes again, sighed plaintively, and once more composed himself to slumber. But to drive on, the wagoner very evidently had no mind. Instead, flinging the reins upon the backs of his horses, he climbed down from his seat, and spitting on his hands, clenched them into fists, and shook them up at the yawning Bellew, one after the other. "'It be enough,' said he, "'to raise the old Adam inside of me to have a tramper on the road to snoring in my hay. But I ain't a-going to be called names into the bargain. Rusty I may be, but I reckon I'm good enough for the likes of you, so come on down!' and the wagoner shook his fists again. He was a very square man, was this wagoner, square of head, square of jaw, and square of body, with twinkling blue eyes and a pleasant, good-natured face. But just now the eyes gleamed, and the face was set grimly, and altogether he looked a very ugly opponent. Therefore Bellew sighed again, stretched himself, and very reluctantly climbed down out of the hay. No sooner was he fairly on the road than the wagoner went for him with a rush, and a whirl of knotted fists. It was very dusty in that particular spot, so that it presently rose in a cloud, in the midst of which the battle raged, fast and furious. And in a while the wagoner, rising out of the ditch, grinned to see Bellew wiping blood from his face. "'You be no fool,' panted the wagoner, mopping his face with the ends of his neckerchief. "'Least way it's not with your fists.' "'Why, you're pretty good yourself, if it comes to that,' returned Bellew, mopping in his turn. Thus they stood a while staunching their wounds and gazing upon each other with a mutual and growing respect. Well, inquired Bellew, when he recovered his breath somewhat, shall we begin again, or do you think we've had enough? To be sure, I begin to feel much better for your efforts, you see. Exercise is what I most need just now, on account of the uh, haunting spectre of the might have been. You offset its effect, you know. But it is uncomfortably warm work here in the sun, isn't it? Ah, nodded the wagoner. It be. "'And suppose we uh, continue our journey?' said Bellew, with his dreamy gaze upon the tempting load of sweet-smelling hay. "'Ah,' nodded the wagoner again, beginning to roll down his sleeves. "'Suppose we do. Hard above giving a lift to a chap as can use his fists. Not even he is a vagrant, and a uncommon dusty one at that. So, if you're in the same mind about it, up you get, but no more following curses, mind.' With which admonition the wagoner nodded, grinned, and climbed back to his seat, while Bellew swung himself up into the hay once more. "'Friend,' said he, as the wagon creaked upon its way, "'do you smoke?' "'Ah,' nodded the wagoner. "'Then here are three cigars which you didn't manage to smash just now.' "'Cigars? Why, well, it ain't often as I get so far as a cigar, unless it be squire or parson. 
Cigars, eh? Saying which, the wagoner turned and accepted the cigars, which he proceeded to stow away in the cavernous interior of his wide-eaved hat, handling them with elaborate care, rather as if they were explosives of a highly dangerous kind. Meanwhile, George Bellew, American citizen, a millionaire, lay upon the broad of his back, staring up at the cloudless blue above, and despite heartbreak and a certain haunting shadow, felt singularly content, which feeling he was at some pains with himself to account for. "'It's the exercise,' said he, speaking his thought aloud, as he stretched luxuriously upon his soft and fragrant couch. "'After all, there is nothing like a little exercise.' "'That's what they all say,' nodded the wagoner. "'But I notice as them as says it, ain't over fond of doing it. "'They mostly prefer to lie on their backs and talk about it, like yourself.' "'Ah,' said Bellew, "'ha! <laughs> some are bound to exercise, some achieve exercise, "'and some, like myself, have exercise thrust upon them. "'At any rate, it's a very excellent thing, "'more especially if one is affected with a broken heart.' "'A what?' inquired the wagoner. "'Blighted affections, then?' sighed Bellew, settling himself more comfortably in the hay. "'You aren't any good love, are ye?' inquired the wagoner, cocking a somewhat sheepish eye at him. "'I was, but just at present—' And here Bellew lowered his voice. "'It is a rather painful subject with me. Let us therefore talk of something else.' "'You don't mean to say as your heart's broke, do ye?' inquired the wagoner, in a tone of such vast surprise and disbelief that Bellew turned and propped himself on an indignant elbow. "'And why the deuce not?' he retorted. "'My heart is no more impervious than anyone else's. Confound it!' "'But,' said the wagoner, "'you ain't got the look of an heartbreak cove, no more than Squire Cassilis. "'It's the same I heard telling Miss Anthea as his heart were broke, "'no later than yesterday, two o'clock in the afternoon as ever was.' "'Anthea,' repeated Bellew, blinking drowsily up at the sky again, "'that is a very quaint name, and very pretty.' "'Pretty? Ah, and so is Miss Anthea. That's a picture.' "'Oh, really?' yawned Bellew. "'Ah,' nodded the wagoner. "'There ain't a man in nor out of the parish, from Squire down, as don't think the very same.' But here the wagoner's voice tailed off into a meaningless drone that became merged with the creaking of the wheels, the plodding hoof-strokes of the horses, and Bellew fell asleep. He was awakened by feeling himself shaken lustily, and sitting up saw that they had come to where a narrow lane branched off from the high road and wound away between great trees. "'Yon's your way,' nodded the wagoner, pointing along the high road. "'Dapplemere village lies over yonder, about a mile.' "'Thank you very much,' said Bellew. "'But I don't want the village.' "'No?' inquired the wagoner, scratching his head. "'Certainly not,' answered Bellew. "'Then what do ye want?' "'Oh, well, I'll, I'll just go on lying here and see what turns up. "'So drive on, like the good fellow you are.' "'Can't be done,' said the wagoner. "'Why not?' "'Why, since you ask me, because I don't have to drive no farther.' "'There be the farmhouse, over the upland yonder. "'He can't see because of the trees, but there it be.' "'So Bellew sighed resignedly, and perforce climbed down into the road. "'What do I owe you?' he inquired. "'Owe me?' said the wagoner, staring. "'For the ride and the uh, very necessary exercise you afforded me.' "'Lord!' cried the wagoner with a sudden great laugh. "'You don't owe me nothing for that. Not no how. "'Are you one for a knocky of me into that ditch, back yonder?' "'Though to be sure I did give you one or two good uns, didn't I?' "'You certainly did,' answered Bellew, smiling, and he held out his hand. "'Hey, what be this?' cried the wagoner, staring down at the bright five-shilling piece in his palm. "'Well, I rather think it's five shillings,' said Bellew. "'It's big enough, heaven knows. English money is all okay, I suppose, but it's confoundedly confusing and rather heavy to drag around if you happen to have enough of it.' "'Ah,' nodded the wagoner, "'but then nobody ever never has enough of it. In least ways I never knowed anybody had.' "'Good-bye, sir, and thank ye, and good luck.' Saying which, the wagoner chirruped to his horses, slipped the coin into his pocket, nodded, and the wagon creaked and rumbled up the lane. Bellew strolled along the road, breathing an air fragrant with honeysuckle from the hedges and full of the song of birds, pausing now and then to listen to the blithe carol of a skylark or the rich, sweet notes of a blackbird, and feeling that it was indeed good to be alive, so that, what with all this, the springy turf beneath his feet and the blue expanse overhead, he began to whistle for very joy of it, until, remembering the haunting shadow of the might have been, he checked himself and sighed instead. Presently, turning from the road, he climbed a stile and followed a narrow path that led away across the meadows, and as he went 
there met him a gentle wind laden with the sweet, warm scent of ripening hops and fruit. On he went, and on, heedless of his direction, until the sun grew low, and he grew hungry. Wherefore, looking about, he presently espied a nook sheltered from the sun's level rays by a steep bank where flowers bloomed and ferns grew. Here he sat down, unslinging his knapsack, and here it was also that he first encountered small porges. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 4 How Small Porges, in looking for a fortune for another, found an uncle for himself instead. The meeting of George Bellew and Small Porges, as he afterwards came to be called, was sudden, precipitate, and wholly unexpected, and it befell on this wise. Bellew had opened his knapsack, had fished thence cheese, clasp knife, and a crusty loaf of bread, and having exerted himself so far, had fallen a-thinking or a-dreaming in his characteristic attitude, i.e. on the flat of his back, when he was aware of a crash in the hedge above, and then of something that hurtled past him, all arms and legs, that rolled over two or three times, and eventually brought up in a sitting posture. And, lifting a lazy head, Betty observed that it was a boy. He was a very diminutive boy, with a round head covered with coppery curls, a boy who stared at Bellew out of a pair of very round blue eyes, while he tenderly cherished a knee and an elbow. He'd been on the brink of tears for a moment, but meeting Bellew's quizzical gaze, he manfully repressed the weakness, and, lifting the small and somewhat weather-beaten cap that found a precarious perch at the back of his curly head, he gravely wished Bellew, "'Good afternoon.' "'Well met, my Lord Chesterfield,' nodded Bellew, returning the salute. "'Are you hurt?' "'Just a bit on the elbow, but my name's George.' "'Why, so is mine,' said Bellew. "'No, they call me Georgie Porgy.' "'Of course they do,' nodded Bellew. "'They used to call me the same once upon a time.' Georgie Porgy, pudding and pie, kissed the girls and made them cry. Thou never did anything of the kind. One doesn't do that sort of thing when one is young. And wise, that comes later, and brings its own care and uh, heartbreak. Here Bellew sighed and hacked a piece from the loaf with a clasp knife. Are you hungry, Georgie Porgy? he inquired, glancing up at the boy, who had risen and was removing some of the soil and dust from his small person with his cap. Yes, I am. Then here is bread and cheese and bottled stout. "'So fall to, good comrade.' "'Thank you, but I've got a piece of bread and jam in my bundle.' "'Bundle? "'I dropped it as I came through the hedge. "'I'll get it.' "'And as he spoke, he turned, and climbing up the bank, "'presently came back with a very small bundle "'that dangled from the end of a very long stick. "'And seating himself beside Bellew, "'he proceeded to open it. "'There, sure enough, was the bread and jam in question, "'seemingly a little the worse for wear and tear. "'But Bellew observed various articles adhering to it, amongst other things, a battered penknife and a top. These, however, were readily removed, and Georgie Porgy fell to with excellent appetite. "'And pray,' inquired Bellew, after they had munched silently together some while, "'pray, where might you be going?' "'I don't know yet,' answered Georgie Porgy, with a shake of his curls. "'Good again,' exclaimed Bellew. "'Neither do I. "'I have been thinking of Africa,' continued his diminutive companion, turning the remain of the bread and jam over and over, thoughtfully. "'Africa?' repeated Bellew, staring. "'That's quite a goodish step from here.' "'Yes,' sighed Georgie Porgy. "'But you see, there's gold there. Oh, lots of it. They dig it out of the ground with shovels, you know. Old Adam told me all about it. And it's gold I'm looking for, you see. I'm trying to find a fortune.' "'I, I beg your pardon,' said Bellew. "'Money, you know,' exclaimed Georgie Porgy, with a patient sigh. "'Pounds and shillings and banknotes.' "'In a sack, if I can get them. "'And what does such a very small Georgie Porgy want so much money for?' "'Well, it's for my auntie, you know, "'so she won't have to sell her house and go away from Dapplemere. "'She was telling me last night, when I was in bed. "'She always comes to tuck me up, you know, "'and she told me she was afraid she'd have to sell Dapplemere "'and go to live somewhere else. "'So I asked why, and she said, "'Cause she hadn't got any money. "'And, oh, Georgie,' she said, "'oh, Georgie, if we could only find enough money to pay off the... the... Mortgage, suggested Bellew, at a venture. Yes, that's it, but how did you know? Never mind how. Go on with your tale, Georgie Porgy. If we could only find enough money, or somebody would leave us a fortune, she said. And she was crying, too, because I felt a tear fall on me, you know. 
so this morning I got up awful early and made myself a bundle on a stick, like Dick Whittington had when he left home, and I started off to find a fortune. I see, nodded Bellew. But I haven't found anything yet, said Georgie Porgy with a long sigh. I suppose money takes a lot of looking for, doesn't it? Sometimes, Bellew answered. And do you live alone with your auntie then, Georgie Porgy? Yes, most boys live with their mothers, but that's where I'm different. I don't need one because I've got my auntie Anthea. Anthea, repeated Bellew thoughtfully. Hereupon they fell silent, Bellew watching the smoke curl up from his pipe into the warm, still air, and Georgie Porgy watching him with very thoughtful eyes and a somewhat troubled brow, as if turning over some weighty matter in his mind. At last he spoke. Please, said he with a sudden diffidence, where do you live? Live, repeated Bellew, smiling, under my hat, here, there, and everywhere, which means nowhere in particular. But, uh, I mean, where is your home? My home, said Bellew, exhaling a great cloud of smoke, my home lies beyond the bounding billow. That sounds an awful long way off. It is an awful long way off. And where do you sleep while, while you're here? Anywhere there, let me. "'Tonight I shall sleep at some inn, I suppose, if I can find one. "'If not, under a hedge or hayrick. "'Oh, haven't you got any home of your own, then, here?' "'No.' "'And you're not going home just yet? "'I mean, across the bounding billow?' "'Not yet.' "'Then, please,' the small voice voice was suddenly tremulous and eager, "'and he laid a little grimy hand upon Bellew's sleeve. "'Please, if it isn't too much trouble, would you mind coming with me?' To, to, to help me to find the fortune? You see, you are so very big, and... Oh, will you please? George Bellew sat up suddenly and smiled. Bellew's smile was at all times wonderfully pleasant to see. At least the boy thought so. Georgie Porgy, said he, you can just bet your small life I will. And there's my hand on it, old chap. Bellew's lips were solemn now, but all the best of his smile seemed somehow to have got into his grey eyes. So the big hand clasped the small one, and as they looked at each other, there sprang up a certain understanding that was to be an enduring bond between them. "'I think,' said Bellew, as he lay and puffed at his pipe again, "'I think I'll call you Porges. It's shorter, easier, and I think altogether apt. I'll be big Porges, and you shall be small Porges. What do you say?' "'Yes, it's not better than Georgie Porgy,' nodded the boy. And so small Porges he became thenceforth. "'But,' said he, after a thoughtful pause, I mean, if you don't mind, I'd rather call you Uncle Porges. You see, Dick Bennett, the blacksmith's boy, has three uncles, and I've only got a single aunt. So if you don't mind... Uncle Porges, it shall be now and forever. Amen, murmured Bellew. And when do you suppose we'd better start? inquired Small Porges, beginning to retie his bundle. Start where, nephew? To find the fortune? Ah, said Bellew. If we could manage to find some, even if it was only a very little, it would cheer her up so. To be sure it would, said Bellew, and sitting up, he pitched loaf, cheese and clasp knife back into the knapsack, fastened it, slung it upon his shoulders, and rising, took up his stick. Come on, my porges, said he, and whatever you do, keep your weather eye on your uncle. Where do you suppose we'd better look first? inquired small porges eagerly. Why, first, I think we'd better find your auntie Anthea. But began Porges, his face falling. "'But me no buts, my Porges,' smiled Bellew, laying his hand upon his newfound nephew's shoulder. "'But me no buts, boy, and as I said before, just keep your eye on your uncle.'" End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 5 How Bellew Came to Arcadia so they set out together, big porges and small porges, walking side by side over sun-kissed field and meadow, slowly and thoughtfully, to be sure, for Bellew disliked hurry, often pausing to listen to the music of running waters, or to stare away across the purple valley, for the sun was getting low. And, ever as they went, they talked to one another wholeheartedly, as good friends should. And from the boy's eager lips, Bellew heard much of Auntie Anthea, and learned, little by little, something of the brave fight which he had made, lonely and unaided, and burdened with ancient debt, to make the farm of Dapplemere pay. 
Likewise, small porges spoke learnedly of the condition of the markets and of the distressing fall in prices in regards to hay and wheat. Old Adam, he's our man, you know. He says that farming isn't what it was in his young days, especially if you happen to be a woman like my Auntie Anthea. And he told me yesterday that if he were Auntie, he'd give up trying and take Mr. Cassillis at his word. Cassillis, ah, and who is Mr. Cassillis? He lives at Brampton Court, a great big house about a mile from Dapplemere, and he's always asking my auntie to marry him. Of course she won't, you know. Why not? Well, I think it's because he's got such big white teeth when he smiles, and he's always smiling, you know. But old Adam says that if he'd been born a woman, he'd marry a man all teeth, or no teeth at all, if he had as much money as Mr. Cassidis. The sun was low in the west, as, skirting a wood, they came out upon a grassy lane that presently led them into the great broad highway. Now, as they trudged along together, small porches with one hand clasped in bellews, and the other supporting the bundle on his shoulder, there appeared, galloping towards them, a man on a fine black horse, at sight of whom porches clasp tightened, and he drew nearer to Bellew's side. When he was nearly abreast of them, the horseman checked his career so suddenly that his ankle was thrown back on his haunches. "'Why, Georgie!' he exclaimed. "'Good evening, Mr. Cassidis,' said Small Porges, lifting his cap. Mr. Cassidis was tall, handsome, well-built, and very particular as to dress. But you noticed that his teeth were indeed very large and white beneath the small, carefully trained moustache. Also his eyes seemed just a trifle too close together, perhaps. "'Why, what in the world have you been up to, boy?' he inquired, regarding Billy with no very friendly eye. "'Your aunt is worrying herself ill on your account. What have you been doing with yourself all day?' Again Billy felt the small fingers tighten round his, and the small figure shrink a little closer to him. A small Porges answered, "'I've been with Uncle Porges, Mr. Cassidis.' "'With whom?' demanded Mr. Cassidis, more sharply. "'With his Uncle Porges, sir,' Betty Roof joined, "'a trustworthy person, and very much at your service.' Mr. Cassidis stared. His hand began to stroke and caress his small black moustache, and he viewed Bellew from his dusty boots up to the crown of his dusty hat, and down again with supercilious eyes. "'Uncle?' he repeated incredulously. "'Porges,' nodded Bellew. "'I wasn't aware,' began Mr. Cassidis, "'that uh, George was so very fortunate.' A baptismal name, George,' continued Bellew, "'lately of New York, Newport, and um, other places in America, USA, "'at present of nowhere in particular.' "'Nah,' said Mr. Cassidis, his eyes seeming to grow a trifle nearer together. "'An American uncle. Still I was not aware of even that relationship.' "'It is a singularly pleasing thought,' smiled Bellew, "'to know that we may learn something every day. "'But one never knows what the day may bring forth. "'Tomorrow, for instance, you also may find yourself a nephew, "'somewhere or other, though personally I, uh, I doubt it. "'Yes, I greatly doubt it. "'Still one never knows, you know. "'While there's life, there's hope. "'A very good afternoon to you, sir. "'Come, nephew mine, this evening falls apace, and I grow weary. "'Let us on. Excelsior!' Mr. Cassidis's cheek grew suddenly red. He twirled his moustache angrily and seemed about to speak. Then he smiled instead, and, turning his horse, spurred him savagely and galloped back down the road in a cloud of dust. "'Did you see his teeth, Uncle Porges?' "'I did.' "'He only smiles like that when he's awfully angry,' said Small Porges, shaking his head as the galloping hoof-strokes died away in the distance. "'And what do you suppose he went back for?' "'Well, Porges, it's in my mind that he's gone back to warn our Auntie Anthea of our coming.' Small Porges sighed, and his feet dragged in the dust. "'It's hard, my Porges. Just a bit, you know, but it isn't that. I, I was thinking that the day had almost gone, and I haven't found a bit of the fortune yet.' "'Why, there's always tomorrow to live for, my Porges.' "'Yes, of course, there's always tomorrow, and now I did find you, you know, Uncle Porges.' "'To be sure you did, and an uncle is better than nothing at all, isn't he?' even if he is rather dusty and disreputable of exterior. One doesn't find an uncle every day of one's life, my Porges, no, sir. And you are so nice and big, you know, said Porges, viewing Bellew with a bright, approving eye. Long would be a better word, perhaps, suggested Bellew, smiling down at him. And wide, too, nodded small Porges. And from these two facts he seemed to derive a deal of solid comfort and satisfaction, for he strode on manfully once more. Leaving the high road, he guided Bellew by diverse winding paths, through cornfields and over stiles, until at length they were come to an orchard. Such an orchard as surely may only be found in Kent, where great apple-trees, gnarled and knotted, 
shot out huge branches that seemed to, to twist and writhe. Where were stately pear trees, where peaches and apricots ripened, against time-worn walls whose red bricks still glowed rosily for all their years, where the air was sweet with the scent of fruit and fragrant with thyme and sage and marjoram, and where the blackbirds, bold marauders that they are, piped gloriously all day long. In the midst of this orchard they stopped, and small porches rested one hand against the rugged bowl of a great old apple tree. This, said he, is my very own tree, because he's so very big and so very, very old. Adam says he's the oldest tree in the orchard. I call him King Arthur, because he's so big and strong, just like a king should be, you know, and all the other trees are his knights of the round table. But Betty was not looking at King Arthur just then. His eyes were turned to where one came towards them through the green, one surely as tall and gracious, as proud and beautiful as Enid or Guinevere or any of those lovely ladies, for all her simple gown of blue and the sunbonnet that shaded the beauty of her face. Yes, as he gazed, Betty was sure and certain that she who, all unconscious of their presence, came slowly towards them with the red glow of the sunset about her, was handsomer, lovelier, statelier, and altogether more desirable than all the beautiful ladies of King Arthur's court, or any other court, so ever. But now a small porters, finding him so silent, and seeing where he looked, must needs behold her too, and gave a sudden glad cry, and ran out from behind the great bulk of King Arthur. And she, hearing his voice, turned and ran to meet him, and sank upon her knees before him, and clasped him against her heart, and rejoiced, and wept, and scolded him, all in a breath. Wherefore Bellew, unobserved as yet in King Arthur's shadow, watching the proud head with its wayward curls, for the sunbonnet had been tossed back upon her shoulders, watching the quick, passionate caress of those slender brown hands, and listening to the thrilling tenderness of that low, soft voice, felt, all at once, strangely lonely and friendless and out of place, very rough and awkward, and very much aware of his dusty person. Felt, indeed, as any other ordinary human might, who had tumbled unexpectedly into Arcadia. Therefore he turned, thinking to steal quietly away. "'You see, Auntie, I went out to try and find a fortune for you,' Small Porges was explaining, "'and I looked and looked, but I didn't find a bit.' "'My dear, dear brave Georgie,' said Anthea, and would have kissed him again, but he put her off. "'Wait a minute, please, Auntie,' he said excitedly, "'cause I did find something. Just as I was going very tired and disappointed, I found Uncle Porges, under a hedge, you know.' "'Uncle Porges,' said Anthea, starting. "'Oh, that must be the man Mr. Cassilis mentioned.' "'So I brought him with me,' pursued Small Porges, "'and there he is!' And he pointed triumphantly towards King Arthur. Glancing thither, Anthea beheld a tall, dusty figure moving off among the trees. "'Oh, wait, please!' she called, rising to her feet, and with Small Porges' hand in hers, approached Bellew, who had stopped with his dusty back to them. "'I want to thank you for taking care of my nephew. "'If you will come up to the house, cook shall give you a good meal, "'and if you are in need of work, I—' uh... "'Her voice faltered uncertainly, and she stopped. "'Thank you,' said Bellew, turning and lifting his hat. "'Oh, I beg your pardon,' said Anthea. "'Now, as their eyes met, "'it seemed to Bellew as though he had lived all his life "'in expectation of this moment, "'and he knew that all his life he should never forget this moment.' But now, even when he looked at her, he saw her cheeks flush painfully, and her dark eyes grow troubled. "'I beg your pardon,' said she again. "'I, I thought Mr. Cassellis gave me to understand that you were—' "'A very dusty, hungry-looking fellow, perhaps,' smiled Bellew. "'And he was quite right, you know. "'The dust you can see for yourself, but the hunger you must take my word for. "'As for the work, I assure you, exercise is precisely what I am looking for.' "'But,' said Anthea, and stopped— and tapped the grass nervously with her foot, and twisted one of her bonnet strings, and meeting Bellew's steady gaze, flushed again. But you... you are... My uncle Porges, her nephew chimed in, and I brought him home with me because he's going to help me to find a fortune, and he hasn't got any place to go to because his home's far, far beyond the bounding billow. So you will let him stay, won't you, Auntie Anthea? Why, Georgie, she began. But seeing her distressed look, Bellew came to her rescue. "'Pray do, Miss Anthea,' said he, in his quiet, easy manner. "'My name is Bellew,' he went on to explain. "'I'm an American, without family or friends, here, there, or anywhere, "'and with nothing in the world to do but follow the path of the winds. "'Indeed, I am rather a solitary fellow, at least 
I was until I met my nephew Porges here. Since then I've been wondering if there would be a, a room for such as I at Daffermere. Oh, th th there would be plenty of room, said Anthea, hesitating and wrinkling her white brow, for a lodger was something entirely new in her experience. As to my character, pursued Bellew, though something of a vagabond, I am not a rogue. At least I hope not. And I could pay uh, four or five pounds a week. Oh, exclaimed Anthea with a little gasp. If that would be sufficient. It is a great deal too much, said Anthea, who would have scarcely dared to ask three. Pardon me, but I think not, said Bellew, shaking his head. You see, I am uh, rather extravagant in my eating. Eggs, you know, lots of them, and ham, and beef, and uh, a duck quacked loudly from the vicinity of a neighbouring pond. Certainly an occasional duck. Indeed, five pounds a week would scarcely... Three would be ample, said Anthea, with a little nod of finality. Very well, said Bellew. We'll make it four and have done with it. Anthea Devine, being absolute mistress of Dapplemere, was in the habit of exerting her authority and having her own way in most things. Therefore she glanced up in some surprise at this tall, dusty, rather lazy-looking personage, and she noticed, even as had small porches, that he was indeed very big and wide. She noticed also that, despite the easy courtesy of his manner and the quizzical light of his grey eyes, his chin was very square, and that, despite his gentle voice, he had the air of one who meant exactly what he said. Nevertheless, she was much inclined to take issue with him upon the matter, plainly observing which Bellew smiled and shook his head. "'Pray be reasonable,' he said in his gentle voice. "'If you send me away to some horrible inn or other, it will cost me, being an American, more than that every week in tips and things. So let's shake hands on it and call it settled.' And he held out his hand to her. Four pounds a week? It would be a veritable godsend just at present, while she was so hard put to it to make both ends meet. Four pounds a week? So Anthea stood, lost in frowning thought, until, meeting his frank smile, she laughed. <laughs> you are dreadfully persistent, she said, and I know it is too much, but we'll try to make you as comfortable as we can. And she laid her hand in his. And thus it was that George Bellew came to Dapplemere in the glory of the afterglow of an August afternoon, breathing the magic air of Arcadia, which is, and always has been, of that rare quality warranted to go to the head sooner or later. And thus it was that Small Porges, with his bundle on his shoulder, viewed this tall, dusty uncle with the eye of possession, which is oft-times an eye of rapture. And Anthea? She was busy calculating to a scrupulous nicety the very vexed question as to exactly how far four pounds per week might be made to go to the best possible advantage of all concerned. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 6 of the sad condition of the haunting spectre of the might have been. Dapplemere Farmhouse, or The Manor, as it was still called by many, had been built when Henry the Eighth was king, as the carved inscription above the door testified. The house of Dapplemere was a place of many gables and latticed windows, and with tall, slender chimneys shaped and wrought into things of beauty and of delight. It possessed a great old hall, there were spacious chambers and broad stairways, there were panelled corridors, sudden flights of steps that led up or down again for no apparent reason. There were broad and generous hearths and deep window seats, and everywhere, within and without, there lurked an indefinable old-world charm that was the heritage of years. Storms had buffeted and tempests had beat upon it, but all in vain, for save that the bricks glowed a deeper red where they peeped out beneath the clinging ivy, the old house stood as it had upon that far day when it was fashioned, the year of our Lord, 1,524. In England, many such houses are yet to be found, monuments of the bad old times, memorials of the dark ages, where lath and stucco existed not, and the jerry-builder had no being. But where among them all might be found such another parlour as this at Dapplemere, with its low raftered ceiling, its great carved mantel, its panelled walls whence old portraits looked down at one like dream faces from dim and nebulous backgrounds. And where might be found two such bright-eyed, rosy-cheeked, quick-footed, deft-handed finnesses as the two buxom maids who flitted here and there 
obedient to their mistress's word or gesture. And lastly, where in all this wide world could there ever be found just such another hostess as Miss Anthea herself? Something of all this was in Bellew's mind as he sat with small porches beside him, watching Miss Anthea dispense tea, brewed as it should be, in an earthen teapot. Milk and sugar, Mr. Bellew? Thank you. This is blackberry, and this is raspberry and red currant, but the blackberry jam's the best, Uncle Porges. Thank you, nephew. Now aren't you awful glad I've found you, under that hedge, Uncle Porges? Nephew, I am. Nephew, repeated Anthea, glancing at him with raised brows. Oh, yes, nodded Bellew. We adopted each other at about four o'clock this afternoon. Under a hedge, you know, added small Porges. Wasn't it a very sudden and altogether unheard-of proceeding? Anthea inquired. Well, it might have been if it had happened anywhere but in Arcadia. What do you mean by Arcadia, Uncle Porges? A place I've been looking for nearly all my life, nephew. I'll trouble you for the blackberry jam, my Porges. Yes, try the blackberry. Aunt Priscilla made it her very own self. You know, it's perfectly ridiculous, said Anthea, frowning and laughing both at the same time. What is, Miss Anthea? Why, that you should be sitting here calling Georgie your nephew, and that I should be pouring out tea for you, quite as a matter of course. It seems to me the most delightfully natural thing in the world, said Bellew, in his slow, grave manner. But I've only known you a half an hour. But then friendships ripen quickly in Arcadia. I wonder what Aunt Priscilla will have to say about it. Aunt Priscilla? Uh, she is our housekeeper, the dearest, busiest, gentlest little housekeeper in all the world, but with very sharp eyes, Mr. Bellew. She will either like you very much or not at all. There are no half-measures about Aunt Priscilla. Now I wonder which it will be, said Bellew, helping himself to more jam. Oh, she'll like you, of course, nodded small porches. I know she'll like you, because you're so different to Mr. Cassillis. He's got black hair and a moustache, you know, and your hair's gold like mine, and your moustache isn't there, is it? And I know she doesn't like Mr. Cassillis, and I don't either, cos... She will be back tomorrow, said Anthea, silencing small porches with a gentle touch of her hand. And we shall be glad, shan't we, Georgie? The house is not the same place without her. You see, I'm off in the fields all day, as a rule. A farm, even such a small one as Dapplemere, is a great responsibility. It takes up all one's time, if it is to be made to pay. And sometimes it doesn't pay at all, you know, added small porches. And then Auntie Anthea worries, and I worry too. Farming isn't what it was in Adam's young days, so that's why I must find a fortune, early tomorrow morning, you know, so my auntie won't have to worry any more. Now when he had got thus far, Anthea leaned over, and taking him by surprise, kissed small porches suddenly. It was very good and brave of you, dear, said she in her soft, thrilling voice, to go out all alone into this big world to try and find a fortune for me. And here she would have kissed him again, but that he reminded her that they were not alone. But, Georgie, dear, fortunes are very hard to find, especially round Dappermere, I'm afraid, said she with a rueful little laugh. Yes, that's why I was going to Africa, you know. Africa, she repeated. Africa. Oh, yes, nodded Bellew. When I met him, he was on his way there to bring gold for you, in a sack. And young Porter said it was a goodish way off, you know, so I decided to stay and find the fortune nearer home. And thus they talked unaffectedly together, until, tea being over, Anthea volunteered to show Bellew over her small domain, and they went out, all three, into an evening that breathed of roses and honeysuckle. And as they went, slow-footed through the deepening twilight, Small porges directed Bellew's attention to certain nooks and corners that might be well calculated to conceal the fortune they were to find, while Anthea pointed out to him the beauties of shady wood, of rolling meadow and winding stream. But there were other beauties that neither of them thought to call to his attention, but which Bellew noted with observing eyes nonetheless, such, for instance, as the way Anthea had of drooping her shadowy lashes at sudden and unexpected moments, the wistful droop of her warm red lips, and the sweet round column of her throat. These, and much beside, Bellew noticed for himself as they walked on together through this midsummer evening. And so betimes Bellew got him to bed, and though the hour was ridiculously early, yet he fell into a profound slumber and dreamed of nothing at all. But far away upon the road, forgotten and out of mind, with futile writhing and grimaces, the haunting shadow of the might have been gibbered 
in the shadows. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Money Tree by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 7, which concerns itself, among other matters, with The Old Adam Bellew awakened early next morning, which was an unusual thing for Bellew to do under ordinary circumstances, since he was one who held with that poet who has written, somewhere or other, something to the following effect. God bless the man who first discovered sleep, but damn the man with curses loud and deep who first invented early rising. Nevertheless, Bellew, as has been said, awoke early next morning to find the sun pouring in at his window and making a glory all about him. But it was not this that had roused him, he thought, as he lay blinking drowsily, nor the blackbird piping so wonderfully in the apple-tree outside, a very inquisitive apple-tree that had writhed and contorted itself most unnaturally in its efforts to peep in at the window. Therefore Bellew fell to wondering, sleepily enough, what it could have been. Presently it came again, the sound, a very peculiar sound, the like of which Bellew had never heard before, which, as he listened, gradually evolved itself into a kind of monotonous chant, intoned by a voice deep and harsh, yet withal not unmusical. Now the words of the chant were these. When I am dead, diddle-diddle, as well may hap, bury me deep, diddle-diddle, under the tap. Under the tap, diddle-diddle, I'll tell you why, that I may drink, diddle-diddle, when I am dry. Hereupon Bellew rose, and crossing to the open casement, leaned out into the golden freshness of the morning. Looking about, he presently espied the singer, one who carried two pails suspended from a yoke upon his shoulders, a very square man, that is to say, square of shoulder, square of head, and square of jaw, being, in fact, none other than the wagoner with whom he had fought and ridden on the previous afternoon, seeing which Bellew hailed him in cheery greeting. The man glanced up, and, breaking off his song in the middle of a note, stood gazing at Bellew, open-mouthed. "'What well, be that you, sir?' he inquired at last, and then, "'Lord, and what be you a-doing of up there?' Why, sleeping, of course, answered Bellew. What, again? exclaimed the wagoner with a grin. You do be forever sleeping when I do believe. Not when you're anywhere about, laughed Bellew. What it means, Wookie, then? Your singing did. My singing? Lord love ye, and what it might. My singing will wake the dead. Leastways, so Prudence says, and she's generally right. Leastways, if she ain't, she's an uncommon good cook, and that goes a long way with most of us. But I don't sing very often unless I be alone, or easy in my mind and happy-hearted, which I ain't. No? inquired Bellew. Not by no manner of means I ain't. Contrarywise, my heart be sore and full of gloom, which ain't to be wondered at now. And yet you were singing. I for sure ever singing. But then who could help singing on such a morning as this be, and with a black bird a piping away in the tree here? Oh, I was singing. I don't go for to deny it. "'But it's sore-hearted I be, and filled with gloom, sir, notwithstanding.' "'You mean,' said Bellew, becoming suddenly thoughtful, "'that you are haunted by the carking spectre of, uh, the, uh, might-have-been?' <laughs> "'Lord bless you, no, sir. This ain't no spectre, nor yet no skellington. "'But after all, it's only old bones and such. "'No, this ain't nothing of that sort, and no more it ain't a thing as I can stand here a maggot about "'well, long day's work afore me, axing your pardon, sir.' "'Saying which, the wagoner nodded suddenly, and strode off with his pails clanking cheerily. Very soon Bellew was shaved and dressed, and going downstairs he let himself out into the early sunshine, and strolled away towards the farmyard, where cocks crew, cows lowed, ducks quacked, turkeys and geese gobbled and hissed, and where the wagoner moved to and fro among them all, like a presiding genius. "'I think,' said Bellew as he came up, "'I think you must be the Adam I have heard of. "'That be my name, sir.' "'Then, Adam, fill your pipe,' said Bellew, extending his pouch, whereupon Adam thanked him, and, fishing a small, short, black clay from his pocket, proceeded to fill and light it. "'Yes, sir,' he nodded, inhaling the tobacco with much apparent enjoyment. "'Adam, I were baptised some thirty-odd year ago, but I generally calls myself Old Adam.' "'But you're not Old Adam.' "'Why, don't on account of me age, or ye see, sir. It's all because of ye Old Adam as is inside of me.' "'No, thou ye.' I am naturally that full of the old Adam as never was, and he's always an up and taking of me at the shortest notice. 
Only t'other day he up and took me because Job Jagway, he works for Squire Cassidis, you understand, sir, because Job Jagway says as our wheat, meaning Miss Anthony's wheat, you understand, sir, was mouldy. Well, the old Adam up and took me to that extent, sir, that they had to carry Job Jagway home afterwards. It was all on account of the old Adam, me being the mildest chap you ever see, naturally. Mild? Ah, sucking doves wouldn't be nothing to me for mildness. And what did the squire have to say about your spoiling his man? Well, I wrote to Miss Anthea, of course, sir. He's always writing to Miss Anthea about summat or other. Says as how he wasn't minded to lock me up for assault and battery, but out of respect for her, would let me off with a warning. Miss Anthea was worried, I suppose. Worried, sir? Oh, Adam, says she. Oh, Adam, haven't I got enough to bear, but you must make it harder for me. And I see the tears in her eyes while she said it. Me make it harder for her? Just as if I wouldn't make things lighter for her if I could. Which I can't. Just as if, to help Miss Anthea, I wouldn't let him take me and... Well, never mind what. Only I would. Yes, I'm sure you would, nodded Bellew. And is the squire over here at Dapplemere very often, Adam? Why, not so much lately, sir. Last time or yesterday, just afore Master Georgie came home. I were at work here in the yard, and the squire comes riding up to me, smiling quite friendly-like, which were pretty good of him, considering as Job Jagway ain't back to work yet. Oh, Adam, says he, so you're having a sale here at Dappermere, are you? Meaning, sir, a sale of some bits and sticks of furniture as Miss Anthea's forced to part with to meet some bill or other. Some of that, sir, says I, making as light of it as I could. Why then, Adam, says he, if Job Jagway should happen to come over to buy a few of the things, no more fighting, says he. And so he nods and smiles and off he rides. And, sir, as I watched him go, the old Adam rise up at me to that extent as it's a mercy I didn't have no pitchfork handy. Bellew, sitting on the shaft of a cart with his back against a rick, listened to this narration with an air of dreamy abstraction. But Adam's quick eyes noticed that despite the unruffled serenity of his brow, his chin seemed rather more prominent than usual. So that was why you were feeling gloomy, was it, Adam? Ah, enough to make any man feel gloomy, I should think. Miss Anthea's brave enough, but I reckon she'll come nigh breaking her heart to see old stuff sold, furniture and that. So she's going to drive over to Cranbrook to be out of the way while it's a doing. And uh, when does the sale take place? Certainly out of net, sir, as ever was, Adam answered. Uh, but hush, mum's the word, sir, he broke off and winking violently with a sideways motion of the head, he took up his pitchfork. Wherefore, glancing round, Bellew saw Anthea coming towards them, fresh and sweet as the morning. Her hands were full of flowers, and she carried her sunbonnet upon her arm. Here and there a rebellious curl had escaped from its fastenings, as though desirous, and very naturally, of kissing the soft oval of her cheek, or the white curve of her neck. And among them Bellew noticed one in particular, a roguish curl that glowed in the sun with a coppery light, and peeped at him wantonly above her ear. "'Good morning,' said he, rising, and to all appearance addressing the curl in question. "'You were early abroad this morning?' "'Early, Mr. Bellew? Oh, I've been up for hours. I'm generally out at four o'clock on market days. We work hard and long at Dappermere, she answered, giving him her hand with her grave, sweet smile. "'Aye, for sure,' nodded Adam. "'But farming ain't what it was in my young days.' But I think we shall do well with the hops, Adam. Hops, Miss Anthea. Lord love you. There ain't no hops nowhere so good as arm be. They ought to be ready for picking soon. Do you think sixty people will be enough? Ah, there'll be more than enough, Miss Anthea. And, Adam, a five-acre field should be mowed today. I'll set the men at it right out of breakfast. I'll have it done. Trust me, Miss Anthea. I do, Adam. You know that. With a smiling nod, she turned away. Now, as Bellew walked on beside her, he felt a strange constraint upon him, such as he had never experienced towards any woman before, and which he was at great pains with himself to account for. Indeed, so rapt was he, that he started suddenly to find that she was asking him a question. "'Do you like Dappermere, Mr. Bellew?' I "'Like it,' he repeated. "'Like it? Yes, indeed.' "'I'm so glad,' she answered, her eyes glowing with pleasure. "'It was a much larger property once. Look!' and she pointed away across cornfields and rolling meadow to the distant woods. In my grandfather's time it was all his, as far as you could see and farther, but it has dwindled since then, and today my Dapplemere is very small indeed. You must be very fond of such a beautiful place. Oh, I love it, she cried passionately. If ever I had to 
Give it up. I, I think I should die. She stopped suddenly, and as though somewhat abashed by this sudden outburst, added in a lighter tone, If I seem rather tragic, it is because this is the only home I have ever known. Well, said Benu, appearing rather more dreamy than usual just then, I have journeyed here and there in this world of ours. I have wandered up and down and to and fro in it, like a certain celebrated personage who shall be nameless. Yet I never saw or dreamed of any such place as this Dathomir of yours. It is like Arcadia itself, and only I am out of place. I seem somehow to be too commonplace and altogether matter-of-fact. I am sure I am matter-of-fact enough, she said, with her low, sweet laugh that Bellew thought was all too rare. You, said he, and shook his head. Well, she inquired, glancing at him through her wind-tossed curls, you are like some fair and stately lady out of the old romances, he said gravely. In a print gown and with a sunbonnet? Even so, he nodded. Here, for no apparent reason, happening to meet his glance, the colour deepened in her cheek and she was silent. Therefore Belly went on in his slow, placid tones. You, surely, are the princess ruling this fair land of Arcadia, and I am the stranger within your gates. It behoves you, therefore, to be merciful to this stranger, if only for the sake of um, our mutual nephew. Whatever Anthea might have said in answer was cut short by small porches himself, who came galloping towards them with the sun bright in his curls. "'Oh, Uncle Porges!' he panted as he came up. "'I was afraid you'd gone away and left me. I've been hunting and hunting for you ever since I got up.' "'No, I haven't gone away yet, my Porges, you see. Oh, you won't go ever or ever, will you?' That, said Benu, taking the small hand in his, that is a question that we had better leave to the um, uh, future, nephew. But why? Well, you see, it doesn't rest with me altogether, my porches. Then who? He was beginning, but Anthea's softer voice interrupted him. Georgie, dear, didn't Prudence send you to tell us that breakfast was ready? Oh, yes, I was forgetting. Awful silly of me, wasn't it? Well, you are going to stay. Oh, a long, long time, aren't you, Uncle Porges? "'I sincerely hope so,' answered Bellew. Now, as he spoke, his eyes, by the merest chance in the world, of course, happened to meet Anthea's, whereupon she turned and slipped on her sunbonnet, which was very natural, for the sun was growing hot already. "'I'm awfully glad,' sighed Small Porges. "'And Auntie's glad, too, aren't you, Auntie?' "'Why, of course,' from the depths of the sunbonnet. "'Cause now, you see, there'll be two of us to take care of you. Uncle Porches is so nice and big and wide, isn't he, Auntie? Y y yes. Oh, Georgie, what are you talking about? Why, I mean, I'm rather small to take care of you all by myself alone, Auntie, though I do my best, of course. But now that I've found myself a big, tall Uncle Porges, under the hedge, you know, we can take care of you together, can't we, Auntie Anthea? But Anthea only hurried on without speaking whereupon small porges continued all unheeding. "'Yes, remember the other night, Auntie, when you were crying? You said you wish you had someone very big and strong to take care of you. Oh, Georgie!' Then you heartily wished that some bonnets had never been thought of. "'But you did, you know, Auntie, and so that was why I went out and found my Uncle Porges for you, so that he—' But here, Mistress Anthea, for all her pride and stateliness, catching her gown about her, Fanny ran on down the path, and never paused until she had reached the cool, dim parlour. Being there, she tossed aside her sunbonnet, and looked at herself in the long, old mirror. And though surely no mirror made by man ever reflected a fairer vision of dark-eyed witchery and loveliness, nevertheless Anthea stamped her foot and frowned at it. Oh! she exclaimed, and then again, Oh, Georgie! and covered her burning cheeks. Meanwhile, Big porches and small porches, walking along hand in hand, shook their heads solemnly, wondering much upon the capriciousness of aunts and the waywardness thereof. "'I wonder why she run away, Uncle Porges?' "'Ah, oh, I wonder. I expect she's a bit angry with me, you know, because I've told you she was crying.' Eh, yeah, said Bellew. "'And auntie takes an awful lot of looking after,' sighed small porges. "'Yes,' nodded Bellew. "'I suppose so, especially if she happens to be young and, uh, "'And what, Uncle Porges?' "'Beautiful, nephew.' "'Oh, do you think she's really beautiful?' demanded Small Porges. "'I'm afraid I do,' Bellew confessed. "'So does Mr. Cassillis. I heard him tell her so once, in the orchard.' "'Ah,' 
said Bellew. "'Ah, oh, but you ought to see her when she comes to tap me up at night, "'with her hair all down and hanging all about her, "'like a shiny cloak, you know.' "'Ah,' said Bellew. "'Please, Uncle Porges,' said Georgie, turning to look up at him. "'What makes you hum so much this morning?' "'I was thinking, my Porges. "'But my Auntie Anthea? "'I do admit the soft impeachment, sir. "'But I'm thinking, too. "'What is it, old chap? "'I'm thinking we ought to begin to find that fortune of her after breakfast.' "'Why, it isn't quite the right season for fortune-hunting yet. "'At least not in Arcadia,' answered Bellew, shaking his head. "'Oh, but why not? "'Well, the moon isn't right, for one thing.' "'The moon?' echoed Small Porges. "'Oh, yes, we must wait for a, a money-moon, you know. "'Surely you've heard of a money-moon?' "'Afraid not,' sighed Small Porges regretfully. "'But I've heard of a honeymoon. "'They're often much the same,' nodded Bellew. "'But when will the money-moon come, and how?' "'I can't exactly say, my Porges, but come it will, one of these fine nights. "'And when it does, we shall know that the fortune is close by and waiting to be found. "'So don't worry your small head about it. Just keep your eye on your uncle.' Betimes they came into breakfast, where Anthea awaited them at the head of the table. Then who so demure, so gracious and self-possessed, so sweetly sedate as she? The cavalier in the picture above the carved mantel, versed in the ways of the world, and the pretty tricks and wiles of the beau-sex feminine, smiled down at Bellew with an expression of such roguish waggery as said plain as words, "'We know.' And Bellew, remembering a certain pair of slender ankles that had revealed themselves in their hurried flight, smiled back at the cavalier, and it was all he could do to refrain from winking outright. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 8, which tells of Miss Priscilla, of Peaches, and of Sergeant Appleby, late of the 19th Hussars. Small Porges was at his lessons. He was perched at the great oak table beside the window, pen in hand, and within easy reach of Anthea, who sat busied with her daily letters and accounts. Small Porges was laboriously inscribing in a somewhat splashed and besmeared copybook the rather surprising facts that a stitch in time saves nine, nine, that the Tagus, a river in Spain, are, ah, and that Artaxerxes was the king of the Persians, a, eh? and the like surprising, curious, and interesting items of news, his pen making not half so many curls and twists as did his small red tongue. As he wrote, he frowned terrifically, and sighed off betwixt whiles, and Bellew, watching where he stood outside the window, noticed that Anthea frowned also as she bent over her accounts, and sighed wearily more than once. It was after a sigh rather more hopeless than usual, that, chancing to raise her eyes, they encountered those of the watcher outside, who, seeing himself discovered, smiled, and came to lean in at the open window. "'Weren't they balanced?' he inquired, with a nod towards the heap of bills and papers before her. "'Oh, yes,' she answered with a rueful little smile, "'but uh, on the wrong side, if you know what I mean.' "'I know,' he nodded, watching how her lashes curled against her cheek. "'If only we had done better with our first crop of wheat,' she sighed. "'Job Jagway said it was mouldy, you know. "'That's why Adam punched him in the—' "'Georgie, go on with your work, sir.' "'Yes, auntie,' and immediately small Porges' pen began to scratch— and his tongue to writhe and twist as before. "'I'm building all my hopes this year on the hops,' said Anthea, sinking her head upon her hand. "'If they should fail—' "'Well?' inquired Bellew, with his gaze upon the soft curve of her throat. "'I don't think of it.' "'Then don't. Let us talk of something else.' "'Yes, of Aunt Priscilla,' nodded Anthea. "'She's in the garden.' "'And pray who is Aunt Priscilla?' "'Go and meet her.' "'Go and find her, in the orchard,' repeated Anthea. "'Oh, do go, and leave us to our work.' Thus it was that, turning obediently into the orchard and looking about, Bellew presently espied a little bright-eyed old lady who sat beneath the shadow of King Arthur, with a rustic table beside her, upon which stood a basket of sewing. Now as he went he chanced to spy a ball of worsted that had fallen by the way, and stooping therefore he picked it up while she watched him with her quick bright eyes. "'Good morning, Mr. Bellew,' 
she said in response to his salutation. It was nice of you to trouble to pick up an old woman's ball of worsted. As she spoke, she rose and dropped him a curtsy, and then as he looked at her again he saw that, despite her words and despite her white hair, she was much younger and prettier than he had thought. "'I am Miss Anthea's housekeeper,' she went on. "'I was away when you arrived, looking after one of Miss Anthea's old ladies. Pray be seated. Miss Anthea, bless her dear heart, calls me her aunt, but I'm not really. Oh, dear, no, I'm no relation at all. But I've lived with her long enough to feel as if I was her aunt, and her uncle, and her father, and her mother, all rolled into one. I should be rather small to be so many, shouldn't I?' And she laughed so gaily and unaffectedly that Bellew laughed too. "'I tell you all this,' she went on, keeping pace to her flying needle, "'because I have taken a fancy to you on the spot. "'I always like or dislike a person on the spot. First impressions, you know.' "'Yes,' she continued, glancing up at him sideways. "'I like you just as much as I dislike Mr. Cassidis. "'Hey, ho, how I do detest that man. "'There, now that's off my mind.' "'And why?' inquired Bellew, smiling. "'Dear me, Mr. Bellew, I... How should I know, and it I do. What's more, he knows it too. And how, she inquired, changing the subject abruptly, how is your bed? Comfortable, hm? Very. You sleep well? Like a top. Any complaints so far? None whatsoever, laughed Bellew, shaking his head. That is very well. We have never had a boarder before, and Miss Anthea, bless her dear soul, was a little nervous about it. And here's the sergeant. "'I uh, beg your pardon,' said Bellew. "'The sergeant,' repeated Miss Priscilla with a prim little nod. "'Sergeant Appleby, late of the 19th Hussars. "'A soldier every inch of him, Mr. Bellew, with one arm, over there by the peaches.' Glancing in the direction she indicated, Bellew observed a tall figure, very straight and upright, clad in a tight-fitting blue coat, with extremely tight trousers strapped beneath the insteps, and with a hat balanced upon his close-cropped, grizzled head, at a perfectly impossible angle for any save an ex-cavalryman. Now, as he stood examining a peach tree that flourished against the opposite wall, Bellew saw that his right sleeve was empty, sure enough, and was looped across his broad chest. "'The very first thing he will say will be that it is a very fine day,' nodded Miss Priscilla, stitching away faster than ever, "'and the next that the peaches are doing remarkably well. Now mark my words, Mr. Bellew.' As she spoke, the sergeant wheeled suddenly right about face and came striding down towards them, jingling imaginary spurs, and with his stick tucked up under his remaining arm, very much as if it had been a sabre. Being come up to them, the sergeant raised a stiff arm as though about to salute them, military fashion, but apparently changing his mind, took off the straw hat instead and put it on again, more over one ear than ever. "'A particularly fine day, Miss Priscilla, for the time of the year,' said he. "'Indeed, I quite agree with you, Sergeant,' returned little Miss Priscilla with a bright nod, and a slight glance at Bellew as much as to say, "'I told you so.' "'And the peaches, ma'am,' continued the Sergeant, "'the peaches never looked better, ma'am.' Having said which, he stood looking at nothing in particular, with his one hand resting lightly upon his hip. "'Yes, to be sure, Sergeant,' nodded Miss Priscilla with another sly look. "'But let me introduce you to Mr. Bellew, who is staying at Dapplemere.' The sergeant stiffened, once more began a salute, changed his mind, took off his hat instead, and after looking at it as though not quite sure what to do with it next, clapped it back upon his ear, in imminent danger of falling off, and was done with it. "'Proud to know you, sir. Your servant, sir.' "'How do you do?' said Bellew, and held out his hand with his frank smile. The sergeant hesitated, then put out his remaining hand. "'My left, sir,' said he apologetically. "'Can't be helped.' "'Left my right, out in India, good many years ago. "'Good place for soldiering, India, sir. "'Plenty of active service, chances of promotion, though some bad.' "'Sergeant,' said Miss Priscilla, without seeming to glance up from her saying, "'Sergeant, your hat.' "'Hereupon the sergeant gave a sudden sideways jerk of the head, "'and in the very nick of time saved the article in question from tumbling off, "'and very dexterously brought it to the top of his close-cropped head.' whence it immediately began, slowly, and by scarcely perceptible degrees, to slide down to his ear again. "'Sergeant,' said Miss Priscilla again, "'sit down, do.' "'Thank you, ma'am,' said he, and proceeded to seat himself at the other end of the rustic bench, 
where he remained bolt upright and with his long legs stretched out straight before him, as is and has been the manner of cavalrymen since their first wall straps. And now, said he, staring straight in front of him, how might Miss Anthea be? Oh, very well, thank you, nodded Miss Priscilla. Good, exclaimed the sergeant, with his eyes still fixed. Very good. Here he passed his hand two or three times across his shaven chin, regarding an apple tree nearby with an expression of the most profound interest. And how, said he again, might Master Georgie be? Master Georgie is as well as ever, answered Miss Priscilla, stitching away faster than before, and Billy thought she kept her rosy cheeks stooped a little lower over her work. Meanwhile the sergeant continued to regard the tree with the same degree of lively interest, and to rasp his fingers to and fro across his chin. Suddenly he coughed behind a hand, whereupon Miss Priscilla raised her head and looked at him. Well? she inquired very softly. And pray, ma'am, said the sergeant, moving his gaze from the tree with a jerk, how might you be feeling, ma'am? Much the same as usual, thank you, she answered, smiling like a girl, for all her white hair, as the sergeant's eyes met hers. You look, said he, pausing to cough behind his hand again, you look blooming, ma'am, if you'll allow the expression, blooming, as you ever do, ma'am. I'm an old woman, sergeant, as well you know, sighed Miss Priscilla, shaking her head. Old, ma'am, repeated the sergeant, old, ma'am, nothing of the sort, ma'am. Age has nothing to do with it. It isn't the years as count. We aren't any older than we feel, eh, sir? Of course not, answered Bellew. Nor than we look, eh, sir? Certainly not, Sergeant, answered Bellew. And she, sir, she don't look a day older than... Thirty-five, said Bellew. Exactly, sir, very true, my own opinion. Thirty-five exactly, sir. Sergeant, said Miss Priscilla, bending over her work again. Sergeant, your hat. Sergeant, hereupon removed the distracting headgear altogether, and sat with it upon his knee, staring hard at the tree again. Then, all at once, with a sudden gesture, he drew a large silver watch from his pocket, rather as if it were some weapon of offence, looked at it, listened to it, and then, nodding his head, rose to his feet. "'Must be going,' he said, standing very straight, and looking down at little Miss Priscilla. "'Though, sorry as ever, must be going, ma'am. Miss Priscilla, ma'am, good day to you.' He stretched out his hand to her with a sudden jerky movement. Miss Priscilla paused in her sewing, and looked up at him with her youthful smile. "'Must you go so soon, Sergeant? Then good-bye until tomorrow. And she laid her very small hand in his big palm. Sergeant stared down at it as though he were greatly minded to raise it to his lips, instead of doing which he dropped it suddenly, and turned to Bellew. "'Sir, I am proud to have met you.' "'Sir, there is a poor crippled soldier, as I know. "'My cottage is very small and humble, sir. "'But if you ever feel like dropping in on him, sir, "'by day or night, he will be honoured, sir, honoured. "'That's me, Sergeant Richard Appleby, "'late of the 19th Hussars, at your service, sir.' "'Saying which, he put on his hat, stiff-armed, "'wheeled, and strode away through the orchard, "'jingling his imaginary spurs louder than ever. "'Well?' inquired Miss Priscilla, in her quick, bright way. "'Well, Mr. Bellew, what do you think of him? First impressions are always best. At least I think so. What do you think of Sergeant Appleby?' "'I think he's a splendid fellow,' said Bellew, looking after the sergeant's upright figure. "'Very foolish old fellow, I think, and as stiff as one of the ramrods of one of his own guns,' said Miss Priscilla. But her clear blue eyes were very soft and tender as she spoke. "'And as fine a soldier as a man, I'm sure,' said Bellew. "'Why, yes, he was a good soldier, once upon a time, I believe. "'He won the Victoria Cross, for doing something or other that was very brave, "'and he wears it with all his other medals pinned on the inside of his coat. "'Oh, yes, he was a fine soldier once, "'but he's a very foolish old soldier now, I think, "'and as stiff as the ramrod of one of his own guns. "'But I'm glad you like him, Mr. Bellew, "'and he will be proud and happy for you to call and see him at his cottage.' And now I suppose it's uh, half past eleven, isn't it? Yes, just half past, nodded Bellew, glancing at his watch. Exact the time as usual, said Miss Priscilla. I don't think the sergeant has missed a minute or varied a minute in the last five years. You see, he's such a very methodical man, Mr. Bellew. Why then, does he come every day at the same hour? Every day, nodded Miss Priscilla. It has become a matter of habit with him. 
Ah, said Betty, smiling. If you were to ask me why he comes, I should answer that I fancy it is to look at the peaches. Dear me, Mr. Bellew, what a very foolish old soldier he is, to be sure. Saying which, pretty, bright-eyed Miss Priscilla laughed again, folded up her work, settled it in the basket with a deft little pat, and, rising, took a small crutch stick from where it had lain concealed, and then Betty saw that she was lame. Oh, yes, I'm a cripple, you see, she nodded. Oh, very, very lame. My ankle, you know. That is why I came here. The big world didn't want a poor, lame old woman. That is why Miss Anthea may be her aunt, God bless her. No, thank you. I can carry my basket. See, you see, he has lost an arm, his right one, and I am lame in my foot. Perhaps that is why... Hey-ho, how beautifully the blackbirds are singing this morning, to be sure. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 9, in which may be found some description of Arcadia and gooseberries. Anthea, leaning on her rake in a shady corner of the five-acre field, turned to watch Bellew, who, stripped to his shirt-sleeves, bare of neck and arm and pitchfork in hand, was busy tossing up great mounds of sweet-smelling hay to Adam, who stood upon a wagon to receive it, with small porges perched up beside him. A week had elapsed since Bellew had found his way to Dapplemere, a week which had only served to strengthen the bonds of affection between him and his nephew, and to win over sharp-eyed, shrewd little Miss Priscilla, to the extent of declaring him to be, first, a gentleman, Anthea, my dear, and secondly, what is much rarer nowadays, a true man. A week, and already he was hail-fellow well met with every one about the place, for who was proof against his unaffected gaiety, his simple, easy good fellowship? So he laughed and joked as he swung his pitchfork, awkwardly enough, to be sure, and received all hints and directions as to its use in the kindly spirit they were tendered. And Anthea, watching him from her shady corner, sighed once or twice, and, catching herself so doing, stamped her foot at herself and pulled her sunbonnet closer about her face. "'No, Adam,' he was saying, "'depend upon it there is nothing like exercise, and of all exercise give me a pitchfork.' "'Why, as to that, Mr. Bellew, sir,' Adam retorted, "'I say so be it so long as I ain't near the wrong end of it, "'for the way you do have a flourishing and a whirling that there fork "'is as fair astonishing, I do declare it be. "'Why, you see, Adam, there are some born with a leaning towards pitchforks, "'and there are others born to the pen, and the uh, uh, palette and things, "'but for me, Adam, the pitchfork every time,' said Bellew, mopping his brow. "'If you was to try and handle it more as if it were a pitchfork now, Mr. Bellew, sir,' suggested Adam, and not waiting for Bellew's laughing rejoinder, he chirped to the horses, and the great wagon creaked away with its mountainous load, surmounted by Adam's grinning visage and small porges' golden curls, and followed by the rest of the merry-voiced haymakers. Now it was that, turning his head, Bellew espied Anthea watching him, whereupon he shouldered his fork, and coming to where she sat upon a throne of hay, he sank down at her feet with a luxurious sigh. She had never seen him without a collar before, and now she could not but notice how round and white and powerful his neck was, and how the muscles bulged upon arm and shoulder, and how his hair curled in small damp rings upon his brow. "'It is good,' said he, looking up into her witching face above him. "'Yes, it is very good to, to see you idle, just for once.' "'And I was thinking it was good to see you work, just for once.' "'Work!' he exclaimed. "'My dear Miss Anthea, I assure you I have become a positive glutton for work. "'It has become my earnest desire to plant things and grow things "'and chop things with axes, to mow things with scythes. "'I dream of pastures and ploughs, of pails and pitchforks by night, "'and by day reaping hooks, hoes and rakes are in my thoughts continually, "'which all goes to show the effect of this wonderful air of Arcadia. "'Indeed, I am as full of suppressed energy these days as Adam is of the old Adam.' and talking of Adam reminds me that he has solemnly pledged himself to initiate me into the mysteries of swinging a scythe tomorrow morning at five o'clock. Yes, indeed, my heart bounds responsive to the swish of a scythe in thick grass, and my soul sits enraptured upon a pitchfork. How ridiculous you are, she laughed. 
And how perfectly content, he added. Is anyone ever quite content? She sighed, glancing down at him, wistful-eyed. Not unless they have found Arcadia, he answered. Have you, then? Yes, he nodded complacently. Oh, yes, I've found it. Are you sure? Quite sure. Arcadia, she repeated, wrinkling her brows. What is Arcadia, and where? Arcadia, answered Bellew, watching the smoke rise up from his pipe with a dreamy eye. Arcadia is the promised land, the land that everyone tries to find some time or other, and maybe anywhere. And how came you to find it? By the most fortunate chance in the world. Tell me, said Anthea, taking a wisp of hay and beginning to plait it in dexterous brown fingers. Tell me how you found it. Why, then, you must know, in the first place, he began in his slow, even voice, that it is a place I have sought for in all my wanderings, and I have been pretty far afield. But I sought it so long and so vainly that I began to think it was like the El Dorado of the old adventurers and had never existed at all. Yes, said Anthea, busy with her plaiting. But one day, fate, or chance, or destiny, or their benevolent spirit, sent a certain square-shouldered wagoner to show me the way, and after him a very small porges, bless him, to lead me into this wonderful Arcadia. Oh, I see, nodded Anthea, very intent upon her plaiting. But there is something more, said Bellew. Oh, said Anthea, shall I tell you? If it is very interesting. Well, then, in this delightful land there is a castle, grim, embattled, and very strong. A castle? said Anthea, glancing up suddenly. The castle of heart's desire. Oh, said she, and gave all her attention to her plaiting again. And so, continued Bellew, I am waiting very patiently, until, in her own good time, she who rules within shall open the gate to me, or bid me go away. Into Bellew's voice had crept a thrill no one had ever heard there before. He leaned nearer to her, and his dreamy eyes were keen now and eager. And she, though she saw nothing of all this, yet, being a woman, knew it was there, of course, and for that very reason looked resolutely away. Well, for once again Bellew heartily wished that some bonnets had never been invented. So there was silence while Anthea stared away across the golden cornfields, yet saw nothing of them, and Bailey looked upon those slender, capable fingers that had faltered in their plaiting and stopped. And thus, upon the silence, there broke a sudden voice shrill with interest. "'Go on, Uncle Porges. What about the dragons? Oh, please go on. There's always dragons in enchanted castles, you know, to guard the lovely princess. Aren't you going to have any dragons that hiss, you know, and spit out smoke and flames? Oh, do please have a dragon?' And small porges appeared from the other side of the haymow, flushed and eager. "'Certainly, my porges,' nodded Bellew, drawing the small figure down beside him. "'I was forgetting the dragons, but there they are, with scaly backs and iron claws, spitting out sparks and flames, just as self-respecting dragons should, and roaring away like thunder.' "'Ah!' exclaimed small porges, nestling closer to Bellew, and reaching out a hand to Auntie Anthea. "'That's fine. Let's have plenty of dragons. Do you think uh, a dozen would be enough, my porges?' "'Oh, yes!' But suppose the beautiful princess didn't open the door. What would you do if you were really a wandering knight who was waiting patiently for it to open? What would you do then? Shoot up a tree, my porges. Oh, well, that wouldn't be a bit right, would it, auntie? Of course not, laughed Anthea. It would be most unknight-like and very undignified. Besides, added small porges, you couldn't climb up a tree in your armour, you know. But I make an awful good try at it, nodded Bellew. No, said Small Porges, shaking his head. Shall I tell you what you ought to do? Well, then, you draw your two-edged sword and dress your shield, like Gareth the kitchen knave did. He was always dressing his shield, and so was Lancelot, and you'd fight all those dragons and kill them and cut their heads off. And then what would happen? inquired Bellew. Why, then the lovely princess would open the gate and marry you, of course, and live happily ever after, and all would be revelry and joy. Ah, sighed Bellew. If you do that, I think I'd fight all the dragons that ever roared, and kill them too. But supposing she uh, wouldn't open the gate? Why then, said Small Porches, wrinkling his brow, why then 
You'd have to storm the castle, of course, and break open the gate and run off with the princess on your charger. If she was very beautiful, you know. A most excellent idea, my porches. If I should happen to find myself in like circumstances, I'll surely take your advice. Now, as he spoke, Lady glanced at Anthea, and she at him. And straightway she blushed, and then she laughed, and then she blushed again, and still blushing, rose to her feet, and turned to find Mr. Cassillis within a yard of them. "'Now, Miss Anthea,' said he, lifting his hat, "'I sent Georgie to find you, but it seems he forgot to mention that I was waiting. "'I'm awful sorry, Mr. Cassillis, but Uncle Porges was telling us about dragons, you know,' Small Porges hastened to explain. "'Dragons,' repeated Mr. Cassillis, with his supercilious smile. "'Ah, oh, indeed. Dragons should be interesting, especially in such a very quiet, shady nook as this. Quite an idyllic place for storytelling. It's a positive shame to disturb you.' His sharp white teeth gleamed beneath his moustache as he spoke, and he tapped his riding boot lightly with his hunting crop as he fronted Bellew, who had risen and stood bare-armed, leaning upon his pitchfork. And as in their first meeting, there was a mute antagonism in their look. "'Let me introduce you to each other,' said Anthea, conscious of this attitude. "'Mr. Cassillis of Brampton Court, Mr. Bellew.' "'Of nowhere in particular, sir,' added Bellew. "'And pray,' said Mr. Cassillis, perfunctorily, as they strolled on across the meadow. "'How do you like Dapplemere, Mr. Bellew?' "'Immensely, sir, beyond all expression. "'Yes, it is considered rather pretty, I believe.' "'Lovely, sir,' nodded Bellew. "'But it's not so much the beauty of the place itself that appeals to me so much as what it contains.' "'Oh, indeed,' said Mr. Cassillis, with a sudden sharp glance. "'To what do you refer?' Uh, "'Gooseberry, sir.' "'I uh, beg your pardon?' "'Sir,' said Bellew gravely, "'all my life I have fostered a great secret passion for gooseberries. "'Raw or cooked, in pie, pudding or jam, they are equally alluring. "'Unhappily the American gooseberry is but a hollow mockery at best.' "'Ah,' said Mr. Cassillis dubiously, "'now in gooseberries, as in everything else, sir, "'there is to be found the superlative, the quintessence, the ideal. "'Consequently I have roamed east and west and north and south in quest of it.' "'Really?' said Mr. Cassillis, stifling a yawn, and turning towards Miss Anthea with the very slightest shrug of his shoulders. "'And in Dapplemere,' concluded Bellow solemnly, "'I have at last found my ideal. Gooseberry,' added Anthea, with a laugh in her eyes. "'Arcadia being a land of ideals,' nodded Bellew. "'Ideals,' said Mr. Cassillis, caressing his moustache. "'Ideals and uh, gooseberries, though probably excellent things in themselves, are Happy to pall upon one in time. Personally, I find them equally insipid. Of course, it is all a matter of taste, sighed Bellew. But, Mr. Cassillis went on, fairly turning his back upon him, the subject I wish to discuss with you, Miss Anthea, was the uh, approaching sale. The sale, she repeated, all the brightness dying out of her face. I wished, said Cassillis, leaning nearer to her and lowering his voice confidentially, to try to convince you how unnecessary it would be if... And he paused significantly. Anthea turned quickly aside, as though to hide her mortification from Bellew's keen eyes, whereupon he, seeing it all, became straightway more dreamy than ever, and laying a hand upon Small Porges's shoulder, pointed with his pitchfork to where, at the other end of the five-acre, the haymakers worked away as merrily as ever. "'Come, my porges,' said he, "'let us away and join yon happy throng, "'and uh, with Daphnis and Clo and Blowsable "'we'll listen to the, the cuckoo in the dell.' "'So, hand in hand, the two porges set off together. "'But when they had got some distance, "'Bedu looked back, "'and then he saw that Anthea walked with her head averted. "'Yet Cassillis walked close beside her "'and stooped now and then "'until the black moustache came very near the curl, "'that curl of want of witchery that peeped above her ear. "'Uncle Porges, why do you frown so?' "'Frown, my Porges? Did I? Well, I was thinking. "'Well, I'm thinking, too, only I don't frown, you know, but I, I'm thinking just the same.' "'And what might you be thinking, nephew?' "'Why, I was thinking that although you're so awfully fond of gooseberries, and though there's lots of ripe ones on the bushes, I've never seen you eat a single one.' End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers.
Chapter 10. How Bellew and Adam entered into a solemn league and covenant. Look at the moon tonight, Uncle Porges. I see it. It's awful big and round, isn't it? Yes, it's very big and very round. Uh, rather yellow, isn't it? Very yellow. Just like a great big golden sovereign, isn't it? Very much like a sovereign, my Porges. Would you know, I was wondering if there's any chance that it was a money moon. They were leaning out at the lattice, small porges and big porges. Anthea and Miss Priscilla were busied upon household matters, wholly feminine, wherefore small porges had drawn Bellew to the window, and there they leaned, the small body enfolded by Bellew's long arm, and the two faces turned up to the silvery splendour of the moon. But now Anthea came up behind them, and not noticing the position of Bellew's arm as she leaned on the other side of small porges, it befell that her hand touched and for a moment rested upon Bellew's hand, hidden as it was in the shadow. And this probably began it. The air of Arcadia, as has been said before, is an intoxicating air, but it is more. It is an air charged with a subtle magic whereby the commonest objects, losing their prosaic, matter-of-fact shapes, become transfigured into things of wonder and delight. Little things that pass as mere ordinary commonplaces, things insignificant and wholly beneath notice in the everyday world, become fraught with such infinite meaning, and may hold such sublime, such undreamed-of possibilities here in Arcadia. Thus, when it is recorded that Anthea's hand accidentally touched and rested upon Bellew's, the significance of it will become at once apparent. "'And pray,' said Anthea, laying that same hand in the most natural manner in the world upon the small porch's curls, "'Pray, what might you two be discussing so very solemnly?' "'The moon,' answered Small Porges. "'I was wondering if it was a money moon, "'and Uncle Porges hasn't said if it is yet.' "'Why, no, old chap,' answered Bellew. "'I'm afraid not.' "'And pray,' said Anthea again, "'what might a money moon be?' "'Well,' explained Small Porges, "'when the moon's just, just so, "'then you go out and, and, and find a fortune, you know. "'But the moon's got to be a money moon, "'and you've got to know, you know, "'else you'll find nothing, of course.' "'Ah, oh, Georgie, dear,' sighed Anthea, stooping her dark head down to his golden curls. "'Don't you know that fortunes are very hard to get, and that they have to be worked for, and that no one ever found one without a great deal of labour and sorrow? "'Of course everyone can't find fortunes, Auntie Anthea, I know that, but we shall. "'My Uncle Porges knows all about it, you see, and I know that we shall. "'I'm sure as sure we shall find one some day, because, you see, I put it in my prayers now. "'At the end, you know, I say—' "'And please help me and Uncle Porges to find a fortune when the money moon comes, "'a big one, well without end, amen. "'So you see, it's all right, and we're just waiting till the money moon comes, aren't we, Uncle Porges?' "'Yes, old chap, yes,' nodded Bellew, "'until the money moon comes.' "'And so there fell a silence between them, "'yet a silence that held a wondrous charm of its own, "'a silence that lasted so long that the coppery curls drooped lower and lower upon Bellew's arm, till Anthea, sighing, rose, and in a very tender voice bade small porges say good-night, the which he did, forthwith, slumberous of voice and sleepy-eyed, and so, with his hand in Anthea's, went drowsily up to bed. Wherefore, seeing that Miss Priscilla had bustled away into the kitchen, Bellew sauntered out into the rose-garden to look upon the beauty of the night. The warm air was fragrant with dewy scents, and the moon, already high above the tree-tops, poured down her gentle radiance upon the quaint old garden with its winding walks and clipped yew hedges, while upon the quiet, from the dim shadow of the distant woods, stole the soft, sweet song of a nightingale. Billy walked a path bordered with flowers and chequered with silver patches of moonlight, drinking in the thousand beauties about him, staring up at the glory of the moon, the indigo of the sky, and listening to the voice of the lonely singer in the wood. And yet it was not of none of these, he was thinking, as he paused under the shadow of King Arthur, nor of small porges, nor of anyone or anything in this world, but only the sudden light touch of a warm, soft hand upon his. "'Be that you, sir?' Bellew started, and now he found that he had been sitting all this while with an empty pipe between his teeth, yet content therewith. Wherefore he shook his head and wondered. "'Be that you, Mr. Bellew, sir?' "'Yes, Adam, it is I.' "'And how might you be feeling now, out of your exercise with a pitchfork, sir?' "'Very fit, I thank you, Adam,' 
Sit down and smoke, and let us converse together. Why, thank you, sir, answered Adam, producing the small black clay pipe from his waistcoat pocket, and accepting Bellew's proffered pouch. I've been up to the house of visiting Prudence, the cook. And a rare cook she be, too, Mr. Bellew, sir. And a rare buxom girl into the bargain, Adam. Oh, hush, she's well enough, sir. I won't go for to denying as she's a fine, upstanding, well-shaped, tall and proper figure of a woman as ever was, sir. Well, the Kentish lasses be a tidy lot, Mr. Bellew, sir. But, Lord, when you come to think of her gift for Yorkshire pudding, likewise jam rollers and sea cake, which though mentioned last ain't by no manner of means least, when you come to think of her brewer ale and cider and ginger wine, why then I'm took, sir, I'm took altogether, and the old Adam inside of me works hisself into such a state that if another chap, especially that there job Jagway, gets looking her way too often, why it's got to get took out of him, or took out of me in good hard knocks, Mr. Bellew, sir. And when are you going to get married, Adam? Well, sir, we was thinking that if Miss Anthea has a good season this year, we get it over and done with some time in October, sir. But it's all according. According to what? To the ops, sir. The H-O-P-S. Ops, sir. They're coming on fine. Ah, scrumptious they'll be. If they don't take the blight, sir, they'll be the finest ops this side of Mainstone. But then if they do take the blight, well, then my hopes is blighted likewise, sir. B-L-I-T-E-D. Blighted, Mr. Bellew, sir. It said, Adam laughed once nodded his head several times, and relapsed into puffing silence. "'Mr. Cassidus was over today, Adam,' said Bellew, after a while, pursuing a train of thought. "'Ah, sir, I seen him. He also seen me. He told me as Job Jagway was up and about again. Likewise, Job Jagway will be over here tomorrow, along with the rest of them for the sale, sir.' "'Ah, yes, the sale,' said Bellew thoughtfully. "'To think of that there Job Jagway are coming over here to buy Miss Anthea's furniture, to set the old Adam a-working inside of me to that amazing extent as I can't sit still, Mr. Bellew, sir. If that that Job crosses my path tomorrow, well, let him, sir. Look out, that's all. Saying which, Adam doubled up a huge knotted fist and shook it at an imaginary Job. Adam, said Bellew, in the same thoughtful tone, I wonder if you would do something for me. And if you ask me, sir, so long as you don't want me to... I want you to buy some of that furniture for me. Bart? exclaimed Adam, and vented his great laugh again. "'Well, if that ain't a good un, sir, why, that's just what I was not going to do. See, I ain't what you might call a rich cove, nor you're a millionaire, but I've got a bit put by, and I drawed out ten pound yesterday. Thinks I, here's to save Miss Anthea's old sideboard, or the mirror she's so fond of, or if not, why, then a cheer or so, they ain't a-going to get it all. Not what I've got a pound or two, I says to myself. "'Adam,' said Bedew, turning suddenly, that sentiment does you credit. That sentiment makes me proud to have knocked you into a ditch. Shake hands, Adam. And there, beneath the great apple tree, while the moon looked on, they very solemnly shook hands. And now, Adam, pursued Bellew, I want you to put back your ten pounds. Keep it for prudence, because I happen to have rather more than we shall want. See here. And with the words, Bellew took out a leathern wallet, and from this wallet money and banknotes. More money and more banknotes than Adam had ever beheld in all his thirty-odd years, a sight of which his eyes opened and his square jaw relaxed to the imminent danger of his cherished clay pipe. "'I want you to take this,' Benny went on, counting a sum into Adam's nerveless hand, "'and tomorrow, when the sale begins, if anyone makes a bid for anything, I want you to bid higher. And no matter what, you must always buy. Always. You understand?' "'Sir, there's that old drawing-room cabinet with the carvings. "'Buy it. "'And then the silver candlesticks, and, and then the four-poster bedstead, and the... "'Buy em, Adam. Buy everything. "'If we haven't enough money, there's plenty more where this came from. "'Only buy. You understand?' "'Oh, yes, sir, I understand. "'How much have you given me? "'Why, yes, forty-five, fifty, sixty. Lord! "'Put it away, Adam. Forget all about it till tomorrow. "'And not a word, mind.' hundred pound!' gasped Adam. "'Lord, oh, I won't speak of him. Trust me, Mr. Bellew, sir. But to think of me a-walking about with a hundred pound in my pocket, Lord, I won't say nothing. But to think of old Adam with a hundred pound in his pocket, he got, it do seem that comical.' Saying which, Adam buttoned the money into a capacious pocket, snapped it, nodded, and rose. "'Well, sir, I'll be going. There'll be Miss Anthea in the garden yonder. 
And if she was to see me now, there's no saying but I should be took a laughing to think of this here hundred pound. Miss Anthea, where? Coming through the rose garden. She'd be off to see old Mother Dibbin. They call Mother Dibbin a witch, and now she's down with the rheumatics. There ain't nobody to look after her, except Miss Anthea. She's a starved afore now, if it hadn't been for North Miss Anthea. But Lord love your eyes and limbs, Mr. Bellew, sir. Miss Anthea don't care if she's a witch, or fifty witches, not she. So good night, Mr. Bellew, sir. Mum's the word. Saying which, Adam slapped his pocket again, nodded, winked, and went upon his way. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 11 of The Man with the Tiger Mark It is a moot question as to whether a curl can be more alluring when it glows beneath the fiery kisses of the sun or shines demurely in the tender radiance of the moon. As Berry looked at it now, that same small curl that nodded and beckoned to him above Anthea's left ear, he strongly inclined to the latter opinion. "'Adam tells me that you are going out, Miss Anthea.' "'Only as far as Mrs. Dibbin's cottage, just across the meadow. "'Adam also informs me that Mrs. Dibbin is a witch. "'People call her so. "'Never in all my days have I seen a genuine old witch, "'so I'll come with you, if I may.' "'Oh, this is a very gentle old witch, and she's neither humpbacked nor does she ride a broomstick, "'so I'm afraid you'll be disappointed, Mr. Bellew. "'Then at least I can carry your basket. Allow me.' "'And so, in his quiet, masterful fashion, he took the basket from her arm "'and walked on beside her through the orchard. "'What a glorious night it is!' exclaimed Anthea suddenly, "'drawing a deep breath of the fragrant air. "'Oh, it is good to be alive, in spite of all the cares and worries.' Life is very sweet. After this, they walked on some distance in silence, she gazing wistfully upon the beauties of the familiar world about her, while he watched the curl above her ear, until she, becoming aware of it all at once, promptly sent it back into retirement with a quick, deft little pat of her fingers. I hope, said Betty at last, I do sincerely hope that you tucked up my nephew safe in bed. You see, your nephew, indeed. "'Our nephew, then. I ask, because he tells me that he can't possibly sleep unless you go to tuck him up, and I can quite believe it. "'Do you know, Mr. Bellew, I'm growing quite jealous of you. He can't move a step without you, and he is forever talking and lauding your numberless virtues. "'But well, then I'm only an uncle, after all, and if he talks of me to you, he talks of you to me all day long.' "'Oh, does he? Oh, does he? And among other things he told me that I ought to see you when your hair is down and all about you.' "'Oh!' exclaimed Anthea. "'Indeed, our nephew is much luckier than I, "'because I never had an aunt of my own to come and tuck me up at night, "'with her hair hanging all about her, like a beautiful cloak. "'So, you see, I have no boyish recollections to go upon, "'but I think I can imagine.' "'And what do you think of the sergeant?' Anthea inquired, "'changing the subject abruptly. "'I like him so much that I am going to take him at his word "'and call upon him at the first opportunity.' "'Did Aunt Priscilla tell you that he comes marching along regularly every day at exactly the same hour?' "'Yes, to see how the peaches are getting on,' nodded Bellew. "'For such a very brave soldier, he is a dreadful coward,' said Anthea, smiling. "'It has taken him five years to screw up courage enough to tell her that she's uncommonly young for her age. "'Yet I think it is just that diffidence that makes him so lovable. "'And he is so simple and so gentle, in spite of all his war medals.' When I am moody and cross, the very sight of him is enough to put me in humour again. Has he never spoken to Miss Priscilla? Never, though of course she knows, and has done from the very first. I asked him once why he had never told her what it was brought him so regularly, to look at the peaches, and he said in his quick, sharp way, Miss Anthea, can't be done, ma'am. Poor battered old soldier, only one arm, no, ma'am. I wonder if one could find just such another sergeant outside Arcadia said Bellew. I wonder. Now they were approaching a stile towards which Bellew had directed his eyes from time to time, as for that matter, curiously enough, had Anthea. But to him it seemed that it never would be reached, while to her it seemed that it would be reached much too soon. Therefore she began to rack her mind trying to remember some gate or any gap in the hedge that should obviate the necessity of climbing it. Before she could recall any such gate or gap, they were at the stile, 
and Bellew, leaping over, had set down the basket and stretched out his hand to aid her over. But Anthea, tall and lithe, active and vigorous with her outdoor life, and used to such things from her infancy, stood a moment hesitating. To be sure the style was rather high, yet she could have vaulted it nearly, if not quite, as easily as Bellew himself, had she been alone. But then she was not alone. Moreover, be it remembered, this was in Arcadia of a midsummer night. Thus she hesitated, only a moment, it is true, for seeing the quizzical look in his eyes that always made her vaguely rebellious, with a quick, light movement she mounted the stile, and there paused to shake her head in laughing disdain of his outstretched hand. Then there was the sound of rending cambric. She tripped, and next moment he caught her in his arms. It was for but a very brief instant that she lay, soft and yielding, in his embrace. Yet she was conscious of how strong were the arms that held her so easily ere they set her down. "'I beg your pardon. How awkward I am!' she exclaimed, in hot mortification. "'No,' said Benny, shaking his head. "'It was a nail, you know, a bent and rusty nail. Here, under the top bar. Is your dress much torn?' "'Oh, that is nothing, thank you.' So they went on again. But now they were silent once more, and very naturally, for Anthea was mightily angry, with herself, the style, Bellew, and everything concerned, while he was thinking of the sudden warm clasp of her arms, of the alluring fragrance of her hair, and of the shy droop of her lashes as she lay in his embrace. Therefore, as he walked on beside her, saying nothing, within his secret soul he poured benedictions upon the head of that bent and rusty nail. And presently, Having turned down a grassy lane and crossed a small but very noisy brook that chattered impertinences among the stones and chuckled at them slyly from the shadows, they eventually came upon a small and very lonely little cottage, bowered in roses and honeysuckle, as are all the cottages hereabouts. But now Anthea paused, looking at Bellew with a dubious brow. "'I ought to warn you that Mrs. Dibbin is very old and sometimes a little queer and sometimes says very surprising things.' "'Excellent,' nodded Bellew, holding the little gate open for her. "'Very right and proper conduct for a witch, and I love surprises above all things.' But Anthea still hesitated, while Bellew stood with his hand upon the gate, waiting for her to enter. Now he had left his hat behind him, and as the moon shone down on his bare head, she could not but notice how bright and yellow was his hair, despite the thick black brows below. "'I think I, I, I would rather you waited outside.' "'If you don't mind, Mr. Bellew, you mean that I am to be denied the joy of conversing with a real live old witch and having my fortune told?' he sighed. "'Well, if such is your will, so be it,' said he obediently, and handed her the basket. "'I won't keep you waiting very long, and thank you,' she smiled, and hurrying up the narrow path she tapped at the cottage door. "'Come in! Come in!' cried an old, quavering voice, albeit very sharp and piercing. "'That's me, my own soft dove of a maid, my proud, beautiful white lady. "'Come in, come in, and bring him with you. "'Him is so big and strong, him as I've expected so long, "'the tall, golden man from overseas. "'Bid him come in, Miss Anthea, that Goody Dibbin's old eyes may look at him at last.' "'Hereupon, at a sigh from Anthea, Bellew turned in at the gate and, striding up the path, entered the cottage. "'Despite the season, a fire burned upon the hearth, and crouched over this in a great elbow-chair sat a very bent and aged woman. Her face was furrowed and seamed with numberless lines and wrinkles, but her eyes were still very bright, and she wore no spectacles. Likewise her white hair was wonderfully thick and abundant, as could plainly be seen and beneath the thrill of her cap, for like the very small room of this very small cottage, she was extremely neat and tidy. She had a great curving nose and a great curving chin, and what with this and her bright black eyes and stooping figure, she was very much like what a witch should be, albeit a very superior kind of old witch. She sat for a while, staring up at Bellew, who stood tall and bareheaded, smiling down at her, and then all at once she nodded her head three several and distinct times. All right, she quavered. Right, right, it'd be all right. The golden man, as I've watched this many and many a day, with the curly hair and the sleepy eye, and the tiger mark upon his arm. Right, right. What do you mean by tiger mark? inquired Bellew. 
I mean, young master, with your golden curls, I mean, as sitting here day in and day out, staring down into my fire, I has my dreams. At least suppose I cause them my dreams, and that there's of them as cause it the second sight. But pray sit down, tall sir, on the stool there, and you, my tender maid, my dark lady, come you here, upon my right. And if you wish, I'll look into the ink, or read your pretty hand, or tell you what I see down there in the fire. But no, first show me what you brought for old Nanny in the blessed basket, the fine, strong basket as holds so much. Yes, set it down here, where I can open it myself, tall sir. Huh? What's this? Tea. God bless you for the tea, my dear. And eggs, and butter, and a cold chicken. The Lord bless your kind heart, Miss Anthea. Ah, my proud lady, happy the man who shall wed ye. Happy the man who shall wed ye, my dark, beautiful maid. And strong must he be, I, and masterful he who shall wake the love-light in those dark, grey, passionate eyes of yours. And there's no man in all this world can do it, but he must be a golden man, with a tiger-mark upon him. Why, oh, Nanny! I blush if ye will, my dark lady. Mother Dibbin knows she's seen it in the fire, dreamed it in her dreams, and read it in the ink. The path lies very darker for ye, my lady. Ay, very dark it be, and full of cares and troubles. For there's the sun shining beyond, bright and golden. You be proud and high and scornful, my lady. Tis in your blood. You need a strong hand to guide ye, and the strong hand shall come. By force you shall be wooed, and by force you shall be wed. And there be no man strong enough to woo and wed ye, but him as I've told ye of, him as bears the tiger-mark. But Nanny, said Anthea again, gently interrupting her and patting the old woman's shriveled hand, you're forgetting the basket. You haven't found all we've brought you yet. Ay, ay, nodded old Nanny, the fine, strong basket. Let's see what's more in the good, kind basket. Here's bread and sugar and a pound of your favourite tobacco said Anthea, with a smiling nod. "'Oh, the good weed, the blessed weed!' cried the old woman, clutching the package with trembling fingers. "'Ah, who can tell the comfort it has been to me in the long, long days, and the long, long nights, the blessed weed, when I've sat here a-looking and a-looking into the fire? God bless you, my sweet maid, for your kindly thought!' With a sudden gesture she caught Anthea's hand to her lips, and then, just as suddenly, turned upon Bellew. "'And now, tall sir, can I do all for ye? Shall I look into the fire for ye, or the ink, or read your hand?' "'Why, yes,' answered Bellew, stretching out his hand to her. "'You shall tell me two things, if you will. First, shall one ever find his way into the castle of heart's desire? And secondly, when?' "'Oh, but I don't need to look into your hand to tell you that, tall sir, nor yet in the ink or in the fire, for I have dreamed it in all my dreams.' And now, see you, tis a strong place, this castle, with thick doors and great locks and bars. But I've seen those doors broke down, those great locks and bars burst asunder, but there is none can do this but him as bears the tiger mark. So much for the first. And for the second, happiness shall come in riding to you on the full moon. But you must reach up and take it for yourself, if you be tall enough. "'And even you are not tall enough to do that, Mr. Bellew,' laughed Anthea, as she rose to bid old Nanny good-night. While Bellew, unnoticed, slipped certain coins upon a corner of the chimney-piece. So old Nanny blessed them and theirs, past, present, and future, thoroughly and completely, with a fine comprehensiveness that only a genuinely accomplished old witch might hope to attain to, and following them to the door, Paused there with one shrivelled, claw like hand uplifted towards the sky. At the foot of the moon, tall sir, she repeated, at the foot of the moon. As for you, my dark lady, I say, by force you shall be wooed, and by force ye shall be wed. Aye, aye, for there is no man strong enough except he hath the tiger mark upon him. Old Nanny knows. She's seen it in the ink, dreamed it in the fire, and read it all in your pretty hand. And now, Thank ye for the tea, my pretty, and God bless ye for the good mead, and just so sure as you've been good and kind to old Danny, so shall fortune be good and kind to you, Miss Anthea. Poor old Danny, said Anthea, as they went on down the grassy lane. She's so very grateful for so little, and she's such a gentle old creature, really, though the country folk do call her a witch and are afraid of her, because they say she has the evil eye, which is ridiculous, of course. 
but nobody ever goes near her. She's dreadfully lonely, poor old thing. And so that is why you come to sit with her and let her talk to you? inquired Bellew, staring up at the moon. Yes. And do you believe in her dreams and visions? No, of course not, answered Anthea, rather hurriedly, and with a deeper colour in her cheeks, though Bellew was still intent upon the moon. You don't either, do you? she inquired, seeing he was silent. Well, I don't quite know, he answered slowly. But she is rather a wonderful old lady, I think. Yes, she has wonderful thick hair still, nodded Anthea, and she's not a bit deaf, and her eyes are as clear and sharp as ever they were. Yes, but I wasn't meaning her eyes, or her hair, or her hearing. Oh, then, pray, what were you pleased to mean? Did you happen to notice what she said about uh, a man with a tiger mark? inquired Bellew, still gazing up at the moon. Anthea laughed. The man with the tiger mark, of course. He'd been much in her dreams lately, and she'd talked of him a great deal. Has <laughs> she? said Bellew. Ah! Huh. Yes, her mind is full of strange twists and fancies. You see, she is so very old, and she loves to tell me her dreams and read the future for me. Though, of course, you don't believe it, said Bellew. Believe it? Anthea repeated, and walked some dozen paces or so, before she answered, No, of course not. Then none of your fortune, nothing she told you has ever come true? Once more Anthea hesitated, this time so long that Bellew turned from his moon-gazing to look at her. I mean, he went on, has none of it ever come true? About this man with the tiger mark, for instance? No, oh no, answered Anthea rather hastily, and laughed again. My old nanny has seen him in her dreams everywhere, in India and China and Africa, in hot countries and cold countries. Oh, nanny has seen him everywhere. But I have seen him nowhere, and of course I never shall. Ah, said Bellew, and she reads him always in your fortune, does she? And I listen very patiently, Anthea nodded, because it pleases her so much, and it is also very harmless after all, isn't it? Yes, answered Bellew, and very wonderful. Wonderful? Poor old Nanny's fancies? What do you mean by wonderful? Uh, upon my word, I hardly know, said Bellew, shaking his head. But there are more things in heaven than earth, etc., you know, and this is one of them. Really? Now you grow mysterious, Mr. Bellew. Like the night, he answered, turning to aid her across the impertinent brook that chuckled at them and laughed after them, as only such a very impertinent brook possibly could. So betimes they reached the stile and crossed it, this time without mishap, despite the lurking nail, and all too soon for Bellew had traversed the orchard and were come to the garden where the roses all hung so still upon their stems that they might have been asleep, and filling the air with the perfume of their dreams. And here they paused, perhaps because of the witchery of the moon, perhaps to listen to the voice of the nightingale, who sang on more gloriously than ever. Yet, though they stood so close together, their glances seldom met, and they were very silent. But at last, as though making up her mind, Anthea spoke. "'What did you mean when you said old Nanny's dreams were so wonderful?' she asked. "'I'll show you,' he answered. And while he spoke, slipped off his coat, and drawing up his shirt-sleeve, held out a muscular white arm towards her. He held it out in the full radiance of the moon, and thus, looking down at it, her eyes grew suddenly wide, and her breath caught strangely as surprise gave place to something else. For there, plain to be seen upon the white flesh, were three long scars that wound up from elbow to shoulder. And so for a while they stood thus, she looking at his arm, and he at her. Why? said she at last, finding voice to a little gasp. Why, then? I am the man with the tiger mark, he said smiling his slow, placid smile. Now, as his eyes looked down into hers, she flushed sudden and hot, and her glance wavered and fell beneath his. Oh! she cried, and with the word turned about and fled from him into the house. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 12 In which may be found a full, true, and particular account of the sale. 
Uncle Porteous, there's a little man in the hall with a red, red nose and a blue, blue chin. Yes, I've seen him. Also his nose and chin, my Porteous. But he's sticking little papers with numbers on them all over my auntie and his chairs and tables. And what do you suppose he's doing that for? Who knows? It's probably all on account of his red nose and blue chin, my Porteous. Anyway, don't worry about him. Let us rather find our Auntie Anthea. They found her in the hall. And it was a hall, here at Dapplemere, wide and high, and with a minstrel's gallery at one end, a hall that years and years ago had often rung with the clash of men-at-arms, and echoed with loud and jovial laughter, for this was the most ancient part of the manor. It looks rather bare and barren just now, for the furniture was all moved out of place, ranged neatly round the walls, and stacked at the farther end, beneath the gallery where the little man in question, blue of chin and red of nose, was hovering about it, damning little tickets on chairs and tables, even as small porters had said. And in the midst of it all stood Anthea, a desolate figure, Bellew thought, who, upon his entrance, bent her head to draw on her driving gloves, for she was waiting for the dog-cart which was to bear her and small porters to Cranbrook, far away from the hollow tap of the auctioneer's hammer. "'We are getting rid of some of the old furniture, you see, Mr. Bellew,' she said, laying her hand on an antique cabinet nearby. "'We really have much more than we ever use.' "'Yes,' said Bellew. But he noticed that her eyes were very dark and wistful, despite her light tone, and that she'd laid her hand upon the old cabinet with a touch, very like a caress. "'Why is that man's nose so awful red and his chin so blue, Auntie Anthea?' inquired Small Porges in a hissing stage whisper. "'Hush, Georgie, I don't know,' said Anthea. "'And why is he sticking his little numbers all over our best furniture?' "'That is to guide the auctioneer.' "'Where to? And what is an auctioneer?' But at this moment, hearing the wheels of the dog-cart at the door, Anthea turned and hastened out into the sunshine. "'Lovely day it do be for driving,' said Adam, touching his hat. "'And best be thinking the same, I do believe.' And he patted the glossy coat of the mare, who arched her neck and pawed the gravel with an impatient hoof. Lightly and nimbly, Anthea swung herself up to the high seat, turning to make small porches secure beside her, as Bellew handed him up. "'You'll look after things for me, Adam?' said Anthea, glancing back wistfully into the dim recesses of the cool, old hall. "'Aye, I will that, Miss Anthea.' "'Mr. Bellew, we can find room for you if you care to come with us.' "'Thanks,' said he, shaking his head. "'But I rather think I'll stay here and um, help Adam to uh, to look after things, if you, if you don't mind.' "'Then good-bye,' said Anthea, and nodding to Adam, he gave the mare her head, and off they went. "'Good-bye,' cried Small Porges, "'and thank you for the shilling, Uncle Porges.' "'The mare is uh, rather fresh this morning, isn't she, Adam?' inquired Bellew, watching the dog-cart's rapid course. "'Fresh, sir? That's rather a, a dangerous sort of thing for a woman to drive, isn't it?' "'Meaning the dog-cart, sir?' "'Meaning the dog-cart, Adam.' "'Why, Lord love ye, Mr. Bellow, sir,' cried Adam, with his great laugh. "'There ain't nobody can handle the ruins better than Miss Anthea. "'There ain't a horse she can't drive. "'Are all right, for that matter. "'Not nowhere, sir.' "'Ah,' said Bellew. "'Having watched the dog-cart out of sight, "'he turned and followed Adam into the stables. "'And here, sitting upon a bale of hay, "'they smoked many pipes together in earnest converse, "'until such time as the sale should begin. As the day advanced, people began arriving in twos and threes, and among the first, the auctioneer himself. A jovial-faced man was this auctioneer, with jovial manner and a jovial smile. Indeed, his joviality seemed, somehow or other, to have got into the very buttons of his coat, where they fairly winked and twinkled with joviality. Upon catching sight of the furniture, he became, if possible, more jovial than ever, and, beckoning to his assistant, that is to say, to the small man with the red nose and the blue chin, who, it seemed, answered to the name of Theodore, he clapped him jovially upon the back, rather as though he were knocking him down to some unfortunate bidder, and immediately fell into business converse with him, albeit jovial still. But all the while intending purchasers were arriving. They came on horse and afoot, and in conveyances of every sort and kind, and the tread of their feet and the buzz of their voices awoke unwonted echoes in the old place. And still they came, from far and near, until some hundred-odd people were crowded into the hall. 
Conspicuous among them was a large man with a fat red neck, which he was continually mopping at, and rubbing with a vivid bandana handkerchief scarcely less red. Indeed, red seemed to be his pervading colour, for his hair was red, his hands were red, and his face, heavy and round, was reddest of all, out of whose flaming circumference two diminutive but very sharp eyes winked and blinked continually. His voice, like himself, was large with a peculiar brassy ring to it that penetrated to the farthest corners and recesses of the old hall. He was, beyond all doubt, a man of substance, and of no small importance, for he was greeted deferentially on all hands, and it was to be noticed that people elbowed each other to make way for him, as people ever will before substance and property. To some of them he nodded, to some he spoke, and with others he even laughed, albeit he was of a solemn, sober, and serious nature, as becomes a man of property and substance. Between whiles, however, he bestowed his undivided attention upon the furniture. He sat down suddenly and heavily in chairs. He pummeled them with his plump red fists, whereby to test their springs. He opened the doors of cabinets, he peered into drawers, he rapped upon tables, and altogether comported himself as a thoroughly knowing man should, who is not to be hocused by veneer, or taken in by the shine and splendour of well-applied beeswax. Tell you, watching all this from where he sat, screened from the throng by a great carved sideboard, and divers chairs and what-nots, drew rather harder at his pipe, and, chancing to catch Adam's eye, beckoned him to approach. "'Who is that round red man yonder, Adam?' he inquired, nodding to where the individual in question was engaged at that moment, poking at something or other with a large, sausage-like finger. "'That,' replied Adam, in a tone of profound disgust, "'that be Mr. Grimes of Cranbrook, sir. Calls himself a corn chandler. What I calls him, well, never mind what, sir. Only it weren't a corn chandling as he'd made all his money, sir. And it be him as we all work and slave for here at Dapplemere Farm. What do you mean, Adam? I mean as it be him as holds the mortgage on Dapplemere, sir. Ah, and how much? Over three thousand pounds, Mr. Bellew, sir, sighed Adam, with a hopeless shake of the head. And that be a powerful lot of money, sir. Bellew thought of the sums he had lavished upon his yacht, upon his three racing cars, and certain other extravagances. Three thousand pounds? Fifteen thousand dollars? It would make a free woman, independent, happy. Just fifteen thousand dollars. And he'd thrown away more than that upon a poker game before now. Lord, exclaimed Adam, the very sight of that there grimes of pig eyes staring at Miss Anthea's furniture do make the old Adam rise up in me to that amazing extent, Mr. Bellew, sir. Why, just look at him a thumping and a pounding at that there chair. Saying which, Adam turned, and elbowing his way to where Mr. Grimes was in the act of testing the springs of an easy chair, he promptly, and as though forced by a struggling mob, fell up against Mr. Grimes, and jostled Mr. Grimes, and trod heavily upon the toes of Mr. Grimes, and all with an expression of the most profound unconsciousness and abstraction, which, upon the indignant corn chandler's loud expostulations, immediately changed to a look of innocent surprise. "'Can't you look where you're going, you clumsy fool?' fumed the irate Grimes, and redder of neck than ever. "'Ax your pardon, Mr. Grimes,' said Adam solemnly, "'but what with people's legs and cheer legs and the legs of tables, not to mention sideboards and cabinets, which, though not having no legs, ain't to be by no matter or means despised, therefore, what with this and that and t'other, and I'm that confined, or, as you might say, confused,' I don't know which leg is mine, or yourn, or anybody else's. Mr. Grimes, sir, I make so bold as to ask your pardon all over again, sir. During which speech, Adam contrived once more to fall against, to tread upon, and to jostle the highly incensed Mr. Grimes back into the crowd again. Thereafter he became a nemesis to Mr. Grimes, haunting him through the jungle of chairs and tables, pursuing him into distant corners and shady places, where, so sure as the sausage-like finger poised itself for an interrogatory poke, or the fat red fist doubled itself for a spring-testing punch, the innocent-seeming Adam would thereupon fall against him from the rear, sideways, or in front. Meanwhile, Bellew sat in his secluded corner, watching the crowd through the blue wreaths of his pipe, but thinking of her, who, brave though she was, had nevertheless run away from it all at the last moment. Presently, however, he was aware that the corn chandler had seated himself on the other side of the chiffonier, puffing and panting with heat and indignation, where he was presently joined by another individual, a small rat-eyed man 
who bid Mr. Grimes a deferential, Good day. That there Adam, puffed the corn chandler, that there Adam ought to be thrown out into the stables where he belongs. I never see a man as was so much growed to feet and elbows in all my days. He ought to be took, repeated the corn chandler, and shook and thrown out into the yard. Yes, said the other, took and shook and thrown out net and crop, sir. And now, what might you think of the furniture, Mr. Grimes? Mm, so, so, Parsons, nodded Grimes. So, so. Should you buy? I'm a-going, said the Torn Chandler, with much deliberation. I'm a-going to take them tapestry chairs, sir, and other likewise the grand further clock in the corner here, likewise the four-post bedstead with the carved head board. And most particular Parsons, I shall take this here sideboard. There ain't another piece like this in the county, as I know of. Solid mahogany, sir, and the carvings. Herewith he gave two loud double knocks upon the article of furniture in question. Oh, I've had my eye on this sideboard for years and years. No doubt I get it some day, too. The only wonder is she ain't had to sell it afore now. Milly Miss Anthea, sir. Ah, her. I say it's a wonder to me. Wouldn't with the, the interest on the mortgage I hold of the place, and one thing or another, it's a wonder to me as she's kept her head above water so long. But mark me, Parsons, mark me. She'll be selling again soon, and next time it'll be lock, stock and barrel, Parsons. Well, I don't know we women farmers myself, nodded Parsons, but as to that cupboard over there, Sheraton, I think, what might you suppose it to be worth? A bit betwixt friends now, inquired Parsons, the rat-eyed. Can't say till I've seen it, and likewise felt it, answered the corn chandler, rising. Let me lay me hand upon it, and I'll tell you, to a shilling. And here they elbowed their way into the crowd. But Bellew sat there, chin in hand, quite oblivious to the fact that his pipe was out long since. The tall old grandfather clock ticking in leisurely fashion in the corner behind him, solemn and sedate, as it had done since, as the neat inscription upon the dial testified, it had first been made in the year of grace 1732 by one Jabez Havisham of London. This ancient timepiece now uttered a sudden wheeze, which, considering its great age, could scarcely be wondered at, and thereafter, the wheezing having subsided, gave forth a soft and mellow chime, proclaiming to all and sundry that it was twelve o'clock. Hereupon the auctioneer, bustling to and fro with his hat upon the back of his head, consulted his watch, nodded to the red-nosed, blue-chinned Theodore, and, perching himself above the crowd, gave three sharp knocks with his hammer. Gentlemen, he began, and here he was interrupted by a loud voice raised in hot anger. Confound ye for a clumsy rascal! Will you keep them elbows of yawn out of my whiskers, eh? Will ye keep them big feet of yawn to yourself? If there ain't room enough for ye, out ye go, do you hear? I'll have ye took and shook and throwed out where ye belong. So just mind where you're a-trumping and a-treading. Tread, repeated Adam. Oh, where am I to tread? If I steps backward, I tread on ye. If I steps sideways, I tread on ye. If I step forward, I tread on ye. I do seem to me as I can't get nowhere, but there you be a-waiting to be trod on, Mr. Grimes, sir. Hereupon, the auctioneer rapped louder than ever, upon which the clamour subsiding, he smiled his most jovial smile, and once more began. "'Gentlemen, you have all had an opportunity to examine the furniture I am about to dispose of, and as fair-minded human beings I think you would admit that a finer lot of genuine antique was never offered at one and the same time. Gentlemen, I am not going to burst forth into laudatory rhodomontade. It is a word, gentlemen, that I employ only among an enlightened community such as I now have the honour of addressing. Neither do I propose to waste your time in purposeless verbiage, which is another of the same kind, gentlemen. Therefore, without further preface or preamble, we will proceed at once to business. The first lot I have to offer you is a screen, six foot high. Bring up the screen, Theodore. There it is, gentlemen. Open it out, Theodore. Observe, gentlemen, it is carved rosewood, the panels hand-painted, and representing shepherds and shepherdesses disporting themselves under a tree with banjo and guitar. Now, what I'm offered, this is hand-painted antique screen. Come. Fifteen shillings, from someone deep hidden in the crowd. Start as low as you like, gentlemen. I'm offered a miserable fifteen shillings for a genuine hand-painted... Sixteen. This from a long, loose-limbed fellow with a patch over one eye and another on his cheek. A pound, said Adam promptly. A guinea, nodded he of the patches. Twenty-five shillings, said Adam. Ah, twenty-five shillings, cried the auctioneer. In advance, a genuine hand-painted antique screen... Going at twenty-five, at twenty-five, going, going, gone. 
to the large gentleman in the neck cloth, Theodore. There be that job Jagway, sir, said Adam, leaning across the sideboard to impart his information. Over yonder, Mr. Bellew, sir. Imus was bidding for the screen. The tall chap with the patches. Two patches be pretty good, but I do wish I'd have given him a couple more while I was about it, Mr. Bellew, sir. Here, the auctioneer's voice put an end to Adam's self-reproaches, and he turned back to the business in hand. The next lot I'm going to dispose of, gentlemen, is a fine set of six chairs with carved antique backs and upholstered in tapestry. Also, two armchairs to match with the mount, Theodore. Now, what is your price for these eight fine pieces? Look them over and bid accordingly. Thirty shillings, again from the depths of the crowd. Ha, 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 you joke, sir, laughed the auctioneer, rubbing his hands in his most jovial manner. You joke. I can't see you, but you joke, of course, and I laugh accordingly. Ha, ha, ha. Thirty shillings for eight fine antique tapestried hand-carved shares. Oh, very good. Excellent upon my soul. Three pound, said the fire-necked corn chandler. Guineas, said the rat-eyed Parsons. Four pound, nodded the corn chandler. Four pound ten, roared Adam. Five, nodded Grimes, edging away from Adam's elbow. Six pound ten, cried Adam. Seven, from Parsons. Eight, said Grimes. Ten, roared Adam, growing desperate. Eleven, said Grimes, beginning to mop at his neck again. Adam hesitated. Eleven pounds seemed so very much for those chairs that he had seen Prudence and the rosy-cheeked maids dust regularly every morning, and then it was not his money after all. Therefore Adam hesitated and glanced wistfully towards a certain distant corner. At eleven, at eleven pounds, this fine suite of hand-carved antique chairs, eleven pounds, at eleven, at eleven, going, going, fifteen, said a voice from the distant corner, whereupon Adam drew a great sigh of relief, while the corn chandler contorted himself in his efforts to glare at Belly around the sideboard. Fifteen pounds, chanted the auctioneer. I have fifteen, I'm given fifteen, any advance? These eight antique chairs going at fifteen, going for the last time, going, gone. Sold to the gentleman of the corner behind the sideboard, Theodore. They were certainly fine chairs, Mr. Grimes, said Parsons, shaking his head. So, so, said the corn chandler, sitting down heavily. So, so, Parsons. And he turned to glare at Bellew, who, lying back in an easy chair with his legs upon another, puffed at his pipe and regarded all things with a placid interest. It is not intended to record in these pages all the bids that were made as the afternoon advanced, for that would be fatiguing to write and a weariness to read. Suffice it to say that lots were put up and regularly knocked down, but always to Bellew or Adam, which last, encouraged by Bellew's bold advances, gaily roared down and constantly outbid all competitors with such unhesitating pertinacity that murmurs rose and swelled into open complaint, in the midst of which the fiery-visaged corn-chandler, purple now between heat and vexation, loudly demanded that he lay down some substantial deposit upon what he had already purchased, failing which he should there and then be took and shook and thrown out into the yard. Neck and crop, added Mr. Parsons. That seems to be a fair proposition, smiled the auctioneer, who had already experienced some doubts as to Adam's financial capabilities, yet with his joviality all unraffled. That seems to be a very fair proposal indeed, if the gentleman will put down some substantial deposit now. Aye, for sure, nodded Adam, stepping forward, and unbuttoning a capacious pocket, he drew out a handful of banknotes. Shall I give you a hundred pound, or will fifty be enough? Why? said the auctioneer, rubbing his hands as he eyed the fistful of banknotes. Ten pound will be all that is necessary, sir, <laughs> just to ensure good faith, you understand? Hereupon, Bellew, beckoning to Adam, handed him a like amount which was duly deposited with the auctioneer. So, once more, the bidding began. Once more, lots were put up and knocked down, now to Adam and now to Bellew. The bed with the carved headboard had fallen to Adam after a lively contest between him and Parsons and the corn chandler, which had left the latter in a state of perspiring profanity, from which he was by no means recovered when the auctioneer once more rapped for silence. And now, gentlemen, last but by no means least, we come to the gem of the sale, a sideboard gentleman, a magnificent mahogany sideboard, being a superb example of the carver's art. Here is a sideboard gentleman which if it can be equalled, cannot be excelled, 
No, gentlemen, not if you were to search all the baronial halls and lordly mansions and this land of mansions and baronials. It is a truly magnificent piece in perfect condition, and to be sold at your own price. I say no more. Gentlemen, how much for this magnificent mahogany piece? Ten pound. Eleven. Fifteen. Seventeen, said Adam, who was rapidly drawing near the end of his resources. Eighteen, this from Job Jagway. Go easy there, Job, hissed Adam, edging a little nearer to him. Go easy now. Nineteen. Come, come, gentlemen, remonstrated the auctioneer. This isn't a coal scuttle, nor a broom, nor yet a pair of tongs. This is a magnificent mahogany sideboard, and you offer me nineteen pound? Twenty, said Job. Twenty-one, roared Adam, making his last bid. And then, turning, he hissed in Job's unwilling ear, Go any higher, and I'll pound ye to a jelly job. Twenty-five, said Parsons. Twenty-seven. Twenty-eight. Thirty, nodded Grimes, scowling at Adam. Thirty-two, cried Parsons. Thirty-six. Thirty-seven. Forty, nodded Grimes. That drops me, said Parsons, sighing and shaking his head. Ah, chuckled the corn chandler. Well, I've eighty years for that sideboard, Parsons, and I ain't going to let you take it away from me, nor nobody else, sir. At forty, cried the auctioneer, at forty, this magnificent one, nodded Bellew, beginning to fill his pipe. Forty-one's the bid. I have forty-one from the gent of the corner. Forty-five, growled the corn chandler. Six, said Bellew. Fifty, snarled Grimes. One, said Bellew. Gent of the corner gives me fifty-one, chanted the auctioneer. Any advance at fifty-one? Fifty-five, said Grimes, beginning to mop at his neck harder than ever. At ten, nodded Bellew. What's that? cried Grimes, wheeling about. Gent of the corner offers me sixty-five. At sixty-five, this magnificent piece at sixty-five. What, are you all done, at sixty-five, and cheap at the price? Come, gentlemen, take your time, give it another look over, and bid accordingly. The crowd had dwindled rapidly during the last hour, which was scarcely to be wondered at seeing that they were constantly outbid, either by a hoarse-voiced, square-shouldered fellow in a neckcloth, or a dreamy individual who lolled in a corner and puffed at a pipe. But now— as Grimes, his red cheeks puffed out, his little eyes snapping in a way that many knew meant danger, with a large D, as the rich corn chandler, whose word was law to a good many, turned and confronted this lounging, long-legged individual, such as remained, closed round them in a ring, in keen expectation of what was to follow. Observing which, the corn chandler, feeling it incumbent upon him now or never to vindicate himself as a man of property and substance, and not to be put down, thrust his hands deep into his pockets, spread his legs wide apart, and stared at Bellew in a way that most people have found highly disconcerting before now. Bellew, however, seemed wholly unaffected, and went on imperturbably filling his pipe. "'At sixty-five!' cried the auctioneer, leaning towards Grimes with his hammer poised. "'At sixty-five! Will you make it another pound, sir? Come, what do you say?' "'I say no, sir.' returned the corn chandler slowly and impressively. I say no, sir. I say make it another twenty pounds, sir. Hereupon heads were shaken or nodded, and there rose a sudden shuffle of feet as the crowd closed in nearer. I get eighty-five. Any advance on eighty-five? Eighty-six, said Bellew, settling the tobacco in his pipe bowl with his thumb. Once again the auctioneer leaned over and appealed to the corn chandler, who stood in the same attitude, jingling the money in his pocket. "'Come, sir, don't let a pound or so stand between you and a sideboard that can't be matched in the length and breadth of the United Kingdom. Come, what do you say to another ten shillings?' "'I say, sir,' said Grimes, with his gaze still riveted upon Bellow. "'I say, no, sir. I say, make it another twenty pounds, sir.' Again there rose the shuffle of feet, Again heads were nodded, and elbows nudged neighbouring ribs, and all eyes were focused upon Bellew, who was in the act of lighting his pipe. "'One hundred and six pounds!' cried the auctioneer. "'At one-six! At one-six! Bellew struck a match, but the wind from the open casement behind him extinguished it. "'I have one hundred and six pounds. Is there any advance? Yes or no? Going at one hundred and six. Adam, who up till now had enjoyed the struggle to the utmost, experienced a sudden qualm of fear. 
Then he struck another match. At one hundred and six pounds, at one six, going at one hundred and six pounds. Cold moisture started out on Adam's brow. He clenched his hands and muttered between his teeth. Supposing the money were all gone, like his own share, supposing they had to lose this famous old sideboard, and to Grimes of all people. This and much more was in Adam's mind, while the auctioneer held his hammer poised, and Betty went on, lighting his pipe. "'Going at one hundred and six. Going, going.' Fifty up,' said Bellew. His pipe was well alight at last, and he was nodding to the auctioneer through a fragrant cloud. "'What?' cried Grimes. "'How much?' "'The gent in the corner gives me one hundred and fifty-six pounds,' said the auctioneer, with a jovial eye upon the corn chandler's lowering visage. "'One five six. All done. Any advance? Going at one five six. Going, going. Gone!' The hammer fell, and with its tap a sudden silence came upon the old hall. Then all at once the corn chandler turned, caught up his hat, clapped it on, shook a fat fist at Bellew, and, crossing to the door, lumbered away, muttering maledictions as he went. By twos and threes the others followed him, until there remained only Adam, Bellew, the auctioneer, and the red-nosed Theodore. And yet there was one other, for chancing to raise his eyes to the minstrel's gallery, then he espied Miss Priscilla, who, meeting his smiling glance, leaned down suddenly over the carved rail, and very deliberately threw him a kiss and then hurried away with a quick, light tap-tap of her stick. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 13 How Anthea Came Home Lord, said Adam, pausing with a chair under either arm. Lord, Mr. Bellew, sir. I wonder what Miss Anthea will say. With which remark he strode off with the two chairs to set them in their accustomed places. Seldom indeed had the old hall, despite its many years, seen such a running to and fro, heard such a patter of flying feet, such merry voices, such gay and heartfelt laughter. For here was Miss Priscilla, looking smaller than ever, in a great armchair whence she directed the disposal and arrangement of all things, with quick little motions of her crutch stick. And here were the two rosy-cheeked maids, brighter and rosier than ever. And here was comely Prudence, hither come from her kitchen, to bear a hand. And here, as has been said, was Adam, and here also was Bellew, his pipe laid aside with his coat, pushing and tugging in his efforts to get the great sideboard back into its customary position. And all, as has also been said, was laughter and bustle, and an eager haste to have all things as they were, and should be henceforth, before Anthea's return. "'Lord!' exclaimed Adam again, balancing now upon a ladder, and pausing to wipe his brow with one hand, and with a pitcher swinging in the other. "'Lord, whatever will Miss Anthea say, Mr. Bellew, sir?' "'Ah!' nodded Betty thoughtfully. "'I wonder.' "'What do you suppose she'll say, Miss Prisoner, ma'am?' "'I think you'd better be careful of that pitcher, Adam.' "'Which means,' said Bellew, smiling down into Miss Priscilla's young, bright eyes, "'that you don't know.' "'Well, Mr. Bellew, she'll be very, very glad, of course. "'Happier, I think, than you or I can guess, "'because I know she loves every stick and stay for that old furniture. "'But—' "'But?' nodded Bellew. "'Yes, I understand. "'Mr. Bellew, if Anthea—God bless her dear heart— "'but if she has a fault, it is pride, Mr. Bellew. "'Pride, pride, pride with a capital P. "'Yes, she is very proud. "'She'll be that happy hearted said Adam— pausing nearby with a great armful of miscellaneous articles, and that full of joy as never was, Mr. Bellew, sir. Having delivered himself of which, he departed with his load. "'I rose this morning very early, Mr. Bellew, oh, very early,' said Miss Priscilla, watching Adam's laden figure with watchful eyes. "'Couldn't possibly sleep, you see, so I got up ridiculously early. But bless you, she was up before me.' "'Ah! Oh, dear, yes, I've been up hours.' And what, what do you suppose she was doing? Bernie shook his head. She was rubbing and polishing that old sideboard that you paid such a dreadful price for, down on her knees before it. Yes, she was, and polishing and rubbing and crying all the while. Oh, dear heart, such great big tears, and so very quiet. 
When she heard my little stick come tapping along, she tried to hide them. I mean her tears, of course, Mr. Bellew. But when I drew her dear, beautiful head down into my arms, she tried to smile. I'm so very silly, Aunt Priscilla, she said, crying more than ever. It's so hard to let the old things be taken away. You see, I do love them so. I tell you all this, Mr. Bellew, because I like you. Ever since you think you took the trouble to pick up a ball of worsted for a poor old lame woman in an orchard? First impressions, you know. And secondly, I tell you all this to explain to you why I... <clears throat> Through a kiss from a minstrel's gallery to a most unworthy individual, Aunt Priscilla? Through you a kiss, Mr. Bellew. I had to. The sideboard, you know. On her knees, you understand? I understand. You see, Mr. Bellew, sir, said Adam at this juncture, speaking from beneath an inlaid table which he held balanced upon his head. It ain't as if this was just ordinary furniture, sir. You see, she kind of feels as if it'll all be part of Dapplemere Manor, as it used to be called. It's all been here so long that them chairs and tables has come to be part of the house, sir. So when she comes and finds as it ain't all been took, or as you might say, vanished away, why, the question as I ask you, sir, is, what will she say? Oh, Lord! And here Adam gave vent to his great laugh, which necessitated an almost superhuman exertion of strength to keep the table from slipping from its precarious perch. Whereupon Miss Priscilla screamed, a very small scream, like herself, and Prudence scolded, and the two rosy-cheeked maids tittered, and Adam went chuckling upon his way. And when the hall was once more its old, familiar, comfortable self, when the floor had been swept of its litter and every trace of the sail removed, then Miss Priscilla sighed, and Bellew put on his coat. "'When do you expect uh, she will come home?' he inquired, glancing at the grandfather clock in the corner. "'Well, if she drove straight back from Cranbrook, she would be here now. But I fancy she won't be so very anxious to get home today, and may come the longest way round. Yes, it's in my mind she will keep away from Dapplemere as long as ever she can.' "'And I think,' said Betty, "'yes, I think I'll take a walk. I'll go and call upon the sergeant.' "'The sergeant?' said Miss Priscilla. "'Let me see now. It is now uh, a quarter to six. It should take you about fifteen minutes to the village. That will make it exactly six o'clock.' You'll find the sergeant just sitting down in the chair on the left-hand side of the fireplace in the corner, at the king's head, you know. Not that I've ever seen him there, good gracious not, but I um, happen to be acquainted with his habits, and he is as regular and precise as his great big silver watch, and that is the most precise and regular thing in all the world. I'm glad you are going, she went on, because today is, well, a, a day apart, Mr. Bellew. You'll find the sergeant at the king's head until half-past seven. "'Then I will go to the King's Head,' said Bellew. "'And uh, what message do you send him?' "'None,' <laughs> said Miss Priscilla, laughing and shaking her head. "'At least you can tell him, if you wish, that um, the peaches are riper than ever they were this evening.' "'I won't forget,' said Bellew, smiling, and went out into the sunshine. But crossing the yard he was met by Adam, who, chuckling still, paused to touch his hat. "'Look at that there all, sir. You would have never known as there'd ever been any sail at all. Not now. Now, the only question is where it's me, and as I'm an asking of myself constant is, what will Miss Anthea have to say about it?' "'Yes,' said Bellew. "'I wonder.' And so he turned and went away slowly across the fields. Miss Priscilla had been right. Anthea was coming back the longest way round. Also, she was anxious to keep away from Dapplemere as long as possible.' Therefore, despite Smallporge's exhortations and Bessie's champing impatience, she held the mare in, permitting her only the slowest of paces, which was a most unusual thing for Anthea to do. For the most part, too, she drove in silence, seemingly deaf to Smallporge's flow of talk, which was also very unlike her in her. But before her eyes were visions of her dismantled home, in her ears was the roar of voices clamouring for her cherished possessions, a sickening roar broken now and then by the hollow tap of the auctioneer's cruel hammer. And each time the clamouring voices rose, she shivered, and every blow of the cruel hammer seemed to fall upon her quivering heart. Thus she was unwontedly deaf and unresponsive to small porges, who presently fell into a profound gloom in consequence, and thus she held in the eager mare, who therefore shied and fidgeted and tossed her head indignantly. But slowly as they went, they came within sight of the house at last, with its quaint gables and many lattice windows, 
and the blue smoke curling up from his twisted chimneys. Smiling and placid, as though in all this great world there were no such thing to be found as an auctioneer's hammer. And presently they swung into the drive and drew up in the courtyard. And there was Adam waiting to take the mayor's head. Adam, as good-natured and stodded as though there were no abominations called, for want of a worse name, sales. Very slowly for her, Anthea climbed down from the high dog-cart, aiding small porches to earth, and with his hand clasped tight in hers and with lips set firm, she turned and entered the hall. But upon the threshold she stopped, and stood there utterly still, gazing and gazing upon the trim orderliness of everything. Then, seeing every well-remembered thing in its appointed place, all became suddenly blurred and dim, and snatching her hand from small porges clasp, she uttered a great choking sob and covered her face. But small porges had seen, and stood aghast, and Miss Priscilla had seen, and now hurried forward with a quick tap-tap of her stick. As she came, Anthea raised her head and looked for one who should have been there, but was not. And in that moment, instinctively, she knew how things came to be as they were, and because of this knowledge her cheeks flamed with a swift burning colour, and with a soft cry she hid her face in Miss Priscilla's gentle bosom. Then, while her face was yet hidden there, she whispered, "'Tell me, tell me all about it.' But meanwhile Bellew, striding far away across the meadows, seeming to watch the glory of the sunset and to hearken to a blackbird piping from the dim seclusion of a copse a melodious good-bye to the dying day, yet saw and heard it not at all, for his mind was still occupied with Adam's question. What would Miss Anthea say? End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 14, which, among other things, has to do with shrimps, muffins, and tin whistles. A typical Kentish village is Dapplemere, with its rows of scattered cottages bowered in roses and honeysuckle, white-walled cottages with steep-pitched roofs and small latticed windows that seem to stare at all and sundry like so many winking eyes. There is an air redolent of ripening fruit and hops, for Dapamere is a place of orchards and hop gardens and rickyards, while here and there the sharp pointed red tiled roof of some oast house pierces the green. Though Dapamere village is but a very small place indeed nowadays, yet it possesses a church, grey and ancient, whose massive Norman towers look down upon gable and chimney, upon roof and thatch and roof of tile, like some benignant giant keeping watch above them all. Nearby, of course, is the inn, a great, rambling, comfortable place, with time-worn settles beside the door, and with a mighty sign a-swinging before it, upon which, plainly to be seen, when the sun catches it fairly, is that which purports to be a likeness of His Majesty King William the Fourth, of glorious memory. But alas, the colours have long since faded, so that now, upon a dull day, it is a moot question whether His Majesty's nose was of the Greek or Roman order, or indeed whether he was blessed with any nose at all. Thus time and circumstances have united to make a ghost of the likeness, as they have done of the original long since, which, fading yet more and more, will doubtless eventually vanish altogether, like King William himself, and leave but a vague memory behind. Now, before the inn, was a small crowd gathered about a trap in which sat two men, one of whom Betty recognised as the red-necked corn-chandler Grimes, and the other the rat-eyed Parsons. The corn-chandler was mopping violently at his face and neck, down which ran, and to which clung, a foamy substance suspiciously like the froth of beer, and as he mopped his loud, brassy voice shook and quivered with passion. "'I tell ye, ye shall get out of my cottage,' he was saying. "'I say you shall quit my cottage to the end of the month. When I says a thing, I mean it.' I say you should get off of my property, you and that, that beggarly cobbler. I say you should be thrown out of my cottage, lock, stock and barrel. I say, I wouldn't, Mr. Grimes, least days, not if I was you. Another voice broke in, calm and deliberate. No, I wouldn't go for to say another word, sir, because if you do say another word, I know a man as will drag you down out of that cart, sir. 
I know a man as will break your whip over your very own back, sir. I know a man as will then take and heave you into the horse pond, sir. And that man is me, Sergeant Appleby, late of the 19th Hussars, sir. Cornchartler, having removed most of the froth from his head and face, stared down at the straight, alert figure of the big sergeant, hesitated, glanced at the sergeant's fist, which, though solitary, was large and powerful, scowled at the sergeant from his polished boots to the crown of his well-brushed hat, which perched upon his close-cropped grey hair at a ridiculous angle totally impossible to any but an ex-cavalry man, muttered a furious oath, and, snatching his whip, cut viciously at his horse, very much as if that horse had been the sergeant himself. And as the trap lurched forward, he shook his fist and nodded his head. "'Out she go at the end of the month! Mind that!' he snarled, and so rattled away down the road, still mopping at his head and neck, until he had fairly mopped himself out of sight. "'Well, Sergeant,' said Bellew, extending his hand, "'how are you?' "'Hearty, sir. Hearty, I thank you, though, at this precise moment. Just a little put out, sir. Nonetheless, I know a man as is happy to see you, Mr. Bellew, sir, and that's me, Sergeant Appleby, at your service, sir. My cottage lies down the road yonder, an easy march, if you will step that far. Speaking for my comrade and myself, we should be proud for you to take tea with us. Muffins, sir, shrimps, Mr. Bellew, also a pikelet or two. Not a great feast, but tolerable good ration, sir, and plenty of them. What do you say? I say done, and thank you very much. So without further parley, the sergeant saluted divers of the little crowd, and, wheeling sharply, strode along beside Bellew, rather more stiff in the back and fixed of eye than was his wont, and jingling his imaginary spurs rather more loudly than usual. "'You will be wondering at the tantrums of the man Grimes, sir, of his ordering me and my comrade Peter Day out of his cottage. Sir, I'll tell you in two words. It's all owing to the sale up at the farm, sir. You see, Grimes is the great hand of buying things uncommonly cheap and selling them uncommonly dear. Today, it seems, he was disappointed.' "'Ah,' uh -huh, said Bellew. "'At exactly twenty-three minutes to six, sir,' said the sergeant, consulting his large silver watch. "'I was sitting in my usual corner, beside the chimney, sir, when in comes Grimes, like a thundercloud. Calls for a pint of ale, in a tankard. Tom draws pint, which Tom is the landlord, sir. "'Buy anything of the sale, Mr. Grimes,' says Tom. "'Sale,' says Grimes. "'Sale, indeed,' and falls a cursing. "'Fuck up at the farm. Shocking. Outrageous.' ends by threatening to foreclose mortgage within the month, upon which I raise a protest, upon which he grows abusive, upon which I was forced to pour his ale over him, after which I ran him out into the road, and there it is, you see. And he threatened to foreclose the mortgage on Dapplemere Farm, did he, Sergeant? Within the month, sir, upon which I warned him, in parlour no place, ladies' private money troubles, gaping crowd, damn it. "'And so he is turning you out of his cottage?' "'Within the week, sir. "'But then, here down the deck, it is rather unpleasant.' "'And here the sergeant uttered a short laugh, "'and was immediately grave again. "'It isn't,' he went on, "'it isn't as I mind the inconvenience of moving, sir. "'No, I should be mighty sorry to leave the old place. "'So it isn't that so much as the small corner cupboard "'and my bookshelf by the chimney. "'There never was a, such a cupboard. "'No, sir, there never was a cupboard so well calculated "'to hold a pair of jackboots.' not to mention spurs, high nose, burnishers, shoulder chains, polishing brushes, and a boot jack, as that same small corner cupboard. As for the bookshelf beside the chimney, sir, exactly three foot three, sunk in a recess, height, third button in my coat, capacity fourteen books. You couldn't get another book on that shelf. No, not if you tried with a sledgehammer or a hydraulic engine, which is highly surprising when you consider that fourteen books is the true and exact number of books as I possess. "'Very remarkable,' said Bellew. "'Then again, there's my comrade, Peter Day.' The sergeant pronounced it as though it were all one word. "'Sir, my comrade Peter Day is a very remarkable man. Most cobblers are. When he's not cobbling, he's reading. When not reading, he's cobbling, or mending clocks and watches. And betwixt this and that, my comrade has picked up a power of information. Though he lost his leg as a doing of it, in a gale of wind, off the Cape of Good Hope. For my comrade was a sailor, sir.' "'Consequently, he is a handyman. "'Most sailors are, and makes his own wooden legs, sir. "'He's also a musician. "'A tin whistle, sir. "'Oh, here we are.' "'Saying which, the sergeant halted, wheeled, "'opened a very small gate, "'and ushered Bellew into a very small garden, "'bright with flowers, 
beyond which was a very small cottage indeed, through the open door of which there issued a most appetising odour, accompanied by a whistle, wonderfully clear and sweet, that was rendering Tom Bowling, with many shakes, trills and astonishing runs. Peter Day was busy at the fire, with a long toasting fork in his hand, but on their entrance, breaking off his whistling in the very middle of a note, he sprang nimbly to his feet, or rather his foot, and stood revealed as a short yet strongly built man, with a face that in one way resembled an island in that it was completely surrounded by hair and whisker. But it was in all respects a vastly pleasant island to behold, despite the somewhat craggy prominences of chin and nose and brow. In other words, it was a pleasing face, notwithstanding the fierce, thick eyebrows, which were more than offset by the merry blue eyes and the broad, humorous mouth below. "'Peter Day,' said the sergeant. "'Mr. Bellew.' "'Glad to see you, sir,' said the mariner, saluting the visitor with a quick bob of the head and a backward scrape of the wooden leg. "'You couldn't make port at a better time, sir. And because why? Because the kettle's abiding, sir, muffins is piping hot, and the shrimps is a-laying over too, waiting to be took aboard, sir.' Saying which, Peter Day bobbed his head again, shook his wooden leg again, and turned away to reach another cup and saucer. It was a large room for so small a cottage, and comfortably furnished with a floor of red tile, with the grate at one end well raised up from the hearth. Upon the hob a kettle sang murmurously, and on a trivet stood a plate whereon rose a tower of toasted muffins. A round table occupied the middle of the floor, and was spread with a snowy cloth, whereon cups and saucers were arranged, while in the midst stood a great bowl of shrimps. Now above the mantelpiece, that is to say to the left of it, and fastened to the wall, was a length of rope cunningly tied into what is called a running bowline. Above this, on a shelf specially contrived to hold it, was the model of a full rigged ship that was, to all appearances, making excellent way of it, with every stitch of canvas set and drawing, a low and a loft. Above this again was a sextant and a telescope. Opposite all these, upon the other side of the mantel, were a pair of stirrups, three pairs of spurs, two cavalry sabres, and a carbine, while between these objects, in the very middle of the chimney, uniting, as it were, the army and the navy, was a portrait of Queen Victoria. Then you also noticed that each side of the room partook of the same characteristics, one being devoted to things nautical, the other to objects military. All this Bellew noticed while the soldier was brewing the tea and the sailor was bestowing the last finishing touches to the muffins. "'It ain't often as we've honoured with company, sir,' said Peter Day, as they sat down. "'Is it, Dick?' "'No,' answered the sergeant, handing Bellew the shrimps. "'We ain't had company to tea,' said Peter Day, passing Bellew the muffins. "'No, we ain't had company to tea since the last time Miss Anthea and Miss Priscilla honoured us, have we, Dick?' "'Honoured us,' said the sergeant, nodding his head approvingly. "'Is the one and only word for it, Peter Day?' The last time was this day twelve months, sir. "'Because why? Because this day twelve months happened to be Miss Priscilla's birthday. "'Consequently, today is her birthday likewise. "'Wherefore the muffins, and wherefore the shrimps, sir? "'For they was this date of once more graced our board, Mr. Bellew.' "'Graced our board,' said the sergeant, nodding his head again. "'Graced our board is the only expression for it, Peter Day.' But they disappointed us, Mr. Bellew, sir, on account of the sale. Yes, mate, said Peter Bay, with a note of concern in his voice. How's the wind? Tolerable, comrade, tolerable. Then uh, why forget the tea? Tea, said the sergeant, with a guilty start. Why, sir, am I. Mr. Bellew, sir, your pardon. And forthwith he began to pour out the tea very solemnly, but with less precision of movement than usual, and with abstracted gaze. "'The sergeant tells me you are a musician,' said Bellew, as Peter Day handed him another muffin. "'A musician? Me? Think as that now. To, to be sure, I do toot on the tin bushel now and then, sir. Such things as the British Grenadiers, and the girl I left behind me for my shipmate, and the Bay of Biscay, and a life on the ocean wave for myself. But a musician? Lord! Is he, sir?' said Peter Day, taking advantage of the sergeant's abstraction, and whispering confidentially behind his muffin. That messmate of mine has such a high opinion of my guess that it is fair overpowering, and a tin whistle is only a tin whistle after all. And it is about the only instrument I could ever get the hang of, said Bellew. Why, do you mean as you play, sir? Hardly that, but I make a good bluff of it. 
Why, then, I've got a couple of very good whistles, sir. If you say mighty be my trial duet, sir, after tea. With pleasure, nodded Bellew. But hereupon, Peter Day, noticing that the sergeant ate nothing, leaned over and touched him upon the shoulder. How's the wind now, shipmate? he inquired. Right so, so, Peter Day. There is, there is, said the sergeant, stirring his tea round and round, and with his gaze fixed upon the opposite wall. Then, meshmate, why, not a muffin or even an occasional shrimp. Where be your appetite? Peter Day, said the sergeant, beginning to stir his tea faster than ever, and with his eyes still fixed, consequent upon disparaging remarks having been passed by one Grimes, our landlord, concerning them as should not be mentioned in an inn parlour, or anywhere else, by such as said Grimes, I was compelled to pour a tankard of beer over said Grimes, our landlord, this afternoon, Peter Day, at exactly twelve and a half minutes past six by my watch, which done, I ran our landlord out into the road, Peter Day, say, half a minute later, which would make it precisely thirty minutes after the hour. Consequent upon which, comrade, we have received our marching orders. What, well, mate, is it to heave our anchor, you mean? I mean, comrade, that on Saturday next being the 25th instant, we march out, bag and baggage, horse, foot and artillery. We evacuate our position in face of superior force. For good and all, comrade. Is that so, shipmate? It's rough on you, Peter Day. It's hard on you, I'll admit. But things were said, comrade, relative to business troubles of one as we both respect, Peter Day. Things were said as called for. Beer down the neck and running out into the road, comrade. It's rough on you, Peter Day, seeing as you, like the hussars at Aswan, was never engaged, so to speak. Why, I shipmate, that does catch me. All aback, shipmate. Why, Lord, I'd give a pound, two pound, aye, ten, just to be in a stern of him with a rope's end. I can't have it. I'd have preferred a capstan bar. Peter Day, said the sergeant, removing his gaze from the wall with a jerk, on the twenty-fifth instant we shall be without a roof to cover us, and all my doing, Peter Day. What have you to say about it? Say, Miss Bate, why, that you, me, honouring and respecting two ladies as deserves to be honoured and respected, I ain't going to let such a small thing as this here cottage come betwixt us, and our honouring and respecting of them two ladies. If therefore we are due to quit this anchorage, why, then it's all hands to the windlass, with a heave your hole and merrily, say I. Miss Bates, my fist. Hereupon, with a very jerky movement indeed, the sergeant reached out his remaining arm, and the soldier and the sailor shook hands very solemnly over the muffins, already vastly diminished in number, with a grip that spoke much. Peter Day, you've lifted a load off my heart. I thank you, comrade, and spoke like a true soldier. Peter Day, the muffins. So now the sergeant, himself once more, fell to in turn, and they ate and drank and laughed and talked, until the shrimps were all gone and the muffins were things of the past. And now, declining all Bellew's offer of assistance, the soldier and the sailor began washing and drying and putting away their crockery, each in his characteristic manner, the sergeant very careful and exact, while the sailor juggled cups and saucers with a sure-handed deafness that seems peculiar to nautical fingers. "'Yes, Peter Day,' said the sergeant, hanging each cup upon its appointed nail, and setting each saucer solicitously in the space reserved for it on the small dresser. "'Since you've took our marching orders as you have took them, I'm quite reconciled to parting with these here snug quarters, barring only a bookshelf and a cupboard.' "'A cupboard?' returned Peter Day, with a snort of disdain. "'Well, there never was such an ill-contrived, lubberly cupboard as that in all the world. "'You can't get it unless you lay over to port, on account of the clothes-press, "'and then hard a starboard on account of the dresser, "'and then it be in the darkest corner.' "'True, Peter Day, but that I'm used to it, and use it everything, as you know. "'I can lay my hand upon anything in a minute. Watch me.' "'Saying which, the sergeant squeezed himself between the press and the dresser, "'opened the cupboard, and took thence several articles which he named, each in order. A pair of jack-boots, two brushes, backing, and a burnisher. Having set these down, one by one, upon the dresser, he wheeled, and addressed himself to Bellew, as follows. Mr. Bellew, sir, this evening being the anniversary of a certain event, sir, I will ask you to excuse me while I make the necessary preparations to honour this anniversary, as is ever my custom. As he ended, he dropped the two brushes, the blacking, and the burnisher inside the legs of the boots, picked them up with a sweep of the arm, 
and turning short ground, strode out into the little garden. "'Fine fellow's dick, sir,' nodded Peter Day, beginning to fill a long clay pipe. "'Lord, what a sailor he'd have made, to be sure. If any which he's as fine a soldier as ever was, or will be, enough war medals to fill my Sunday hat, sir. When he lost his arm, they gave me the V.C. and his discharge, sir, because why? Because a soldier with one arm ain't any more good than a sailor with one leg, do you see? So they tried to discharge Dick, but, Lord love you, they couldn't, sir. Because why? Because Dick were a soldier bred and born, and as much a soldier today as ever he was. Ah, and never always will be, till he goes marching aloft, like poor Tom Bowling. Until one, as his general of all the armies, and admiral of all the fleets that ever sailed, shall call the last muster bolt, sir. At this present moment, sir, continued the sailor, lighting his pipe with a live coal from the fire, my messmate is uh, sitting to the leeward of the plump tree outside, a polishing of his jackboots, as don't need polishing, and a burnishing of his spurs, as don't need burnishing. Because why? Because he goes on guard tonight, according to custom. On guard? repeated Bedia. I'm afraid I don't understand. <laughs> of course you don't, sir, chuckled Peter Day. Well, then, tonight he marches away in full regimental, sir, to mount guard. And where do you suppose? Why, well, I'll tell you. Under Miss Priscilla's window. He gets there as the clock is striking eleven, and there he stays and marching to and fro until twelve o'clock, which does him a world of good, sir, and no ways displeases Miss Priscilla. Because why? Because you don't know nothing whatever about it. Hereupon Peter Day rose, and crossing to a battered seaman's chest in the corner, came back with three or four tin whistles, which he handed to Bellew, who laid aside his pipe, and having selected one, ran tentatively up and down the scale, while Peter Day listened attentive of ear and beaming of face. "'Sir,' said he, "'what do you say to Annie Laurie as a start? Shall we give him Annie Laurie?' "'Very good. Ready? Go.' Thus George Bellew, American citizen and millionaire, piped away on a tin whistle with all the gusto in the world, introducing little trills and flourishes here and there that fairly won the one-legged sailor's heart. They had already given them three or four selections, each of which had been vociferously encored by Peter Day or Bellew, and had just finished an impassioned rendering of the Suwannee River, when the sergeant appeared with his boots beneath his arm. Shipmate, cried Peter Day, flourishing his whistle, did you ever hear a tin whistle better played or mellerer in tone? Meller is the only word for it, comrade, and your playing, sirs, is artistic, though no doleful. Perhaps you wouldn't mind giving us something brighter, a rattling quick step. Perhaps you won't remember one as begins, some talk of Alexander and some of Hercules, if it wouldn't be troubling you too much. Forthwith they burst forth into the British grenadiers, and never did Tim Whistles render the famous old tune with more fire and dash. As the stirring notes rang out, the sergeant, standing upon the hearth, seemed to grow taller, his broad chest expanded, his eyes glowed, a flush crept up into his cheek, and the whole man thrilled to the music, as he had done many a time and oft in years gone by. As the last notes died away, he glanced down at the empty sleeve pinned across his breast, shook his head, and thanking them in a very gruff voice indeed, turned on his heel and busied himself at his little cupboard. Peter Day and I rose and set a jug together with three glasses upon the table, also spoons and a lemon, keeping his weather-eye, meanwhile, upon the kettle, which last, condescending to boil obligingly, he rapped three times with his wooden leg. "'Right old shipmate!' he cried, very much as though he had been hailing the main-top, whereupon the sergeant emerged from between the clothes-press and the dresser with a black bottle in his hand, which he passed over to Peter Day, who set about brewing what he called a Jorama Grog, the savour of which filled the place with a right pleasant fragrance. And when the glasses brimmed, each with a slice of lemon atop, the sergeant solemnly rose. "'Mr. Bellew and comrade,' said he, lifting his glass, "'I give you Miss Priscilla.' "'God bless her,' said Peter Day. "'Amen,' added Bellew. So the toast was drunk. The glasses were empty, refilled, and emptied again, this time more slowly, and the clock striking nine, Bellew rose to take his leave. Seeing which, the sergeant fetched his hat and stick, and volunteered to accompany him a little way. So when Bellew had shaken the sailors on his hand, they set out together. Sergeant, said Bellew, after they had walked some distance, I have a message for you. 
For me, sir? From Miss Priscilla? Uh, from uh, indeed, sir. She bid me tell you that uh, the peaches are riper tonight than ever they were. The sergeant seemed to find in this a subject for profound thought, and he strode on beside Bellew very silently, with his eyes straight before him. That the peaches were riper tonight than ever they were? said he at last. Yes, sergeant. Riper, said the sergeant, as though turning this over in his mind. Riper than ever they were, nodded Bellew. The uh, peaches, I think, sir. The peaches, yes. Then he heard the sergeant's finger rasping to and fro across his shaven chin. Mr. Bellew, sir, she is a, a very remarkable woman, sir. Yes, sergeant. A wonderful woman. Yes, sergeant. The kind of woman that improves with age, sir. Yes, sergeant. Talking of peaches, sir, I've often thought she is very like a peach herself, sir. Very, sergeant, but... Well, sir, peaches do not improve with age, sergeant, and the peaches are riper than ever they were tonight. The sergeant stopped short and stared at Betty wide-eyed. "'Why, sir,' said he very slowly, "'you don't mean to say you think as she meant that—' "'But I do,' nodded Bellew. And now, just as suddenly as he had stopped, the sergeant turned and went on again. "'Lord,' he whispered, "'Lord, Lord!' The moon was rising, and looking at the sergeant, Bellew saw that there was a wonderful light in his face, yet a light that was not of the moon. "'Sergeant,' said Bellew, laying a hand upon his shoulder, why didn't you speak to her? Speak to her? What, me? No, no, Mr. Bellew, said the sergeant hastily. No, no, can't be done, sir. Not to be mentioned or thought of, sir. The light was all gone out of his face now, and he walked with his chin on his breast. The surprising thing to me, sergeant, is that you have never thought of putting your fortune to the test and speaking your mind to her before now. Thought of it, sir, repeated the sergeant bitterly. Thought of it. Lord, sir, I've thought of it these five years and more. I've thought of it day and night. I've thought of it so very much that I know I never can speak my mind to her. Look at me, he cried suddenly, wheeling and confronting Bellew, but not at all like his bold, erect, soldierly self. Yes, look at me, a poor battered old soldier with his best arm gone, left behind him in India and with nothing in the world but his old uniform, getting very afraid and worn, like himself, sir. Pair of jack boots, likewise very much worn, though wonderfully patched here and there by my good comrade Peter Day. A handful of medals and a very modest pension. Look at me, with the best of my days behind me and with only one arm left. And I'm a deal more awkward and helpless with that one arm than you'd think, sir. Look at me, and the, then tell me how could such a man dare to speak his mind to such a woman? What right has such a man to even think of speaking his mind to such a woman when there's part of that man already in the grave? Why, no right, sir. None in the world. Poverty and one arm of facts has make it impossible for that man to ever speak his mind. And, sir, that man never will, sir. Good night to you, and a pleasant walk. I turn back here. Which the sergeant did, then and there, wheeling sharp right about face. Yet as Betty watched him go, he noticed that the soldier's step was heavy and slow, and it seemed that for once the sergeant had even forgotten to put on his imaginary spurs. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 15 In Which Adam Explains Adam? Yes, Miss Anthea. How much money did Mr. Bellew give you to buy the furniture? Miss Anthea was sitting in her great elbow chair, leaning forward with her chin in her hand, looking at him in the way which always seemed to Adam as though she could see into the very most recesses of his mind. Therefore Adam twisted his hat in his hands and stared at the ceiling and the floor and the table, before Miss Anthea and the wall behind Miss Anthea, anywhere but at Miss Anthea. "'You ask me how much it were, Miss Anthea?' "'Yes, Adam.' "'Well, it were a goodish sum.' "'Was it uh, fifty pounds?' Fifty pound? repeated Adam, in a tone of lofty disdain. "'No, Miss Anthea, it were not fifty pound.' "'Do you mean it was more?' 
Ah, nodded Adam. I mean, as it were a sight more. If he was to take the fifty pound you mentioned, add twenty more, and then another twenty to that, and then come ten more to that, why then you'd be a bit nigher them figures. A hundred pounds, exclaimed Anthea, aghast. Ah, a hundred pound, nodded Adam, rolling the words upon his tongue with great gusto. One hundred pound were the sum, Miss Anthea. Oh, Adam! Lord love you, Miss Anthea, that were nothing. That were only a flea-bite, as you might say. He give more, or nigh double as much as that, for the sideboard. Nonsense, Adam. Be gospel true, Miss Anthea. That there sideboard with a plum of the sail, so to speak, and old Grimes had set his heart on it, do you see? Well, it would bid up to eighty-six pound, and then old Grimes, he goes twenty more, making it a hundred and six. Then, just as I thought it were all over, and just as that there old Grimes were beginning to swell himself up with triumph, and get that red in the face as he were a sight to behold, Mr. Bellew, who'd been lighting his pipe all this time, up and says, Fifty up. He says in his quiet way, making it a hundred and fifty-six pound, Miss Anthea, which were too much for Grimes. Lord, I thought as that that man were going to burst, Miss Anthea. And Adam gave vent to his great laugh at the mere recollection. But Anthea was grave enough, and the troubled look in her eyes quickly sobered him. A hundred and fifty-six pounds, she repeated in an awed voice. But it, it is awful. Mm, steepish, admitted Adam. Pretty steepish for an old sideboard, I'll allow, Miss Anthea. But you see, it were a personal matter between Scrimes and Mr. Bellew. I began to think as they never would have left off bidding. And by George, I don't believe if Mr. Bellew ever would have left off bidding. You see, there's something about Mr. Bellew, whether it be his voice, or his eye, or his chin, I don't know. But there's something about him, as says very distinct, if so be as should happen to set his mind on a thing, why, well, he's a-going to get it and he ain't a-going to give in till he does get it. You see, Miss Anthea, he's so very quiet in his ways, and speaks so soft and gentle. Mm, perhaps that's it. Say, for instance, he would ask you for summat, and you said no. Well, he wouldn't make no fuss about it, not him. He'd just take it, that's what he'd do. As for that there sideboard, he'd have sat there a-bidding and a-bidding all night, I do believe. But, Adam, why did he do it? Why did he buy all the furniture? Well, to keep it from being took away, perhaps. Oh, Adam, what am I to do? Do, Miss Anthea? The mortgage must be paid off dreadfully soon. You know that. And I, I can't I, I can't give the money back. Why, give it back? No, of course not, Miss Anthea. But I, I can't keep it. Can't keep it, Miss Anthea, ma'am? And why not? Because I'm very sure he doesn't want all those things. The idea is quite absurd, and yet... Even if the hops do well, the money they bring will hardly be enough by itself, and so I was, I was setting my furniture to make it up, and now oh, what am I to do? And she leaned her head wearily upon her hand. Now, seeing her distress, Adam, all sturdy loyalty that he was, must needs sigh in sympathy, and fell once more to twisting his hat until he had fairly wrung it out of all semblance to its kind, twisting and screwing it between his strong hands, as though he would fain wring out of it some solution to the problem that so perplexed his mistress. Then all at once the frown vanished from his brow, his grip loosened upon his unfortunate hat, and his eye brightened with a sudden gleam. "'Miss Anthea,' said he, drawing a step nearer, and lowering his voice mysteriously, "'supposing as I was to tell you that he did want that furniture, Aram wanted it bad.' "'Now, how can he, Adam? "'It isn't as though he lived in England,' said Anthea, shaking her head. "'His home is thousands of miles away. "'He's an American, and besides—' "'Ah, but then, even an American may get married, Miss Anthea, ma'am,' said Adam. "'Married?' she repeated, glancing up very quickly. "'Adam, what do you mean?' "'Why, you must know,' began Adam, wringing at his hat again. "'Ever since the day I found him asleep in your hay, Miss Anthea, ma'am, "'Mr. Bellow has been very kind and friendly-like.' Mr. Bellow and me have smoked a good many sociable pipes together, and when men smoke together, Miss Anthea, they likewise talk together. Yes, well, said Anthea, rather breathlessly, and taking up a pencil that happened to be lying near to hand. And Mr. Bellow, continued Adam heavily, Mr. Bellow has done me the, the honour. Here Adam paused to give an extra twist to his hat, 
the er uh, the honour, Miss Anthea. Yes, Adam. I've confided to me his hopes, said Adam slowly, finding it much harder to frame his well meaning falsehood than he had supposed. His H O P E S hopes, Miss Anthea, of settling down very soon, and of marrying a fine young lady as he has had his eye on a goodish time, having known her from childhood's arm, Miss Anthea, and has lived up in London. Yes, Adam. Consequently, he bought all your furniture to set up housekeeping, don't you see? Yes, I see, Adam. Her voice was low, soft, and gentle as ever, but the pencil was tracing meaningless scrawls in her shaking fingers. So you don't have to be no wise backward about keeping the money, Miss Anthea. Oh, no, 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 of course not. I, I, I understand it was just a, a, a business transaction. Ah, that's it, a business transaction, nodded Adam. So you put the money on one side to help pay off the mortgage, eh, Miss Anthea? Yes. If the ops come up to what they promised to come up to, you'll be able to get rid of old Grimes for good and all, Miss Anthea. Yes, Adam. And you'd be quite easy in your mind now, Miss Anthea, about keeping the money. Quite. Thank you, Adam, for, for telling me. You can go now. Oh, my then, good night, Miss Anthea, ma'am. The mortgage is as good as paid. There ain't no such ops nowhere near so good as arm be. And you're quite free of care and happy hearted, Miss Anthea? Quite. Oh, quite, Adam. When Adam's heavy tread had died away, when she was all alone, she behaved rather strangely for one so free of care and happy-hearted. Something bright and glistening splashed upon the paper before her. A pencil slipped from her fingers, and with a sudden choking cry she swayed forward and hid her face in her hands. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 16 In which Adam proposes a game. To be or not to be, Bedu leaned against the mighty bowl of King Arthur and stared up at the moon with knitted brows. That is the question, whether I shall brave the slings and arrows and things and speak to-night and have done with it one way or another, or live honour a while, secure in this uncertainty. To wait? Whether I shall at this so early stage pit all my chances of happiness against the chances of losing her, and with her, small porches, bless him, and all the quaint and lovable beings of this wonderful Arcadia of mine. For if her answer be no, what recourse have I? What is there left me but to go wandering forth again, following the wind, with the gates of Arcadia shut upon me for ever? To be or not to be, that is the question. Be that you, Mr. Bellew, sir? Even so, Adam, come sit to ye a while, good knave, and gaze upon Dion's loveliness and smoke, and let us converse of dead kings. Why, kings ain't much in my line, sir, living or dead uns, me never having seen any, except a picture, that tall, though very lifelike. But why I were a-looking for you was to ask you to back me up and to play the game, Mr. Bellew, sir. Why, as to that, my good Adam, my gentle Daphnis, my rugged Euphemio, you may rely upon me to the uttermost. Are you in trouble? Is it counsel you need, or only money? Fill your pipe, and while you smoke, confide your cares to me. Put me wise, or as your French cousins would say, make me au fait. Well began Adam, when his pipe was a little well alight. In the first place, Mr. Bellew, sir, I beg to remind you, as Miss Anthea sold her furniture, to raise enough money, as with what the ops will bring, might go to pay off the mortgage, for good and all, sir. Yes? Well, tonight, sir, Miss Anthea calls me into the parlour to ask, or as you might say, inquire, as to the why, and likewise the wherefore, of you are buying all that furniture. Did she, Adam? Ah. Why did he do it, says she? Well, to keep him from being took away, perhaps, says I. Sharp as any gimblet, sir. Good, nodded the Bellew. Ah, but it weren't no good, sir, returned Adam, because she says as how your own being in America, you couldn't really need the furniture, nor yet want the furniture, and blessed if she wasn't talking of handing you the money back again. Ah, said Bellew. Seeing which, sir, 
and because she must have that money if she hopes to keep the roof of Dapplemere over her head, I there and then made up, or as you might say, concocted a story of an anecdote or a, a yarn on the spot, Mr. Bellew, sir. Most excellent, Machiavelli. Proceed. I told her, sir, as you, you bought that furniture on account of you being wishful to settle down. Whereat she starts and looks at me with her eyes big and surprised like. I told her likewise, as you had told me on the quiet, or as you might say, confidential, that you bought that furniture to set up housekeeping on account of you being on the point of marrying a fine young lady up in London. What? Bellew didn't move, nor did he raise his voice. Nevertheless, Adam started back and instinctively threw up his arm. You told her that? I did, sir. But you knew it was a confounded lie. Aye, I know it, but I'd tell her hundred, I thousands of lies, confounded or otherwise, to save Miss Anthea. To save her? From ruination, sir, from losing Dapplemere Farm and everything she has in the world. Lord Lovey, the ops could never bring him by themselves all the three thousand pounds as is owing. It ain't to be expected. But if that three thousand pounds ain't paid over to that dirty Grimes by next Saturday week as ever was, that dirty Grimes turns Miss Anthea out of Dapplemere with Master Georgie, poor little Miss Priscilla. And what'll become of them, then? Oh, I don't know. Lord, when I think of it, the old Adam do rise up in me to that extent as I'm minded to take a pitchfork and go and skewer that there Grimes to his own chimbly corner. You see, Mr. Bellew, sir, he went on, seeing Bellew was silent still. Miss Anthea be that proud and independent that she'd never have took your money. Sir, if I hadn't told her that there lie, so that's why I did tell her that there lie. I see, nodded Bellew. I see. Yes, you did quite right. You acted for the best, and you did quite right, Adam. Yes, quite right. Thank you, sir. And so this is the game I am to play, is it? That's it, sir. If she asks you, are you going to get married? You tell her, yes, to the ladies you've known from your childhood's hour, living in London. And that's all, sir. That's all, is it, Adam? said Abelu slowly, turning to look up at the moon again. Doesn't sound very much, does it? Well, I'll play your game, Adam. Yes, you may depend upon me. Thank you, Mr. Bellew, sir. Thank you, sir. I do hope as you'll excuse me for taking such liberties and making so free with your art and your affection, sir. Oh, certainly, Adam. The cause excuses everything. Then uh, good night, sir. Good night, Adam. So this good, well-meaning Adam strode away, proud on the whole of his night's work, leaving Bellew to frown up at the moon with teeth clenched tight upon his pipe-stem. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 17 how Bellew began the game. Now in this life of ours there may be games of many and divers sorts, and all are calculated to try the nerve, courage, or skill of the player, as the case may be. Bellew had played many kinds of games in his day, and among others had at once been famous as an eight-tackle on the Harvard Eleven. Upon him he yet bore certain scars received upon a memorable day when Yale, flushed with success, saw their hitherto invincible line rent and burst asunder, saw a figure torn, bruised and bleeding, flash out and away down the field to turn defeat into victory, and then to be borne off honourably to hospital and bed. If Billy thought of this by any chance as he sat there staring up at the moon, it is very sure that, had the choice been given him, he would joyfully have chosen the game of torn flesh and broken bones or any other game, no matter how desperate, rather than this particular game that Adam had invented and thrust upon him. Presently Bellew knocked the ashes from his pipe, and, rising, walked on slowly towards the house. As he approached, he heard someone playing the piano, and the music accorded well with his mood, or his mood with the music, for it was haunting and very sweet, and with a recurring melody and a minor key, that seemed to voice all the sorrow of humanity, past, present, and to come. Drawn by the music, he crossed the rose garden, and, reaching the terrace, paused there. 
the long French windows were open, and from where he stood he could see Anthea seated at the piano. She was dressed in a white gown of some soft, clinging material, and among the heavy braids of her hair was a single great red rose. And as he watched, he thought she had never looked more beautiful than now, with the soft glow of the candles upon her, for her face reflected the tender sadness of the music. It was in the mournful droop of her scarlet lips and the sombre depths of her eyes. Close beside her sat little Miss Priscilla, busy with her needle as usual, but now she paused, and lifting her head in her quick, bird-like way, looked up at Anthea, long and fixedly. "'Anthea, my dear,' said she suddenly, "'I'm fond of music, and I love to hear you play, as you know. But I've never heard you play quite so dolefully. Dear Mina, that, that's not the right word, nor dismal, but I, I mean something between the two. I thought you were fond of Grieg, Aunt Priscilla. So I am, but then, even in his gayest moments, poor Mr. Grieg was always breaking his heart over something or other. And, gracious, there's Mr. Bellew at the window. Pray come in, Mr. Bellew, and tell us how you liked Peter Day and, and the muffins. Thank you, said Bellew, stepping in through the long French window. But I should like to hear Miss Anthea play again first, if she will. But Anthea, who had already risen from the piano, shook her head. "'Only play when I feel like it, to please myself and Aunt Priscilla,' said she, crossing to the broad, low window-seat and leaning out into the fragrant night. "'Why, then,' said Bellew, sinking into the easy-chair that Miss Priscilla indicated with a little stab of her needle, "'why, then, uh, the muffins were delicious, Aunt Priscilla, and Peter Day was just exactly what a young one-legged mariner ought to be.' "'And the shrimps, Mr. Bellew?' inquired Miss Priscilla, busy at her sewing again. "'Out shrimped all other shrimps so ever,' he answered, glancing to where Anthea sat with her chin propped in her hand, gazing up at the waning moon, seemingly quite oblivious of him. "'And did he, he pour out the tea?' inquired Miss Priscilla. "'From the china pot with the blue flowers and the Chinese mandarin fanning himself? Very awkward, of course, with his one hand. I don't mean the mandarin, Mr. Bellew. And very full of apologies?' "'He did.' "'Just as usual. Yes, he always does, and every year he gives me three lumps of sugar. And I only take one, you know.' "'It's a pity,' sighed Miss Priscilla, "'that it was his right arm. A great pity.' And here she sighed again, and, catching herself, glanced up quickly at Bellew, and smiled to see how completely absorbed he was in contemplation of the silent figure in the window-seat. "'But after all, better a right arm than a leg,' she pursued. "'At least I think so.' "'Certainly.' murmured Bellew. A man with only one leg, you see, would be almost as helpless as an old woman with a crippled foot. Who grows younger and brighter every year, added Bellew, turning to her with his pleasant smile. Yes, and I think prettier. Oh, Mr. Bellew, exclaimed Miss Priscilla, shaking her head at him reprovingly, yet looking pleased nonetheless. How can you be so ridiculous? Good gracious me! Why, it was the sergeant who put it into my head. "'Yes, it was after I had given him your message about Peaches, Aunt Priscilla, and—' "'Oh, dear heart!' exclaimed Miss Priscilla at this junction. "'Prudent is out to-night, and I promised to bake the bread for her, and here I sit chatting and gossiping while that bread goes rising and rising all over the kitchen.' Miss Priscilla laid aside her sewing, and, catching up her stick, hurried to the door. "'And I was almost forgetting to wish you many happy returns of the day, Aunt Priscilla.' said Bellew, rising. At this familiar appellation, Anthea turned sharply, in time to see him stoop and kiss Miss Priscilla's small white hand, whereupon Anthea must needs curl her lip at his broad back. Then he opened the door, and Miss Priscilla tapped away, even more quickly than usual. Anthea was half sitting, half kneeling among the cushions in the corner of the deep window, apparently still lost in contemplation of the moon so much so that she did not stir or even lower her upward gaze when Bellew came and stood beside her. Therefore, taking advantage of the fixity of her regard, he once more became absorbed in her loveliness. Surely a most unwise proceeding in Arcadia by the light of a midsummer moon. And he mentally contrasted the dark, proud beauty of her face with that of all the women he had ever known, to their utter and complete disparagement. 
Well, inquired Anthea, at last, perfectly conscious of his look, and finding the silence growing irksome, yet still with her eyes averted. Well, Mr. Bellew? On the contrary, he answered, the moon is on the wane. The moon, she repeated. Suppose it is. What then? True happiness can only come riding astride the full moon, you know. You remember old Nanny told us so. And you believed it? she inquired scornfully. Why, of course, he answered in his quiet way. Anthea didn't speak, but once again the curl of her lip was eloquent. And so, he went on, quite unabashed, when I behold happiness riding astride the full moon, I shall just reach up in the most natural manner in the world and take it down, that it may abide with me, world without end. Do you think you will be tall enough? We shall see when the time comes. I think it's all very ridiculous, said Anthea. Why, then, suppose you play for me that same plaintive piece you were playing as I came in. Something of Grieg's, I think it was. Will you, Miss Anthea? She was on the point of refusing. Then, as if moved by some capricious whim, she crossed to the piano and dashed into the riotous music of a Polish dance. As the wild notes leapt beneath her quick brown fingers, Bellew, seated nearby, kept his eyes upon the great red rose in her hair that nodded slyly at him with her every movement. And surely in all the world there had never bloomed a more tantalising, more wantonly provoking rose than this. Wherefore Bellew, very wisely, turned his eyes from its glowing temptation. Doubtless observing which, the rose, in evident desperation, nodded and swayed, until it had fairly nodded itself from its sweet resting-place, and, falling to the floor, lay within Bellew's reach. Whereupon he promptly stooped and picked it up, and, even as with a last crashing chord Anthea ceased playing and turned, in that same moment he dropped it deftly into his coat-pocket. "'Oh, by the way, Mr. Bellew,' she said, speaking as if the idea had but just entered her mind, "'What do you intend to do about all your furniture?' Uh, "'Do about it?' he repeated, "'settling the rose carefully in a corner of his pocket "'where it would not be crushed by his pipe. "'I mean, where would you like it, stored, "'and till you can send and have it taken away?' "'Well, I uh, rather thought of keeping it where it was, "'if you didn't mind. "'I'm afraid that would be impossible, Mr. Bellew. "'Why, then, the barn will be an excellent place for it. "'I don't suppose the rats and mice will do it any real harm, "'and as for the damp and the dust. "'Oh, you know what I mean,' exclaimed Anthea, "'meaning to tap the floor impatiently with her foot. "'Of course we can't go on using the things now that they are your property. "'It, it, it wouldn't be right.' "'Very well,' he nodded, his fingers questing anxiously after the rose again. "'I'll get Adam to help me to shift it all into the barn tomorrow morning.' "'Will you please be serious, Mr. Bellew?' "'As an owl,' he nodded. "'Why, then, of course you will be leaving Dapplemere soon, "'and I should like to know exactly when, "'so that I can make the necessary arrangements.' "'But, you see, I am not leaving Dapplemere soon, "'or even thinking of it.' "'Not?' she repeated, "'glancing up at him in swift surprise. "'Not until you bid me.' "'I?' "'You.' "'But I—' "'I understood that you intend to settle down.' "'Certainly,' nodded Bellew, "'transferring his pipe to another pocket altogether, "'lest it should damage the rose's tender petals. "'To settle down has lately become the uh, ambition of my life.' "'Then pray,' said Anthea, "'taking up a sheet of music "'and beginning to study it with attentive eyes, "'be so good as to tell me what you mean.' "'That necessarily brings us back to the moon again,' answered Bellew. "'The moon? The moon. "'But what in the world has the moon to do with your furniture?' she demanded, her foot beginning to tap again. "'Everything. I bought that furniture with uh, with one eye on the moon, as it were. "'Consequently, the, the furniture, the moon, and I are bound indissolubly together.' "'You are pleased to talk in riddles to-night, "'and really, Mr. Bellew, I have no time to waste over them, "'so if you will excuse me.' "'Thank you for playing to me,' he said, "'as he held the door open for her. "'I play because I, I felt like it, Mr. Bellew.' "'Nevertheless, I thank you.' 
When you make up your mind about the furniture, please let me know. When the moon is at the full, yes. Can it be possible that you are still harping on the wild words of poor old Nanny? she exclaimed, and once more she curled her lip at him. Nanny is very old, I'll admit, he nodded, but surely you remember that we proved her right in one particular. I mean, about the tiger mark, you know. Now, when he said this, for no apparent reason, the eyes that had hitherto been looking into his, proud and scornful, wavered, and were hidden under their long, thick lashes. The colour flamed in her cheeks, and without another word, she was gone. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 18 How the Sergeant Went Upon His Guard. The Arcadians, one and all, generally follow that excellent maxim which runs Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy and wealthy and wise. Healthy they are, beyond a doubt and in their quaint, simple fashion, profoundly wise. If they are not extraordinarily wealthy, yet they are generally blessed with contented minds, which, after all, is better than money, and far more to be desired than fine gold. Now whether their general health, happiness, and wisdom is to be attributed altogether to their early-to-bed proclivities is perhaps a moot question. Howbeit, Tonight, long after these weary Arcadians have forgotten their various cares and troubles in the blessed oblivion of sleep, for even Arcadia has its troubles, Bellew sat beneath the shade of King Arthur, alone with his thoughts. Presently, however, he was surprised to hear the house door open and close very softly, and to behold, not the object of his meditations, but Miss Priscilla coming towards him. As she caught sight of him in the shadow of the tree, she stopped and stood leaning upon her stick, as though she were rather disconcerted. "'Aunt Priscilla,' said he, rising. "'Oh, it's you!' she exclaimed, just as though she hadn't known it all along. "'Dear me! Mr. Bellew, how lonely you look, and dreadfully thoughtful! Good gracious!' And she glanced up at him with her quick, girlish smile. "'I suppose you wonder what I'm doing out here at this unhallowed time of night. It must be nearly eleven o'clock. Oh, dear me! Yes, you are. "'Well, sit down, and I'll tell you. "'Let us sit here, in the darkest corner. "'There. "'Dear heart, how bright the moon is, to be sure.' "'So saying, Miss Priscilla ensconced herself "'at the very end of the rustic bench, "'where the deepest shadow lay. "'Well, Mr. Bellew,' she began, "'as you know, to-day is my birthday. "'As to my age, I am, let us say, just turned twenty-one. "'And being young and foolish, Mr. Bellew, I've come out here to watch another very foolish person, a ridiculous old sergeant of hussars, who will come marching along very soon to mount guard in full regimentals, Mr. Bellew, with his busby on his head, with his braided tunic and dolman, and his great big boots, and with his spurs jingling and his sabre bright under the moon. So then, you know he comes? Why, of course I do, and I love to hear the jingle of his spurs and to watch the glitter of his sabre. So every year I come here and sit among the shadows where he can't see me, and watch him go march, march, marching up and down, and to and fro, until the clock strikes twelve, and he goes marching home again. Oh, dear me, it's all very foolish, of course, but I love to hear the jingle of his spurs. And uh, have you sat here watching him every year? Every year. And he has never guessed you were watching him? Oh, good gracious me, of course not. "'Don't you think, Aunt Priscilla, that you are just a little cruel?' "'Cruel? Why, what do you mean?' "'I gave him your message, Aunt Priscilla.' "'What message?' "'That to-night the peaches were riper than ever they were.' "'Oh,' said Miss Priscilla, and waited expectantly for Bellew to continue. But as he was silent, she glanced at him, and seeing him staring at the moon, she looked at it also. And after she had gazed for perhaps half a minute— as Bailey was still silent, she spoke, though in a very small voice indeed. "'And what did he say?' "'Who?' inquired Bellew. "'Why, the, the, the sergeant, to be sure.' "'Well, he gave me to understand that a poor old soldier with only one arm left him must be content to stand aside always and hold his peace, just because he was a poor, maimed old soldier.' 
Don't you think that you have been just a little cruel all these years, Aunt Priscilla? Sometimes one is cruel only to be kind, she answered. Aren't the peaches ripe enough after all, Aunt Priscilla? Overripe, she said bitterly. Oh, they are overripe. Is that all, Aunt Priscilla? No, she answered. No, there's this. And she held up a little crutch stick. Is that all, Aunt Priscilla? Oh, isn't that enough? Betty rose. Where are you going? What are you going to do? She demanded. Wait, said he, smiling down at her perplexity. And so he turned and crossed to a certain corner of the orchard. When he came back, he held out a great glowing peach towards her. You were quite right, he nodded. It was so ripe that it fell at a touch. But as he spoke, she drew him down beside her in the shadow. Hush, she whispered. Listen. Now, as they sat there, very silent, faint and far away upon the still night air, they heard a sound, a silvery, rhythmic sound it was, like the musical clash of fairy cymbals, which drew rapidly nearer and nearer, and Penny felt that Miss Priscilla's hand was trembling upon his arm as she leaned forward, listening with a smile upon her parted lips and a light in her eyes that was ineffably tender. Nearer came the sound, and nearer, until presently, now in moonlight, now in shadow, there strode a tall, martial figure in all the glory of braided tunic and furred dolman, the three chevrons upon his sleeve and many shining medals upon his breast, a stalwart, soldierly figure, despite the one empty sleeve, who moved with the long, swinging stride that only the cavalryman can possess. Being come beneath a certain latticed window, the sergeant halted, and next moment his glittering sabre flashed up to the salute. Then, with it upon his shoulder, he wheeled and began to march up and down, his spurs jingling, his sabre gleaming, his dolman swinging, his sabre glittering each time he wheeled, while Miss Priscilla, leaning forward, watched him wide-eyed and with hands tight-clasped. Then, all at once, with a little fluttering sigh, she rose. Thus the sergeant, as he marched to and fro, was suddenly aware of one who stood in the full radiance of the moon, and with one hand outstretched towards him. And now, as he paused, disbelieving his very eyes, he saw that in her extended hand she held a great ripe peach. Sergeant, she said, speaking almost in a whisper, oh, Sergeant, won't you take it? The heavy sabre thudded down to the grass, and he took a sudden step towards her. But even now he hesitated, until, coming nearer yet, he could look down into her, her eyes. Then he spoke, and his voice was very hoarse and uneven. Uh, Miss Priscilla, he said. Priscilla. Oh, Priscilla. And with the word he had fallen on his knees at her feet, and his strong, solitary arm was folded close about her. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 19 In which Porge is big and Porge is small Discuss the subject of matrimony What is it, my Porges? Well, I'm a bit worried, you know. Worried? Yes, afraid I'll be an old man before my time, Uncle Porges. Adam says it's worry that ages a man, and it killed a cat, too. And why do you worry? Oh, it's my Auntie Anthea, of course. She was crying again last night. Crying? Betty had been lying flat upon his back in the fragrant shadow of the hayrick, but now he sat up, very suddenly, so suddenly that poor Porges started. Crying, he repeated. Last night? Are you sure? Oh, yes. You see, she forgot to come and tuck me up last night, so I creeped downstairs, very quietly, you know, to see why, and I found her bending over the table, all sobbing and crying. First she tried to pretend that she wasn't, but I saw the tears quite plain. Her cheeks were all wet, you know. And when I put my arms round her, to comfort her a bit, and asked her what was the matter, she only kissed me a lot, and said, nothing, nothing, only a headache. And um, why was she crying, do you suppose, my porges? Oh, money, of course, he sighed. What makes you think it was money? Because she's been talking to Adam. I heard him say good night as I creep down the stairs. Ah, said Bellew, staring straight before him. 
his beloved pipe had slipped from his fingers, and for a wonder lay all neglected. It was after she had talked with Adam, was it, my Borges? Yes, that's why I knew it was about money. Adam's always talking about mortgages and bills and money. Oh, Uncle Porges, how I do hate money. It is sometimes a confounded nuisance, nodded Bellew. But I do wish we had some, so we could pay all her bills and mortgages for her. She'd be so happy, you know, and go about singing like she used to, and I shouldn't worry myself into an old man before my time, all wrinkled and grey, you know. And all would be revelry and joy, if only she had enough gold and banknotes. And she was crying, you say, demanded Billy again, his gaze still far away. Yes. You are quite sure you saw the tears, my porges? Oh, yes, and there was one on her nose, too, a big one that shone awful bright, twinkled, you know. And she said it was only a headache, did she? Yes, but that meant money. Money always makes her headache lately. Oh, Uncle Porges, I suppose people do find fortunes sometimes, don't they? My yes, to be sure they do. Then I wish I knew where they'd look for them, said he, with a very big sigh indeed. I've hunted and hunted in all the attics and the cupboards and under hedges and in ditches and prayed and prayed, you know, every night. Then, of course, you'll be answered, my Porges. Do you really suppose I shall be answered? You see, it's such an awful long way for one small prayer to have to go from here to heaven. And there's clouds that get in the way, and I'm afraid my prayers aren't quite big or heavy enough and get lost and blown away in the wind. No, my porges, said Bellew, drawing his arm about the small, disconsolate figure. You may depend upon it that your prayers fly straight up into heaven, and that neither the clouds nor the wind can come between or blow them away. So just keep on praying, old chap, and when the time is ripe, they'll be answered, never fear. Answered? Do you mean, no, Uncle Porges, do you mean the money moon? A small hand upon Bellew's arm quivered, and his voice trembled with eagerness. Why, yes, to be sure, the money moon, my Porges, it's bound to come one of these fine nights. Ah, but when? Oh, when will the money moon ever come? Well, I can't be quite sure, but I rather fancy from the look of things, my Porges, that it will be pretty soon. Oh, I do hope so, for her sake and my sake. You see, she may go getting herself married to Mr. Cassillis, if something doesn't happen soon. I shouldn't like that, you know. Neither should I, my Porges. But what makes you think so? Why, he's always bothering her and asking her to, you see. She always says, no, of course. One of these fine days, I'm afraid she'll say, yes, accidentally, you know. Heaven forbid, Matthew. Does that mean you hope not? <laughs> Indeed, yes. Then I say, heaven forbid, too, because I don't think she'd ever be happy in Mr. Cassidy's great big house, and I shouldn't either. Why, of course not. You never go about asking people to marry you, do you, Uncle Porges? Well, it could hardly be called a confirmed habit of mine. That's one of the things I like about you so. All the time you've been here, you haven't asked my Auntie Anthea once, have you? No, my Uncle Porges, not yet. Oh, but you don't mean that you ever will. Would you be very grieved and angry if I did, some day soon, my Porges? Well, I, I didn't think you were that kind of a man, answered small Porges, sighing and shaking his head regretfully. I'm afraid I am, nephew. Do you really mean that you want to marry my Auntie Anthea? I do. As much as Mr. Cassidis does? A great deal more, I think. Small Porges sighed again and shook his head very gravely indeed. "'Uncle Porges,' said he, "'I'm surprised at you.' "'I rather feared you would be, nephew. "'It's all so awful silly, you know. "'Why do you want to marry her?' "'Because, like a prince in a fairy tale, "'I'm uh, rather anxious to live happy ever after.' "'Oh,' said Small Porges, turning this over in his mind, "'I never thought of that.' Marriage is a very important institution, you see, my Porges, especially in this case, because I can't possibly live happy ever after unless I marry first. Now can I? No, I suppose not, Small Porges admitted, albeit reluctantly, after he had pondered the matter a while with wrinkled brow. But why pick out my Auntie Anthea? Just because she happens to be your Auntie Anthea, of course. Small Porges sighed again. Why, then, if she's got to be married some day, so she can live happy ever after, 
Well, I suppose you'd better take her, Uncle Porges. Thank you, old chap. I mean to. I'd rather you took her than Mr. Cassillis, and why, there he is. Who? Mr. Cassillis, and he stopped, and he's twisting his moustache. Mr. Cassillis, who'd been crossing the paddock, had indeed stopped and was twisting his black moustache, as if he were hesitating between two courses. Finally, he pushed open the gate, and approaching Bellew, saluted him with that supercilious air which Miss Priscilla always declared she found so trying. Ah, Mr. Bellew, what might it be this morning? The pitchfork, the scythe, or the plough? he inquired. Neither, sir. This morning it is matrimony. Uh, I beg your pardon? Matrimony? With a large M, sir, nodded Bellew. Married, sir. Wedlock. My nephew and I are discussing it in its aspects philosophical, sociological, and this is surely rather a, a peculiar subject to discuss with a child, Mr. Bellew. Meaning my nephew, sir? I mean young George, there. Precisely, my nephew, small porges. I defer, said Mr. Cassillis, with slow and crushing emphasis, to Miss Devine's nephew. And mine, Miss Cassillis, mine by a mutual adoption and inclination. And I repeat that your choice of subject is peculiar, to say the least of it. But then mine is rather a peculiar nephew, sir. But surely it was not to discuss nephews, mine or anyone else's, that you are hither come, and our ears do wait upon you. Pray be seated, sir. Thank you, I prefer to stand. Strange, murmured Bellew, shaking his head. I never stand if I can sit, or sit if I can lie down. I should like you to define exactly your position here at Dappelmere, Mr. Bellew. Bellew's sleepy glance missed nothing of the other's challenging attitude, and his ear nothing of Mr. Cassillis's authoritative tone. Therefore his smile was most engaging as he answered, "'My position here, sir, is truly the most uh, enviable in the world. Prudent is an admirable cook, particularly as regard to Yorkshire pudding. Gentlemental Miss Priscilla is the most uh, aunt-like and perfect of housekeepers, and Miss Anthea is our sovereign lady, before whose radiant beauty small porges and I, like true knights and gallant gentles, do constant homage, and in whose behalf small porges and I stand prepared to wage stern battle by day or by night. Indeed, said Mr. Cassidis, and his smile was even more supercilious than usual. Yes, sir, nodded Bellew, I do confess me a most fortunate and happy white, who, having wandered hither and yon upon this planet of ours, which is so vast and so very small, has, by the most happy chance, found his way hither into Arcady. And may I inquire how long you intend to lead this Arcadian existence? I feel I cannot answer that question until the full of the moon, sir. At present, I grieve to say, I do not know. Mr. Cassillis struck his riding boot a sudden smart rap with his whip. His eyes snapped and his nostrils dilated as he glanced down into Bellew's imperturbable face. At least you know when we'll perhaps explain what prompted you to buy all that furniture. You were the only buyer of the sale, I understand. Who bought anything, yes, nodded Bellew. And pray, what was your object, you, a stranger? Well, replied Bellew slowly as he began to fill his pipe, I bought it because it was there to buy, you know. I bought it because furniture is apt to be rather useful now and then. I require the chairs to uh, sit on and the tables to uh, put things on, and don't quibble with me, Mr. Bellew. I beg your pardon, Mr. Cassillis. When I ask a question, sir, I am in the habit of receiving a direct reply. When I am asked a question, Mr. Cassillis, I am in the habit of answering it precisely as I please, or not at all. Mr. Bellew, let me impress upon you once and for all that Miss Devine has friends, old and tried friends, to whom she can always turn for aid in any financial difficulty she may have to encounter, friends who can more than tide her over all her difficulties without the interference of strangers. And as one of her oldest friends, I demand to know by what right you force your wholly unnecessary assistance upon her. My very good sir, replied Bellew, shaking his head in gentle reproof, really, you seem to forget that you are not addressing one of your grooms or footmen. Consequently, you force me to remind you of the fact. Furthermore, that is no answer, said Mr. Cassillis, his gloved hands tight clenched upon his hunting crop, his whole attitude one of menace. Furthermore, pursued Bellew placidly, settling the tobacco in his pipe with his thumb, 
You can continue to uh, demand until all's blue, and I shall continue to lie here and smoke and gaze up at the smiling serenity of heaven. The black brows of Mr. Cassilis met in a sudden frown. He tossed his whip aside and took a sudden quick stride towards the recumbent Bellew with so evident an intention the small portis shrank instinctively further within the encircling arm. But at that psychic moment, very fortunately for all concerned, there came the sound of a quick, light step, and Anthea stood between them. "'Mr. Cassilis! Mr. Bellew!' she exclaimed, her cheeks flushed and her bosom heaving with the haste she had made. "'Pray, whatever does this mean?' Bellew rose to his feet, and seeing Cassilis was silent, shook his head and smiled. "'Upon my word, I hardly know, Miss Anthea. Our friend Mr. Cassilis seems to have got himself all worked up over the uh, sale, I fancy.' "'The furniture!' exclaimed Anthea, and stamped her foot with vexation. "'That wretched furniture! Of course you explained your object in buying it, Mr. Bellew?' "'Well, no, we hadn't got as far as that.' And when he said this, Anthea's eyes flashed sudden scorn at him, and she curled her lip at him and turned her back upon him. "'Mr. Bellew bought my furniture because he intends to set up housekeeping. He is to be married, soon, I believe.' "'When the moon is at the full,' nodded Bellew. "'Married?' exclaimed Miss Cassillis, his frown vanishing as if by magic. "'Oh, indeed! I am on my way to the Hop Gardens, if you care to walk with me, Mr. Cassillis.' And with the words, Anthea turned, and as he watched them walk away together, Bellew noticed upon the face of Mr. Cassillis an expression very like triumph, and in his general air a suggestion of proprietorship that jarred upon him most unpleasantly. "'Why do you frown so, Uncle Porges?' "'I am um, was thinking, nephew.' "'Well, I'm thinking, too,' nodded small Porges, his brows knitted portentously. And thus they sat, big and little Porges, frowning in unison at space for quite a while. "'Are you quite sure you never told my Auntie Antha that you were going to marry her?' inquired small Porges at last. "'Quite sure, comrade. Why?' "'Then how did she know you were going to marry her and settle down?' "'Marry her and settle down?' "'Yes, at the full of the moon, you know.' "'Why, really, I don't know, my Porges, unless she guessed it. "'I expect she did. She's awful clever at guessing things. "'But do you know? Well, I'm thinking I just don't like the way she smiled at Mr. Cassillis. "'I never saw her look at him like that before, as if she were awful glad to see him, you know. "'So I don't think I'd wait until the full of the moon if I were you. "'I think you'd better marry her this afternoon.' That, said Bellew, clapping him on the shoulder, is a very admirable idea. I'll mention it to her on the first available opportunity, my porges. But the opportunity did not come that day, nor the next, nor the next after that, for it seemed that with the approach of the hop picking, Anthea had no thought or time for anything else. Wherefore Bellew smoked many pipes, and as the days wore on, possessed his soul in patience, which is a most excellent precept to follow in all things but love. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 20, which relates a most extraordinary conversation. In the days which now ensued, while Anthea was busied out of doors and Miss Priscilla was busied indoors, and small Porges was diligently occupied with his lessons. At such times, Betty would take his pipe and go to sit and smoke in company with the cavalier in the great picture above the carved chimney-piece. A right jovial companion at all times was this cavalier. An optimist he, from the curling feather in his broad-brimmed beaver hat to the spurs at his heels. Handsome, gay and debonair was he, with lips upcurving to a smile beneath his moustachio, and a quizzical light in his grey eyes, very like that in Bellew's own. Moreover, he wore the knowing, waggish air of one well-versed in all the ways of the world, and mankind in general, and, what is infinitely more, of the sex feminine, in particular experience was he, beyond all doubt, in their pretty tricks and foibles, since he had ever been a diligent student of feminine propitiousness when the merry monarch ruled the land. Hence it became customary for Bellew to sit with him and smoke and take counsel of this pro-chevalier upon the unfortunate turn of affairs. 
whereof ensued many remarkable conversations, of which the following was one. Bellew. No, sir, emphatically I do not agree with you. To be sure you may have had more experience than I in such affairs, but then it was such a very long time ago. The Cavalier, interrupting, or seeming to. Ha! Ah. Bellew. Again, I begged to differ from you. Women are not the same today as they ever were. Judging by what I have read of the ladies of your day, and King Charles's court at Whitehall, I should say not. At least, if they are, they act differently, and consequently must be uh, wooed differently. The methods employed in your day would be wholly inadequate and quite out of place in this. The Cavalier, shaking his head and smirking, or seeming to. Ha! Ah. Well, you, well, I'm willing to bet you anything you like, that if you were to step down out of your frame, change your velvets and laces for trousers and coat, leave off your great peruke, and wear a derby hat instead of that picturesque floppy affair, and try your fortune with some twentieth-century damsel, your high-sounding gallantries and flattering phrases would fall singularly flat, and you would be promptly turned down, sir. The cavalier, tossing his love-locks, or seeming to. Ha! Bellew. A strong hand, you say? Ha! History tells us that William the Conqueror wooed his lady with a club or a battle-axe or something of the sort, and she consequently liked him the better for it, which was all very natural and proper, of course, in her case, seeing that hers was the day of battle-axes and things. But then, as I said before, sir, the times are sadly changed. Women may still admire strength of body, and even occasionally of mind, but the theory of dog, woman, and walnut tree is quite obsolete. The Cavalier, frowning and shaking his head, or seeming to. Ha! Ah. Will you? Ah, you don't believe me? Well, that is because you are obsolete, too. Yes, sir, as obsolete as your hat, or your boots, or your long rapier. Now, for instance, suppose I were to ask your advice in my own case. You know precisely how the matter stands at present, between Miss Anthea and myself. You also know Miss Anthea personally, since you have seen her much, and often, and have watched her grow from childhood into uh, glorious womanhood. I repeat, sir, glorious womanhood. Thus, you ought to know and understand her far better than I, for I do confess she is a constant source of bewilderment to me. Now, since you do know her so well, what course would you adopt were you in my place? The cavalier, smirking more knowingly than ever, or seeming to. Ah! Bellew. Preposterous! Quite absurd! And just what I might have expected. Carry her off, indeed! No, no, we are not living in your bad, old, glorious days, when a maid's no was generally taken to mean yes, or when a lover might swing his reluctant mistress up to his saddle-bow and ride off with her, leaving the world far behind. Today it is all changed, sadly changed. Your age was a wild age, a violent age, but in some respects perhaps a rather glorious age. Your advice is singularly characteristic, and of course quite impossible, alas. Carry her off, indeed. Hereupon Bellew sighed, and turned away, lighted his pipe, which had gone out, and buried himself in the newspaper. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 21 of Shoes and Ships and Sealing Wax and The Third Finger of the Left Hand. So Bellew took up the paper. The house was very quiet, for small porches was deep in the vexatious rules of the multiplication table and something he called geography. Anthea was out, as usual, and Miss Priscilla was busied with her numerous household duties. Thus the brooding silence was unbroken, save for the occasional murmur of a voice, the jingle of the housekeeping keys, and the quick, light tap-tap of Miss Priscilla's stick. Therefore, Bellew read the paper, and let it be understood that he regarded the daily news-sheet as the last resource of the utterly bored. Now, presently, as he glanced over the paper with a negative interest, his eye was attracted by a long paragraph beginning, At St. George's, Hanover Square, by the Right Reverend Bishop, Sylvia Cecile Marchmont, to His Grace the Duke of Ryde, K.G. K.C.B. Bellew followed a full, true, and particular account of the ceremony, which it seemed had been graced by royalty. George Bellew read it halfway through, and yawned, positively, and actually yawned, and thereafter laughed. And so I have been in Arcadia only three weeks. 
I've known Anthea only twenty-one days. A ridiculously short time as time goes, in any other place but Arcadia, and yet sufficient to lay for ever the uh, haunting spectre of the might have been. Lord, what a preposterous ass I was! Baxter was quite right, utterly and completely right. Now let us suppose that this paragraph had read, Today, at St. George's, Hanover Square, Anthea Devine to... No, no, confound it! And Bellew crumpled up the paper and tossed it into a distant corner. I wonder what Baxter would think of me now. Good old faithful John. The haunting spectre of the might have been. What a preposterous ass! What a monumental idiot I was! Preposterous ass! Isn't a very pretty word, Uncle Porges. Or continental idiot, said a voice behind him. And turning... He beheld small porges, somewhat stained and bespattered with ink, who shook a reproving head at him. "'True, nephew,' he answered, "'but they are sometimes very apt, and in this instance particularly so.' Small porges drew near, and seating himself upon the arm of Bellew's chair, looked at his adopted uncle long and steadfastly. "'Uncle Porges,' said he at last, "'you never tell stories, do you? I mean, lies, you know.' "'Indeed, I hope not, porges.' "'Why do you ask?' "'Well, cause my Auntie Anthea's afraid you do.' "'She... Uh, why?' "'When she came to tuck me up last night, "'she sat down on my bed and talked to me a long time, "'and she sighed a lot and said she was afraid I didn't care for her any more. "'She's awful silly, you know.' Oh, "'Yes, of course,' nodded Bellew. "'And then she asked me why I was so fond of you, "'and I said cause you were my Uncle Porges that I found under a hedge. "'And then she got more angrier than ever and said she wished I'd left you under the hedge.' "'Did she, my Porges?' "'Yes, she said she wished she'd never seen you, "'and she'd be awful glad when you'd gone away. "'So I told her you weren't ever going away, "'and that we were waiting for the money moon to come "'and bring us to the fortune. And "'Then she shook her head and said, "'Oh, my dear, you mustn't believe anything "'he says to you about the moon or anything else, "'cause he tells lies. "'And she said, lies, twice. "'Ah, oh, and, and, and did she stamp her foot, Porges? "'Yes, I think she did.' "'and then she said there wasn't such a thing as a money moon, "'and she told me you were going away very soon to get married, you know.' "'And what did you say?' "'Oh, well, I told her that I was going too. "'And then I thought she was going to cry, "'and she said, "'Oh, Georgie, I didn't think you'd leave me, even for him. "'So then I had to explain how we'd arranged "'that she was going to marry you "'so that we could all live happily ever after. "'I mean, that it was all settled, you know, "'and that you were going to speak to her on the first opportunity. "'And then she looked at me a long time and asked me, "'Was I sure you had said so?' "'And then she got awful angry indeed and said, "'How dare he! Oh, how dare he! "'So, of course, I told you you'd dare anything, even a dragon, "'cause you were so big and brave, you know. "'So then she went and stood by the window, "'and she was so angry she cried, and I nearly cried too. "'But at last she kissed me good-night and said you were a man "'that never meant anything you said and that I must never believe you any more "'and that you were going away to marry a lady in London.' "'and that she was very glad, "'cause then we should all be happy again, she supposed. "'So she kissed me again and tucked me up and went away. "'But it was a long, long time before I could go to sleep, "'cause I kept on thinking and thinking, "'suppose there really wasn't any money, Moon, after all. "'Supposing you were going to marry another lady in London. "'You see, it would all be so frightfully awful, wouldn't it?' "'Terribly, dreadfully awful, my Porges. "'But you never do tell lies, do you, Uncle Porges?' No. And there is a money moon, isn't there? Why, of course there is. And you are going to marry my Auntie Anthea in the full of the moon, aren't you? Yes, my Porges. Why, then everything's all right again. So let's go and sit under the haystack and talk about ships. But why have ships? inquired Bellew, rising. Because I made up my mind this morning that I'd be a sailor when I grow up, a marry, you know, like Peter Day, and I prefer to have both my legs. "'You'd find it more convenient, perhaps. "'You know all about oceans and waves and billows, don't you, Uncle Porges?' "'Well, I know a little. "'And are you ever seasick, like a landlubber?' "'I used to be, but I got over it. "'Was it a very big ship that you came over in?' "'No, not so very big, but she's about as fast as anything in her class, "'and a corking sea-boat. "'What's her name?' "'Her name?' repeated Bellew. "'Well, she was called the, uh, Sylvia.' "'That's an awful pretty name for a ship.' "'Oh, so-so. "'But I have learned a prettier, "'and next time she puts out to sea "'we'll change her name, eh, my Porges?' "'We?' cried Small Porges, "'looking up with eager eyes. 
Do you mean you take me to sea with you? And my auntie Anthea, of course. You don't suppose I'd leave either of you behind if I could help it, do you? We'll draw sail away together, wherever you wished. Do you mean, said Small Porges in a suddenly awed voice, that it is your ship, your very own? Oh, yes. But do you know, Uncle Porges, you don't look as though you had a ship for your very own, somehow? Don't I? You see, a ship is such a very big thing for one man to have for his own very own self. And has it got masts and funnels and anchors? Lots of them. Then, please, when would you take me and Auntie Anthea sailing all over the oceans? Just as soon as she's ready to come. Then I think I'd like to go to Nova Zembia first. I find it in my geography of today, and it sounds nice and far off, doesn't it? It does, shipmate, nodded Bellew. Oh, well, that's fine, exclaimed Paul Porges rapturously. You should be the captain, and I'll be the shipmate, and we'll say aye-aye to each other, like the real sailors do in books. Shall we? My aye, shipmate, nodded Bellew again. Then please, Uncle Paul, I, I mean, Captain, what shall we name our ship? I mean, the new name. Well, my Porges, I mean, of course, shipmate, I rather thought of calling her. Hello, why, here's the sergeant. Sure enough, there was Sergeant Appleby sitting under the shade of King Arthur, but he rose and stood at attention as they came up. "'Why, Sergeant, how are you?' said Bellew, gripping the veteran's hand. "'You are half an hour before your usual time today. Nothing wrong, I hope.' "'Nothing wrong, Mr. Bellew, sir, I thank you. No, nothing wrong, but this is a, a memorable occasion, sir. May I trouble you to step behind the tree with me for half a moment, sir?' Suiting the action to the word, the sergeant led Bellew to the other side of the tree, and there, screened from view of the house, he, with a sudden jerky movement, produced a very small leather case from his pocket, which he handed to Bellew. "'Not good enough for such a woman, I, I know, but the best I could afford, sir,' said the sergeant, appearing profoundly interested in the leaves overhead, while Bellew opened the very small box. "'Why, it's very handsome, sergeant,' said Bellew, making the jewels sparkle in the sun. "'Anyone might be proud of such a ring.' "'Why, it did look pretty tidy in the shop, sir, to me and Peter Day. "'My comrade has a sharp eye and a sound judgment in most things, sir, "'and we took a, a deal of trouble in selecting it. "'But now, when it comes to giving it to her, "'why, it looks uncommon small and mean, sir.' "'A ruby and two diamonds and very fine stones, too, sergeant.' "'So I make so bold as to come here, sir,' pursued the sergeant still interested in the foliage above. Half an hour before my usual time, to, to ask you, sir, if you would so far oblige me as to hand it to her when I'm gone, sir. Oh, no, said Bellew, smiling and shaking his head. Not on your life, sergeant. My man, it would lose half its value in her eyes if any other than you gave it to her. No, sergeant, you must hand it to her yourself. And what's more, you must slip it upon her finger. Good Lord, sir exclaimed the sergeant. I could never do that. Oh, yes, you could. Not unless you stood by me, a, a force in reserve, as it were, sir. I'll do that, willingly, sergeant. Then perhaps, sir, you might happen to know uh, which finger? The third finger of the left hand, I believe, sergeant. Here's Aunt Priscilla now, said Small Porges at this juncture. Lord, exclaimed the sergeant, and sixty minutes before her usual time. Yes, there was Miss Priscilla, her basket of sewing upon her arm, as gentle, as unruffled, as placid as usual. And yet it is probable that she divined something from their very attitudes, for there was a light in her eyes, and her cheeks seemed more delicately pink than was their wont. Thus, as she came towards them, under the ancient apple-trees, despite her stick and her white hair, she looked even younger and more girlish than ever. At least the sergeant seemed to think so, for as he met her look, his face grew suddenly radiant, while a slow flush crept up under the tan of his cheek, and the solitary hand he held out to her trembled a little for all its size and strength. "'Miss Priscilla, ma'am,' he said, and stopped. "'Miss Priscilla,' he began again, and paused once more. "'Why, Sergeant!' she exclaimed. It was a very soft little exclamation indeed, for her hand still rested in his and so she could feel the quiver of the strong fingers. "'Why, Sergeant?' "'Miss Priscilla,' said he, beginning all over again, but with no better success. 
goodness me, exclaimed Miss Priscilla, I do believe he's going to forget to inquire about the peaches. Peaches, repeated the sergeant. Yes, Priscilla. And why? Because he's brought you a ring, small porters broke in. A very handsome ring, you know, Aunt Priscilla, all diamonds and jewels, and he wants you to please let him put it on your finger, if you don't mind. And uh, here it is, said the sergeant, and gave it into her hand. Miss Priscilla stood very silent and very still, looking down at the glittering gems. Then all at once her eyes filled, and a slow wave of colour dyed her cheeks. "'Oh, Sergeant,' she said very softly, "'Oh, Sergeant, I'm only a poor old woman with a lame foot.' "'And I am a poor old soldier with only one arm, Priscilla.' "'You are the strongest and gentlest and bravest soldier in all the world, I think,' she answered. "'And you, Priscilla, are the sweetest and most beautiful woman in the world, I know. "'And so I've loved you all these years and never dared to tell you so because of my one arm.' "'Why, then?' said Miss Priscilla, smiling up at him through her tears. "'If you do really think that—' "'Why, it's this finger, Sergeant.' So the Sergeant, very clumsily, perhaps— because he had but the one hand, slipped the ring upon the finger in question. And Porges, big and small, turning to glance back as they went upon their way, saw that he still held that small white hand pressed close to his lips. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22. Coming Events Cast Their Shadows Before "'Suppose they'll be marrying each other one of these fine days,' says Moor Porges, as they cross the meadows side by side. "'Yes, I expect so, shipmate,' nodded Bellew. "'And may they live long and die happy,' say I. "'Aye, aye, Captain, and amen,' returned Small Porges. Now, as they went, conversing of marriage and ships, and the wonders and marvels of foreign lands, they met with Adam, who stared up at the sky and muttered to himself, and frowned and shook his head. "'Good afternoon, Mr. Bellew, sir, and Master Georgie.' "'Well, Adam, how are the hops?' "'Hops, sir. There never was such hops. No, not in all Kent, sir. All I'm wishing is that they were all safe, picked, and gathered. What do you make of them clouds, sir, over there, just over the point of the oast house? Bellew turned and cast a comprehensive sailor-like glance in the direction indicated. "'Rain, Adam, and wind, and plenty of it,' said he. "'Ah, so I think, sir, driving storm and thrashing tempest.' "'Well, Adam?' "'Well, sir, perhaps you've never seen what driving rain and raging wind can do among the hop line, sir. "'What well, I wish as they ops was all safe picked and gathered, sir.' And Adam strode off, with his eyes still turned heavenward, and shaking his head like some great bird of ill omen. So the afternoon wore away to evening, and with evening came Anthea, but a very grave-eyed, troubled Anthea, who sat at the tea-table silent and preoccupied, insomuch that small porges openly wondered while Miss Priscilla watched over her, wistful and tender. Thus tea, which was wont to be the merriest meal of the day, was but the pale ghost of what it should have been, despite small porges' flow of conversation, when not impeded by bread and jam, and Bellew's tactful efforts. Now, while he talked light-heartedly, keeping carefully to generalities, he noticed two things. One was that Anthea made but a pretence at eating, and the second, that though she uttered a word now and then, yet her eyes persistently avoided his. Thus he, for one, was relieved when tea was over, and as he rose from the table he determined, despite the unpropitious look of things, to end the suspense one way or another, and speak to Anthea just so soon as she should be alone. But here again he was balked and disappointed, when small porters came to bid him good night as usual, he learned that Auntie Anthea had already gone to bed. She says it's a headache, said small porges, but I expect it's the hops, really, you know. The hops, my porges? She's worried about them. She's afraid of a storm like Adam is. And when she worries, I worry. Oh, Uncle Porges, if any of my prayers can bring the money moon soon, you know, very soon. If they don't bring it in a day or two, afraid I shall wake up one fine morning and find I've worried and worried myself into an old man. "'Never fear, shipmate,' said Bellew, in his most nautical manner. "'All's well that ends well. A low and aloft all's a tonto. "'So just take a turn at the lee braces and keep your weather eye lifting, "'for you may be sure of this. "'If the storm does come, it will bring the money moon with it.' 
Then, having bid small porters a cheery good night, Betty went out to walk among the roses. As he walked, he watched the flying rack of clouds above his head, and listened to the wind that moaned in fitful gusts. Wherefore, having learned in his many travels to read and interpret such natural signs and omens, he shook his head and muttered to himself, even as Adam had done before him. Presently he wandered back into the house, and, filling his pipe, went to hold communion with his friend the Cavalier. And thus it was that, having ensconced himself in the great elbow-chair, and raised his eyes to the picture, he spied a letter tucked into the frame thereof. Looking closer, he saw that it was directed to himself. He took it down, and after a momentary hesitation, broke the seal and read. Miss Devine presents her compliments to Mr. Bellew, and regrets to say that, owing to unforeseen circumstances, she begs that he will provide himself with other quarters at the expiration of the month, being the twenty-third inst. Bellew read the line slowly, twice over, then, folding the note very carefully, put it into his pocket, and stood for a long time staring at nothing in particular. At length he lifted his head and looked up into the smiling eyes of the cavalier above the mantel. Sir, said he, very gravely, it would almost seem that you were in the right of it, that yours is the best method after all. Then he knocked the ashes from his pipe, and went slowly and heavily upstairs to bed. It was a long time before he fell asleep, but he did so at last, for insomnia is a demon who rarely finds his way into Arcadia. But all at once he was awake again, broad awake, and staring into the dark, for a thousand voices seemed to be screaming in his ears, and eager hands were shaking and plucking at window and lattice. He started up, and then he knew that the storm was upon them, at last, in all its fury, rain and a mighty wind, a howling, raging tempest. Yes, a great and mighty wind was abroad, it shrieked under the eaves, it boomed and bellowed in the chimneys, and roared away to carry destruction among the distant woods, while the rain beat hissing against the window panes. Surely, in all its many years, the old house of Dapplemere had seldom borne the brunt of such a storm, so wild, so fierce and pitiless. And, lying there upon his bed, listening to the uproar and tumult, Betty must needs think of her who once said, We are placing all our hopes this year upon the hops. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 23. How Small Porches, in his hour of need, was deserted by his uncle. Ruin, sir. Done for. Lord love me, there ain't worth the trouble of gathering. What's left of them, Mr. Bellew, sir? So bad as that, Adam? Bad. Oh, so bad as ever was, sir, said Adam, blinking suspiciously and turning suddenly away. Has Miss Anthea seen? Does she know? Ah, she was out at dawn, and oh, Lord, Mr. Bellew, sir, I can't never forget her poor stricken face, so pale and sad it were. But she never said nothing, only, old Adam, my poor hops, and I see her lips all of a quiver while she spoke. And so she turned away and came back to the house, sir. Poor lass, oh, poor lass, he exclaimed, his voice growing more husky. She's made a brave fight for it, sir, but it weren't no use, you see. It'll be good-bye for her to Dapplemere, after all, that their mortgage can not never be played now, no how. When is it due? Well, according to the bond, or the deed, or whatever they calls it, it'd be due tonight at nine o'clock, sir. The old Grimes, as a special favour and not a much persuading, had agreed to hold over till next Saturday, on account of the op-picking. But now, as things there ain't no ops to be picked, why, he'll foreclose tonight, and glad enough to do it. You can lay your oath on that, Mr. Bellew, sir. Tonight, said Bellew, tonight. And he stood for a while with bent head as though lost in profound thought. Adam, said he suddenly, help me to harness the mare. I must drive over to the nearest railroad depot. Hurry, I must be off. The sooner the better. But be you going, sir? Yes, hurry, man, hurry. Do you mean as you're going to leave her now in the middle of all this trouble? Yes, Adam, I must go to London on business. Now hurry like a good fellow. And so together they entered the stable, and together they harnessed the mare. Which done, staying not for breakfast, Bellew mounted the driver's seat, and with Adam beside him drove rapidly away. But small porges had seen these preparations, and now came running all eagerness, but ere he could reach the yard, Bellew was out of earshot. 
So there stood Small Porges, a desolate little figure, watching the rapid course of the dog-cart until it had vanished over the brow of the hill. And then, all at once, the tears welled up into his eyes, hot and scalding, and a great sob burst from him, for it seemed to him that his beloved Uncle Porges had failed him at the crucial moment, had left him solitary just when he needed him most. Thus Small Porges gave way to his grief, hidden in the very darkest corner of the stable, whither he had retired lest any should observe his weakness, until having once more gained command of himself, and wiped away his tears with his small and dingy pocket-handkerchief, he slowly recrossed the yard, and entering the house, went to look for his auntie Anthea. And after much search, he found her, half lying, half kneeling beside his bed. When he spoke to her, though she answered him, she did not look up, and he knew that she was weeping. "'Don't, Auntie Anthea, don't,' he pleaded. "'I know Uncle Porges has gone away and left us, but you've got me left, you know, and, and I shall be a man very soon, before my time, I think. So don't cry, for I'm awful sorry he's gone too, just, just when we needed him the most, you know.' "'Oh, Georgie,' she whispered, "'my dear, brave little Georgie, we shall only have each other soon.' They're going to take Dapplemere away from us, and everything we have in the world. Oh, Georgie! Well, never mind, said he, kneeling beside her, and drawing one small arm protectingly about her. We shall always have each other left, you know. Nobody shall ever take you away from me. And th 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 there's the money moon. It's been an awful long time coming, but it may come tonight or, or tomorrow night. He said it would be sure to come if the storm came, and so I'll find the fortune for you at last. I know I shall find it some day, of course, because I've prayed and prayed for it so very hard, and he said my prayers went straight up to heaven and didn't get blown away or lost in the clouds. So don't cry, Auntie Anthea. Let's wait just a little longer till the money moon comes. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 24. In which shall be found mention of a certain black bag. Baxter. Sir. Get me a pen and ink. Yes, sir. Now any ordinary mortal might have manifested just a little surprise to behold his master walk suddenly in, gusty and dishevelled of person, his habitual languor laid aside, and to thus demand pen and ink forthwith. But then Baxter, though mortal, was the very cream of a gentleman's gentleman, and the acme of valets, as has been said, and comported himself accordingly. Baxter, sir, oblige me by getting this cashed. Yes, sir. Bring half of it in gold. Sir, said Baxter, glancing down at the slip of paper, did you say half, sir? Yes, Baxter, I take it all in gold, only that it would be rather awkward to drag around. So bring half in gold and the rest in five-pound notes. Very good, sir. Uh, and Baxter? Sir, take a cab. "'Certainly, sir.' And Baxter went out, closing the door behind him. Meanwhile, Bellew busied himself in removing all traces of his journey, and was already bathed and shaved and dressed by the time Baxter returned. Now, gripped in his right hand, Baxter carried a black leather bag, which jingled as he set it down upon the table. "'Got it?' inquired Bellew. "'I have, sir.' "'Good,' nodded Bellew. "'Now just run around to the garage and fetch the new racing car, uh, the Mercedes.' Uh, "'Now, sir.' "'Now, Baxter!' Once more Baxter departed, and while he was gone, Betty began to pack. That is to say, he bundled coats and trousers, shirts and boots into a portmanteau in a way that would have wrung Baxter's heart, could he have seen. Which done, Betty opened the black bag, glanced inside, shut it again, and lighting his pipe, stretched himself out upon an ottoman, and immediately became plunged in thought. So lost was he, indeed, that Baxter, upon his return, was necessitated to omit three distinct coughs, the most perfectly proper and gentlemanlike coughs in the world, ere Bellew was aware of his presence. "'Oh, uh, that's you, Baxter,' said he, sitting up. "'Back so soon?' Uh, "'The car is at the door, sir.' "'The car? Oh, yes, to be sure. Uh, "'Baxter?' "'Sir?' "'What should you say if I told you?' Bellew paused to strike a match, broke it, tried another, broke that, and finally put his pipe back into his pocket very conscious the while of Baxter's steady, though perfectly respectful, regard. "'Baxter,' said he again, "'what could you say if I told you that I was in love? At last, Baxter! Head over heels, hopelessly, irretrievably!' 
say, sir, or I should say, indeed, sir. What should you say, pursued Bellew, staring thoughtfully down at the rug under his feet, if I told you that I am so very much in love that I am positively afraid to tell her so? I should say, very remarkable, sir. Bellew took out his pipe again, looked at it very much as he had never seen such a thing before, and laid it down upon the mantelpiece. Baxter, said he, kindly understand that I am speaking to you as a man to man, as my father's old and trusted servant, and my early boyhood's only friend. Sit down, John. Thank you, Master George, sir. I wish to confess to you, John, that uh, regarding the, the uh, haunting spectre of the might have been, you were entirely in the right. At that time I knew no more the meaning of the, uh, the word, John. Uh, meaning the word love, Master George? Precisely. I knew no more about it than that table. But during these latter days I've begun to understand, and uh, the fact of the matter is I, I'm fairly up against it, John. Here Baxter, who had been watching him with his quick, sharp eyes, nodded his head solemnly. Master George, said he, uh, speaking as your father's old servant and your boyhood's friend, I'm afraid you are. Then he took a turn up and down the room, and then, pausing in front of Baxter, who had risen also as a matter of course, he suddenly laid his two hands upon his valet's shoulders. Baxter, said he, you'll remember that after my mother died, my father was always too busy piling up his millions to give much time or thought to me, and I should have been a very lonely small boy if it hadn't been for you, John Baxter. I was often up against it in those days, John, and you were always ready to help and advise me. But now... Well, from the look of things, I am rather afraid that I must stay up against it, that the game is lost already, John. But whichever way fate decides, win or lose, I am glad. Yes, very glad to have learned the true meaning of the word, John. Uh, Master George, sir, there was a poet once, Tennyson, I think, who said, It is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And I know that he was right. Uh, many years ago, before you were born, Master George, I loved and lost, and that is how I know. But I hope that fortune will be kinder to you. Indeed I do. Thank you, John. I don't see why she should be. And Bailey stood staring down at the rug again, still aroused by Baxter's cough. Uh, pray, sir, what are your orders? The car is waiting downstairs. Orders? Why, uh... Back your grip, Baxter. I shall take you with me this time into Arcadia, Baxter. For how long, sir? Probably a week. Very good, sir. It is now half past three. I must be back in Dappermere at eight. Take your time. I'll go down to look at the machine. Just lock the place up, and uh, don't forget the black bag. Some ten minutes later, the great racing car set out on its journey, with Bellew at the wheel and Baxter beside him, with his black bag held firmly upon his knee. Their process was necessarily slow at first, on account of the crowded thoroughfares. But every now and then the long, low car would shoot forward through some gap in the traffic, grazing the hubs of bus wheels, dodging hansoms, shaving sudden corners in an apparently reckless manner. But Baxter, with his hand always upon the black leather bag, sat calm and unruffled, since he knew by long experience that Bellew's eye was quick and true, and his hand firm and sure upon the wheel. Over Westminster Bridge and along the old Kent Road they sped, now fast, now slow, threading a tortuous and difficult way amid the myriad vehicles, and so, betimes, they reached Blackheath. And now the powerful machine hummed over that ancient road that had aforetime shaken to the tread of stalwart Roman legionaries, up Shooter's Hill and down, and so into the open country. And ever as they went, they talked, and not as master and servant, but as between man and man. Wherefore Baxter the valet became merged and lost in Baxter the human, the honest John of the old days, a grey-haired, kindly-eyed, middle-aged cosmopolitan who listened to and looked at young Alcides beside him, as he had indeed been the Master George of years ago. So you see, John, if all things do go well with me, we should probably take a trip to the Mediterranean. In the uh, Sylvia, of course, Master George. Yes, though, I've decided to change her name, John. Ah, very natural under the circumstances, Master George. 
said honest John, his eyes twinkling slyly as he spoke. Now, if I might suggest a new name, it would be hard to find a more original one than the haunting spectre of the Bosch John. There never was such a thing. You were quite right, as I said before. And by heaven, potato sacks. Uh, what, uh, potato sacks, Master George? They had been climbing a long, winding ascent, but now, having reached the top of the hill, they overtook a great lumbering market cart, or wain, piled high with sacks of potatoes, and driven by an extremely surly-faced man in a smock-frock. "'Hello there,' cried Bedew, slowing up. "'How much for one of your potato sacks?' "'You don't know,' growled the surly-faced man, in a tone as surly as he looked. "'Can't you see they're all occupied?' "'Well, empty one.' "'You don't know,' repeated the man. "'Scowling blacker than ever. "'I'll give you a sovereign for one.' "'Ah, don't try to come none of your jokes with me, young fella. "'growled the carter. "'Sovereign? Bah! Show us!' "'Here it is,' said Banyu, holding up the coin in question. "'Catch!' "'And with a word he tossed it up to the carter, "'who caught it very dexterously, "'looked at it, bit it, rubbed it on his sleeve, "'rang it upon the footboard of his wagon, "'bit it again, and finally pocketed it. "'It's a go, sir,' he nodded his skull vanishing as by magic. As he spoke, he turned, seized the nearest sack, and forthwith sent a cascade of potatoes rolling and bounding all over the road. Which done, he folded up the sack and handed it down to Bellew, who thrust it under the seat, nodded, and throwing in the clutch, set off down the road. But long after the car had hummed itself out of sight and the dust of its going had subsided, the carter sat staring after it, open-mouthed. If Baxter wondered at this purchase, he said nothing. Only he bent his gaze thoughtfully upon the black leather bag that he held upon his knee. On they sped between fragrant hedges, under whispering trees, past lonely cottages and farmhouses, past gate and field and wood, until the sun grew low. At last, Bedew stopped the automobile at a place where a narrow lane or cart track branched off from the high road and wound away between great trees. "'I leave you here,' said he, as he sprang from the car. "'This is Dathomir. The farmhouse lies over the upland yonder, though you can't see it because of the trees.' Uh, "'Is it far, Master George? About half a mile. Here is the bag, sir, but do you think it is quite safe?' "'Safe, John. Under the circumstances, Master George, I think it would be advisable to, to take this with you.' And he held out a small revolver. Bedew laughed and shook his head. Oh, such things aren't necessary here in Arcadia, John. Besides, I have my stick. So good-bye for the present. You'll stay at the King's Head, remember? Uh, good night, Master George, sir. Good night, and good fortune go with you. Thank you, said Bellew, and reached out his hand. I think we'll shake on that, John. So they clasped hands, and Bellew turned and set off along the grassy lane. And presently, as he went, he heard the hum of a car grow rapidly fainter and fainter, until it was lost in the quiet of the evening. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 25 The Conspirators The shadows were creeping down, and evening was approaching, as Bellew took his way along that winding lane that led to the house of Dathomir. Had there been anyone to see, which there was not, they might have noticed something almost furtive in his manner of approach, for he walked always under the trees where the shadows lay thickest, and paused once or twice to look about him warily. Being come within sight of the house, he turned aside, and, forcing his way through a gap in the hedge, came by a roundabout course to the farmyard. Here, after some search, he discovered a spade, the which, having discarded his stick, he took upon his shoulder, and with a black leather bag tucked under his arm, crossed the paddock with the same degree of caution, and so at last reached the orchard. On he went, always in the shadow, until at length he paused beneath the mighty knotted branches of King Arthur. Never did conspirator glance about him with sharper eyes, or hearken with keener ears than did George Bellew, or conspirator number one, where he now stood beneath the protecting shadow of King Arthur, or conspirator number two, as, having unfolded the potato sack, he opened the black leather bag. The moon was rising broad and yellow, but it was low as yet, and King Arthur stood in impenetrable gloom, as any other thoroughgoing, self-respecting conspirator should. 
And now, all at once, from this particular patch of shadow, there came a sudden sound, a rushing sound, a chinking, clinking, metallic sound. And thereafter, a crisp rustling that was not the rustling of ordinary paper. And now conspirator number one rises and ties the mouth of the sack with string he had brought with him for the purpose, and, setting down the sack, bulky now and heavy by conspirator number two, takes up the spade and begins to dig. And in a while, having made an excavation, not very deep, to be sure, but sufficient to his purpose, he deposits the sack within, covers it with soil, treads it down, and, replacing the torn sod, carefully pats it down with the flat of his spade. Which thing accomplished, conspirator number one wipes his brow, and, stepping forth of the shadow, consults his watch with anxious eye, and thereupon smiles. Surely a singularly pleasing smile for the lips of an arch-conspirator to wear. Thereafter he takes up the black bag, empty now, shoulders the spade, and sets off, keeping once more in the shadows, leaving conspirator number two to guard their guilty secret. Now, as conspirator number one goes his shady way, he keeps his look directed towards the rising moon, and thus he almost runs into one who also stands amid the shadows, and whose gaze is likewise fixed upon the moon. "'Ah, Mr. Bellew!' exclaims a drawling voice, and Squire's Cassillis turns to regard him with his usual supercilious smile. Indeed, Squire Cassillis seems to be even more self-satisfied and smiling than ordinary tonight, or at least Bellew imagines so. "'You are still agriculturally inclined, I see,' said Mr. Cassillis, nodding towards the spade. "'Though it's rather a queer time to choose for digging, isn't it?' "'Not at all, sir, not at all,' returned Bellew solemnly. "'The moon is very nearly the fool, you will perceive.' "'Well, sir, and what of that?' "'When the moon is at the fool, or nearly so, I generally dig, sir. "'That is to say, circumstances permitting.' "'Really?' said Mr. Cassillis, beginning to caress his moustache. "'It seems to me that you have a very peculiar taste, Mr. Bellew. "'That is because you have probably never experienced the fierce joys of moonlight digging, sir.' "'No, Mr. Bellew, digging as a recreation has never appealed to me at any time.' "'Then, sir,' said Bellew, shaking his head, "'permit me to tell you that you have missed a great deal. "'Had I the time, I should be delighted to explain to you exactly how much. "'As it is, allow me to wish you a very good evening.' Mr. Cassillis smiled, and his teeth seemed to gleam whiter and sharper than ever in the moonlight. "'Wouldn't it be rather more apropos if you said good-bye, Mr. Bellew?' he inquired. "'You are leaving Dapplemere shortly, I understand, aren't you?' "'Why, sir,' returned Bellew, grave and imperturbable as ever, "'it all depends.' "'Depends. Upon what, may I ask?' "'The moon, sir.' Uh, "'The moon?' "'Precisely.' "'And pray, what can the moon have to do with your departure?' "'A great deal more than you'd think, sir. "'Had I the time, I should be delighted to explain to you exactly how much.' As it is, permit me to wish you a very good evening. Saying which, Bellew nodded affably, and shouldering his spade, went upon his way. And still he walked in the shadows, and still he gazed upon the moon, but now his thick brows were gathered in a frown, and he was wondering just why Cassidus had charged to be here tonight, and what his confident air and the general assurance of his manner might portend. Above all, he was wondering how Mr. Cassillis came to be aware of his own impending departure. And so at last he came to the rickyard, full of increasing doubt and misgivings. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 26 How the Money Moon Rose Evening had deepened into night, a night of ineffable calm, a night of an all-pervading quietude. A horse snorted in the stable nearby, a dog barked in the distance, but these sounds served only to render the silence the more profound by contrast. It was indeed a night wherein pixies and elves and goblins and fairies might weave their magic spells, a night wherein tired humanity dreamed those dreams that seemed so hopelessly impossible by day and over all the moon rose high and higher in solemn majesty, filling the world with her pale loveliness and brooding over it like the gentle goddess she is. Even the distant dog seemed to feel something of all this, 
for after a futile bark or two he gave it up altogether and was heard no more. And Bellew, gazing up at Luna's pale serenity, smiled and nodded, as much as to say, you'll do, and so stood leaning upon his spade, listening to that deep hush which seems a sigh breathed by earth to listening sky. Now all at once upon this quietude there rose a voice upraised in fervent supplication. Wherefore, treading very softly, Bellew came and, peeping round the hayrick, beheld small porges upon his knees. He was equipped for travel and the perils of the road, for beside him lay a stick, and tied to this stick was a bundle that bulged with his most cherished possessions. His cheeks were wet with great tears that glistened in the moonbeams, but he wept with eyes tight shut and with his small hands clasped close together. And thus he spoke, albeit much shaken and hindered by sobs. "'I suppose you think I bother you an awful lot, dear Lord, and so I do, but you haven't sent the money moon yet, you see, and now my Auntie Anthea's got to leave Dapomir, if I don't find the fortune for her soon. I know I'm crying a lot, and real men don't cry, but it's only because I'm awful lonely and disappointed, and nobody can see me, so it doesn't matter. But, dear Lord, I've looked and looked everywhere, and I haven't found a single sovereign yet, and I've prayed to you and prayed to you for the money moon, and it's never come. So now, dear Lord, I'm, I'm going to Africa, and I want you to please take care of my Auntie Anthea till I come back. Sometimes I'm afraid my prayers can't quite manage to get up to you because of the clouds and wind, but tonight there isn't any, so if they do reach you, please, oh, please let me find the fortune. If you don't mind, let him come back to me, dear Lord. I mean my Uncle Porges, you know. That, that's all, dear Lord. So amen. As the prayer ended, Bellew stole back and coming to the gate of the rickyard, leaned there, waiting. Presently, as he watched, he saw a small figure emerge from behind the big haystack and come striding manfully towards him, his bundle upon his shoulder and with the moon bright in his curls. But all at once, small porches saw him and stopped, and the stick and bundle fell to the ground and lay neglected. "'Why, my porches!' said Bellew, a trifle huskily, perhaps. "'Why, shipmate!' and he held out his hands. Then Small Porges uttered a cry and came running, and next moment Big Porges had him in his arms. "'Oh, Uncle Porges, then you, then you have come back to me.' "'Aye, aye, shipmate.' "'Why, then, my prayers did reach.' "'Why, of course, prayers always reach, my Porges. "'Then, oh, uh, do you suppose I shall find the fortune, too?' "'Not a doubt of it. Just look at the moon.' "'The moon? Why, haven't you noticed how uh, peculiar it is tonight?' "'Peculiar?' repeated Small Porges breathlessly, turning to look at it. "'Why, yes, my Porges, uh, uh, big, you know, and uh, uh, yellow, like um, uh, like a very large sovereign.' "'Do you mean—oh, do you mean it's the—' But here Small Porges choked suddenly, and could only look his question. "'The money moon? Oh, yes, there she is at last, my Porges. Take a good look at her. I don't suppose we shall ever see another.' Small Porges stood very still, and gazed up at the moon's broad yellow disk and as he looked the tears welled up in his eyes again, and a great sob broke from him. I, I, "'I'm so glad,' he whispered, "'so awful glad!' Then suddenly he dashed away his tears and slipped his small, trembling hand into Bellew's. "'Quick, Uncle Porteous,' said he, "'Mr. Grimes is coming tonight, you know, and, and we must find the money in time. Where shall we look first? "'Well, I guess the orchard will do, to, to start with.' "'Then let's go, now.' "'But we shall need a couple of spades, shipmate.' "'Oh, must we dig?' "'Yes, I fancy that a, a, a digging moon, my porges, from the look of it. "'Ah, there's a spade, nice and handy. "'You take that, and I'll uh, I'll manage with this pitchfork.' "'But you can't dig with a—' oh, "'Well, you can do the digging, and I'll uh, just prod, you know. "'Ready? Then heave ahead, shipmate.' "'So they set out, hand in hand, spade and pitchfork on shoulder, "'and presently were come to the orchard.' "'Awful big place to dig up a fortune in,' said Small Porges, glancing about. "'Where do you suppose we'd better begin?' "'Well, shipmate, between you and me and the pitchfork here, "'I rather fancy King Arthur knows more than most people would think. "'Anyway, we'll try him. "'You dig on that side, and I'll uh, prod on this.' "'Saying which, Bellew pointed to a certain spot "'where the grass looked somewhat uneven and peculiarly bumpy, "'and bidding Small Porges get to work, went round to the other side of the great tree. Being there, he took out his pipe, purely from force of habit, 
and stood with it clenched in his teeth, listening to the scrape of small porges' spade. Presently he heard a cry, a panting, breathless cry, but full of a joy unspeakable. "'I've got it! Oh, Uncle Porges, I've found it!' Small Porges was down upon his knees, pulling and tugging at a sack he had partially unearthed, and which, with Bellew's aid, he dragged forth into the moonlight. In the twinkling of an eye the string was cut, and plunging in a hand a small porges brought up a fistful of shining sovereigns, and among them a crumpled banknote. It is, it's, it's, it's all right, Uncle Porges, he nodded, his voice all of a quaver. It, it, it's all right now. I, I've found the fortune I've prayed for. Gold, you know, and banknotes in a sack. Everything will be all right again now. While he spoke, he rose to his feet, and lifting the sack with an effort, swung it across his shoulder, and set off towards the house. "'Is it heavy, shipmate?' "'Awful heavy,' he panted. "'But I don't mind that. It's gold, you see.' And as they crossed the rose garden, Bailey laid a restraining hand upon his shoulder. "Porges," said he, "'where is your Auntie Anthea?' "'In the drawing-room, waiting for Mr. Grimes.' "'Then uh, come this way.' and turning, bid you led small porges up and along the terrace. Now, my porges, he admonished him, when we come to the drawing-room windows, they're open, you see, I want you to hide with me in the shadows and wait until I give you the word. Aye, aye, Captain, panted small porges. When I say heave ahead, shipmate, why then you will take your treasure upon your back and march straight into the room. Do you understand? Aye, aye, Captain. Why then, come on, and mum's the word. Very cautiously they approached the long French windows and paused in the shadow of a great rose-bush nearby. From where he stood, Betty could see Anthea and Miss Priscilla, and between them, sprawling in an easy chair, was Grimes, while Adam, hat in hand, scowled in the background. "'All I can say is I'm very sorry for ye, Miss Anthea,' Grimes was saying. "'Aye, that I am. But lads, you've took it so well. No crying, nor nonsense.' Here he turned to look at Miss Priscilla, whose everlasting sewing had fallen to her feet and lay there all unnoticed, while her tearful eyes were fixed upon Anthea, standing white-faced beside her. "'And when, uh, when shall ye be ready to, uh, to, to leave, to, to vacate Dappermere, Miss Anthea?' Grimes went on. "'Not as I mean to hurry you, mind. I should like you to uh, name a day.' Now, as Betty watched, he saw Anthea's lips move, but no sound came. Miss Priscilla saw also, and catching the nerveless hand, drew it to her bosom and wept over it. "'Come, come,' expostulated Grimes, jingling the money in his pockets. "'Come, come, Miss Anthea, ma'am. All as I am asking you is, uh, when? All as I want you to do is—' But here Adam, who had been screwing and wringing at his hat, now stepped forward, and tapping Grimes upon the shoulder, pointed to the door. "'Mr. Grimes,' said he, "'Miss Anthea's told ye as all as you can come here to find out. She's told ye she can't pay. So now, suppose you go. All I want to know is when she'll be ready to move, and I ain't a-going till I do, so you get out of my way. Suppose you go, repeated Adam. Get out of my way, do you hear? Because, Adam went on, if you don't go, Mr. Grimes, the old Adam be arising inside of me to that degree as I shall be forced to catch you by the collar of your jacket and heave you out, Mr. Grimes, sir. So suppose you go. Hereupon, Mr. Grimes rose, put on his hat, and, muttering to himself, stamped indignantly from the room, and Adam, shutting the door upon him, turned to Miss Anthea, who stood white-lipped and dry-eyed, while gentle little Miss Priscilla fondled her listless hand. "'Don't don't look that way, Miss Anthea,' said Adam. "'I'd rather see you cry than look so. It'd be hard to have to let the old place go, but—' "'Heave away, shipmate,' whispered Bellew. Obedient to his command, Small Porges, with his burden upon his back, ran forward and stumbled into the room. "'It's all right, Auntie Anthea,' he cried. "'I've got the fortune for you. I've found the money I prayed for. Here it is! Here it is!' The sack fell jingling to the floor, and next moment he had poured a heap of shining gold and crumpled banknotes at Anthea's feet. For a moment no one moved. Then, with a strange hoarse cry, Adam had flung himself down upon his knees and caught up a great handful of the gold. Then, while Miss Priscilla sobbed with her arms about small porges, and Anthea stared down at the treasure wide-eyed, and with her hands pressed down upon her heart, Adam gave a sudden great laugh, and springing up, came running out through the window, never spying Bedew in his haste, 
and shouting as he ran. Grimes, he roared. Oh, Grimes, come back and be paid. Come back, we've had our little joke with you. Now come back and be paid. Then at last Anthea's stony calm was broken. Her bosom heaved with tempestuous sobs. The next moment she had thrown herself upon her knees and had clasped her arms about small porges and Aunt Priscilla, mingling kisses with her tears. As for Bellew, he turned away, and treading a familiar path, found himself beneath the shadow of King Arthur. Therefore he sat down, and lighting his pipe, stared up at the glory of the full-orbed moon. Happiness, said he, speaking his thought aloud, happiness shall come riding astride the full moon. Now, I wonder. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 27, in which it is verified the adage of the cup and the lip. Now as he sat thus, plunged in thought, he heard the voice of one who approached intoning a familiar chant or refrain. The voice was harsh, albeit not unmusical, and the words of the chant were these. When I am dead, diddle diddle, as well may hap, bury me deep, diddle diddle, under the tap, under the tap, diddle diddle. I'll tell you, Lord," exclaimed the singer, breaking off suddenly. "Be that you, Mister Bellew, sir?" "Yes, in good sooth, Adam, the very same." "But you sing, Adam?" Sir, "I sing, Mister Bellew, sir. And if you ask me why, then I'll tell you because I be happy-hearted and full of J O Y joy, sir. The mortgage be paid off at last, Mister Bellew, sir." Miss Anthea be out of debt, free, sir, and all along old Master Georgie, God bless him. Oh, said Bellew, that, that, that's good. Good, exclaimed Adam. Ah, oh, Mr. Bellew, sir, be more than good. It saved Miss Anthea's home for us, sir, and betwixt you and me, I think it saved her too. And it be all along, though, that Master Georgie. Lord, sir, many's the time as I've watched that there blessed boy a-seeking and a-searching, a-poking and a-prying round the place and looking for his fortune. But Lord bless my eyes and limbs, sir. I never thought as he'd find nothing. Why, of course not, Adam. Why, but that's just where I mistook, Mr. Bellew, sir, because he did. Did what, Adam? Found the fortune, as we were always looking for. A sack of golden sovereigns, sir, and banknotes, Mr. Bellew, sir. Bushes on them. Enough, and more than enough to pay off that mortgage and to send that their old grimes about his business. And away from Dapplemere for good and all, sir. So, Grimes is really paid off, then, is he, Adam? I done it myself, sir, with these here two hands. Three thousand pound I counted over to him, and five hundred more in banknotes, sir. Well, Miss Anthea sat by like one in a dream. Altogether there were five thousand pounds that blessed boy dug up out of the orchard, done all up in a potato sack, under this very identical tree as you're setting under, Mr. Bellew, sir. He <laughs> God, I'd be half-minded to take a shovel and have a try at fortune hunting myself. Only there ain't much chance of finding another hereabouts. Besides, I prayed for that fortune of long and hard he prayed, Mr. Bellew, sir, and tricks you and me, sir, I ain't been much of a prayer myself since me old mother died. Anyhow, the mortgage be paid off, sir, Miss Anthea's free, and tis joyful and happy-hearted I be this night. Prudence and me be getting married soon now, and when I think of her cooking, oh, Mr. Bellew, sir, all as I say is God bless Master Georgie. Good night, sir. And may your dreams be as happy as mine. Always supposing I do dream, which is seldom. Good night, sir. Long after Adam's cheery whistle had died away, Bedu sat, pipe in mouth, staring up at the moon. At length, however, he rose and turned his steps towards the house. Mr. Bedu? He started, and turning, saw Anthea standing amid her roses. For a moment they looked upon each other in silence, as though each dreaded to speak. Then suddenly she turned and broke a great rose from its stem and stood twisting it between her fingers. "'Why did you do it?' she asked. "'Do it?' he repeated. "'I mean, the fortune. Georgie told me how you helped him to find it, and I know how it came there, of course, but why did you do it?' "'You didn't tell him how it came there?' asked Bellew anxiously. "'No,' she answered. "'I think it would break his heart if he knew.' "'And I think it would have broken his heart if he had never found it,' said Bellew. "'And I couldn't let that happen, could I?' Anthea did not answer, and he saw that her eyes were very bright in the shadow of her lashes 
as she kept them lowered to the rose in her fingers. "'Anthea,' said he suddenly, and reached out his hand to her. But she started and drew from his touch. "'Don't,' she said, speaking almost in a whisper. "'Don't touch me. Oh, I know you've paid off the mortgage. You have brought back my home for me as you brought back my furniture. Why? Why? I was nothing to you or you to me. Why have you laid me under this obligation? You know I can never hope to return your money. Why? Why did you do it?' "'Because I love you, Anthea, have loved you from the first. "'Because everything I possess in this world is yours, even as I am. "'You forget,' she broke in proudly, "'you forget. "'Everything but my love for you, Anthea, "'everything but that I want you for my wife. "'I'm not much of a fellow, I know, "'but could you learn to love me enough to marry me some day, Anthea? "'Would you have dared to say this to me before tonight? "'before your money had brought back the roof over my head? "'Oh, haven't I been humiliated enough? You, "'You've you taken from me the only thing I had left, "'my independence, stolen it from me. "'Hadn't I been shamed enough?' "'Now, as she spoke, she saw that his eyes were grown suddenly big and fierce, "'and in that moment her hands were caught in his powerful clasp. "'Let me go!' she cried. "'No,' said he, shaking his head, "'not until you tell me if you... "'Love me. Speak, Anthea. Loose my hands.' She threw up her head proudly, and her eyes gleamed and her cheeks flamed with sudden anger. "'Loose me,' she repeated. Bellioni shook his head, and his chin seemed rather more prominent than usual, as he answered. "'Tell me that you love me, or that you hate me. Whichever it is, but until you do—' "'You hurt me,' said she. And then, as his fingers relaxed, with a sudden passionate cry, she had broken free, but even so he caught and swept her up in his arms and held her close against his breast. And now, feeling the hopelessness of further struggle, she lay passive, while her eyes flamed up into his, and his eyes looked down into hers. Her long, thick hair had come loose, and now, with a sudden quick gesture, she drew it across her face, veiling it from him, wherefore he stooped his head above those lustrous tresses. Anthea, he murmured and the masterful voice was strangely hesitating, and the masterful arms about her were wonderfully gentle. Anthea, do you love me? Lower he bent, and lower, until his lips touched her hair, until beneath that fragrant veil his mouth sought and found hers. And in that breathless moment he felt them quiver responsive to his caress. And then he'd set her down, she was free, and he was looking at her with a new-found radiance in his eyes. "'Anthea,' he said wonderingly, "'why, then, you do?' But as he spoke, she hid her face in her hands. "'Anthea,' he repeated. "'Oh,' she whispered, "'I hate you, despise you. "'Oh, you should be paid back every penny, every farthing, very soon. "'Next week I marry Mr. Cassillis.' And so she turned and fled away, and left him standing there amid the roses. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 28 Which tells how Bellew left Dapplemere in the dawn. Far in the east a grey streak marked the advent of another day, and upon all things was a solemn hush, a great and awful stillness that was like the stillness of death. The earth was a place of gloom and mist, where spectral shadows writhed and twisted and flitted under a frowning heaven, and out of the gloom there came a breath, sharp and damp and exceeding chill. Therefore, as Bellew gazed down from the frowning heaven to the gloom of earth below, with its ever-moving misty shapes, he shivered involuntarily. In another hour it would be day, and with the day the gates of Arcadia would open for his departure, and he must go forth to become once more a wanderer, going up and down and to and fro in the world until his course was run. And yet it was worth having lived for, this one golden month, and in all his wanderings needs must he carry with him the memory of her who had taught him how deep and high, how wide and infinitely far-reaching that thing called love may really be. And to Porges, 
dear, quaint, small porges. Where under heaven could he ever find again such utter faith, such pure, unaffected loyalty and devotion, as throbbed within that small, warm heart? How could he ever bid good-bye to loving, eager, still, small porges? And then there was Miss Priscilla, and the strong, gentle sergeant, and Peter Day, and sturdy Adam, and Prudence, and the rosy-cheeked maids. How well they all suited this wonderful Arcadia! Yes, indeed he, and he only, had been out of place, and so he must go, back to the everyday, matter-of-fact world. And how could he ever say good-bye to faithful, loving, small porges? Far in the east, the grey streak had brightened and broadened, and was already tinged with a faint pink that deepened and deepened as he watched. Bellew had seen the glory of many a sunrises in divers wild places of the earth, and hitherto had always felt deep within him the responsive thrill, the exhilaration of hope newborn, and joyful expectation of the great unknown future. But now he watched the varying hues of pink and scarlet and saffron and gold with gloomy brow and sombre eyes. Now, presently, the blackbird who lived in the apple tree beneath his window, the tree of the inquisitive turn of mind, this blackbird fellow, opening a drowsy eye, must needs give vent to a croak, very hoarse and feeble. Then, apparently having yawned prodigiously and stretched himself, wing and leg, he tried a couple of notes, in a hesitating, tentative sort of fashion, shook himself, repeated the two notes, tried three, found them mellower, and more what the waiting world very justly expected of him. Grew more confident, tried four, tried five, grew perfectly assured, and so burst forth into the full golden melody of his morning song. Then Bellew, leaning out from his casement, as the first bright beams of the rising sun gilded the topmost leaves of the tree, thus apostrophised the unseen singer. I suppose you will be piping away down in your tree there, old fellow, long after Arcadia has faded out of my life. Well, it'll be only natural and perfectly right, of course. She will be here, and may perhaps stop to listen to you. Now, if somehow you can manage to compose for me a song of memory, some evening when I'm gone, some evening when she happens to be sitting idle and watching the moon rise over the upland yonder, if at such a time you could just manage to remind her of me, why, I thank you. And so, good-bye, old fellow. Saying which, Bellew turned from the window, and took up a certain bulging, bestrapped portmanteau, while the blackbird, having evidently hearkened to his request with much grave attention, fell a-singing more gloriously than ever. Meanwhile Bellew descended the great wide stair, soft of foot and cautious of step, yet pausing once to look towards a certain closed door, and so presently let himself out into the dawn. The dew sparkled in the grass, it hung in glittering jewels from every leaf and twig, while now and then a shining drop would fall upon him as he passed, like a great tear. Now, as he reached the orchard, up rose the sun in all his majesty, filling the world with the splendour of his coming, before whose kindly beams the skulking mists and shadows shrank affrighted, and fled utterly away. This morning King Arthur wore his grandest robes of state, for his mantle of green was thick-sown with a myriad flaming gems, very different he looked from that dark, shrouded giant who had so lately been conspirator number two. Yet, perhaps for this very reason, Bellew paused to lay a hand upon his mighty rugged hull, and doing so, turned and looked back at the house of Dapomir. And truly, never had the old house seemed so beautiful, so quaint and peaceful as now. Its every stone and beam had become familiar, and as he looked, seemed to find an individuality of its own, the very lattices seemed to look back at him, like so many wistful eyes. Therefore, George Bellew, American citizen, millionaire, traveller, explorer, and lover, sighed as he turned away, sighed as he strode on through the green and golden morning, and resolutely looked back no more. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 29 of The Moon's Message to Small Porges, and how he told it to Bellew in a whisper. Bellew walked on at a good pace, with his back turned resolutely towards the house of Dapplemere, and thus, as he swung into that narrow grassy lane that wound away between trees, he 
he was much surprised to hear a distant hail. Facing sharp about, he espied a diminutive figure whose small legs trotted very fast and whose small fist waved a weather-beaten cap. Bellew's first impulse was to turn and run, but Bellew rarely acted on impulse. Therefore he set down the bulging portmanteau, seated himself upon it, and, taking out pipe and tobacco, waited for his pursuer to come up. "'Oh, uh, Uncle Porges,' panted a voice, "'you did walk so awful fast, and I called and called, but you never heard. And now, please, where are you going?' "'Going,' said Bellew, searching through his pockets for a match. "'Going, my porges, why, uh, for a stroll, to be sure. "'Just a walk before breakfast, you know. "'But, but then, wh why have you brought your bag?' "'Bag?' repeated Bellew, stooping down to look at it. "'Why, so I have.' "'Please, why?' persisted small porges, suddenly anxious. "'Why did you bring it?' "'Well, I expect it was to, uh, to bear me company. "'But how is it you are out so very early, my porges?' "'Why, I couldn't sleep last night, you know, "'cause I kept on thinking and thinking about the fortune. "'So I got up in the middle of the night "'and dressed myself and sat in the big chair by the window "'and looked at the money moon. "'And I stared at it and stared at it "'till a wonderful thing happened. "'And what do you suppose?' "'I don't know. "'Well, all at once, while I stared up at it, "'the moon changed itself into a great big face. "'But I didn't mind a bit, "'cause it was a very nice sort of face, "'rather like a gnome's face, "'only without the beard, you know.' when I looked at it, it talked to me, and it told me a lot of things, and that's how I know that you are going away, because you are, you know, aren't you? Why, my porges, said Bellew, fumbling with his pipe. Why, shipmate, uh, uh, since you ask me, I am. Yes, I was afraid the moon was right, said small porges, and turned away. But Bellew had seen the stricken look in his eyes, therefore he took small porges in the circle of his big arm, and holding him thus, explained to him, how that in this great world each of us must walk his appointed way, and that there must and always will be partings, but that also there must and always shall be meetings. And so, my porges, if we have to say good-bye now, the sooner we shall meet again, some day, somewhere. A small porges only sighed and shook his head in hopeless dejection. Does she know you're going? I mean my Auntie Anthea? Oh, yes, she knows, porges. "'Then I suppose that's why she was crying so in the night.' "'Crying? "'Yes, she's cried an awful lot lately, hasn't she? "'Last night, when I woke up, you know, and couldn't sleep, "'I went into her room, and she was crying, "'with her face hidden in the pillow, and her hair all about her.' "'Crying?' "'Yes, and she said she wished she was dead. "'So then, of course, I tried to comfort her, you know. "'And she said, "'I'm a dreadful failure, Georgie, dear, with the farm and everything else. "'I've tried to be a father and mother to you, and I've failed in that, too.' "'So now I'm going to give you a real father.' "'And she told me she was going to marry Mr. Cassillis. "'But I said no, because I'd arranged for her to marry you "'and live happy ever after. "'But she got awful angry again and said she'd never marry you "'if you were the last man in the world, because she despised you so.' "'And that would seem to settle it,' nodded Bellew gloomily. "'So it's good-bye, my porges. "'We may as well shake hands now and get it over.' "'And Bellew rose from the portmanteau.' and sighing, held out his hand. "'Oh, but wait a minute!' cried Small Porges eagerly. "'I haven't told you what the moon said to me last night.' "'Ah, to be sure, we were forgetting that,' said Bellia, with an absent look, and a trifle wearily. "'Why, then, please sit down again, so I can speak into your ear, "'cause what the moon told me to tell you was a secret, you know.' So perforce, Bellia reseated himself upon his portmanteau, and drawing Small Porges close, bent his head down to the anxious little face. And so Small Porges told him exactly what the moon had said. And the moon's message, whatever it was, seemed to be very short and concise, as all really important messages should be. But these few words had a wondrous and magical effect upon George Bellew. For a moment he stared wide-eyed at Small Porges, like one awaking from a dream. Then the gloom vanished from his brow, and he sprang to his feet, and being upon his feet, he smote his clenched fist down into the palm of his hand with a resounding smack. "'By heaven!' he exclaimed, and took a turn to and fro across the width of the lane, and seeing small porges watching him, caught him suddenly up in his arms and hugged him. "'And the moon will be at the full to-night,' said he. Thereafter he sat down upon his portmanteau again, with small porges upon his knee, and they talked confidentially together with their heads very close together and in muffled tones. When at last Bellew rose, his eyes were bright and eager, 
and his square chin prominent and grimly resolute. "'So you quite understand, my Porges? "'Yes, yes, oh, I understand. "'Where the little bridge spans the brook. "'The trees are thicker there.' "'Aye, aye, Captain. "'Then fare thee well, shipmate. "'Good-bye, my Porges, and remember.' "'So they clasped hands very solemnly, "'big Porges and small Porges, "'and turned each his appointed way, "'the one up, the other down, the lane. "'But lo, as they went, "'small Porges' tears were banished quite, and Bellew strode upon his way, his head held high, his shoulders squared, like one in whom hope has been new-born. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 30 How Anthea Gave Her Promise And so he is... "'Really gone?' Miss Priscilla sighed as she spoke, and looked up from her needlework to watch Anthea, who sat biting her pen and frowning down at the blank sheet of paper before her. "'And so he is really gone?' "'Who, Mr. Bellion? Oh, yes.' "'He went very early.' "'Yes. And without any breakfast.' "'That was his own fault,' said Anthea. "'Without even saying good-bye.' "'Perhaps he was in a hurry.' "'Anthea suggested. "'Oh, dear me, no, my dear. "'I don't believe Mr. Bellew was ever in a hurry in all his life.' "'No,' said Anthea, giving her pen a vicious bite. "'I don't believe he ever was. "'He's always so hatefully placid and deliberate.' "'And here she bit her pen again. "'Eh, my dear?' exclaimed Miss Priscilla, "'pausing with her needle in mid-air. "'Did you say hatefully?' "'Yes.' "'Anthea? "'I hate him, Aunt Priscilla.' Ah, my dear, that was why I sent him away. You sent him away? Yes. But, Anthea, why? Oh, Aunt Priscilla, surely you never believed in the fortune? Surely you guessed it was his money that paid back the mortgage? Didn't you, Aunt? Didn't you? Well, my dear, but then he, he did it so very tactfully, and, and I'd hoped, my dear, that, that I should marry him and settle the obligation that way, perhaps. "'Well, yes, my dear, I, I did hope so. "'Oh, I'm going to marry... "'Then why did you send... "'I'm going to marry Mr. Cassillis whenever he pleases. "'Anthea!' "'The word was a cry, "'and her needlework slipped from Miss Priscilla's nerveless fingers. "'He asked me to write and tell him if I ever I changed my mind. "'Oh, my dear, my dear!' cried Miss Priscilla, "'reaching out imploring hands. "'You never mean it!' "'You are distraught today, tired, and worn out with worry and loss of sleep. "'Wait!' "'Wait!' repeated Anthea bitterly. "'For what?' "'To marry him. "'Oh, Anthea, you never meant it. "'Think, think what you are doing.' "'I thought of it all last night, Aunt Priscilla, "'and all this morning, and I, I have made up my mind.' "'You mean to write?' "'Yes.' "'To tell Mr. Cassidus that you will marry him?' "'Yes.' But now Miss Priscilla rose, and next moment was kneeling beside Anthea's chair. "'Oh, my dear,' she pleaded, "'you that I love like my own flesh and blood, don't! "'Oh, Anthea, don't do what can never be undone. "'Don't give your youth and beauty to one who can never, never make you happy. "'Oh, Anthea!' "'Dear Aunt Priscilla, I would rather marry one I don't love "'than have to live beholden all my days to a man that I hate.' Now, as she spoke, though her embrace was as ready and her hands as gentle as ever, yet Miss Priscilla saw that her proud face was set and stern. So she presently rose, sighing, and taking a little crutch stick, tapped dolefully away and left Anthea to write her letter. And now, hesitating no more, Anthea took up her pen and wrote. Surely a very short missive for a love letter. And when she had folded and sealed it, she tossed it aside, and laying her arms upon the table, hid her face with a long, shuddering sigh. In a little while she rose, and, taking up the letter, went out to find Adam. But remembering that he had gone to Cranbrook with small porches, she paused irresolute, and then turned her steps toward the orchard. Hearing voices, she stopped again, and, glancing about, espied the sergeant and Miss Priscilla. She had given both her hands into the sergeant's one great solitary fist, and he was looking down at her, and she was looking up at him, and upon the face of each was a great and shining joy. 
and seeing all this, Anthea felt herself very lonely all at once, and turning aside saw all things through a blur of sudden tears. She was possessed also of a sudden fierce loathing of the future, a horror because of the promise her letter contained. Nevertheless, she was firm and resolute on her course because of the pride that burned within her. So thus it was that as the sergeant presently came striding along on his homeward way, he was suddenly aware of Miss Anthea standing before him, whereupon he halted, and removing his hat, wished her a good afternoon. Sergeant, said she, would you do something for me? Anything you ask me, Miss Anthea, ma'am, ever and always. I want you to take this letter to Mr. Cassillis, will you? The sergeant hesitated unwontedly, turning his hat about and about in his hand. Finally he put it on, out of the way. Will you, sergeant? Since you ask me, Miss Anthea, ma'am, I will. Give it into his own hand. Miss Anthea, ma'am, I will. Thank you. Here it is, sergeant. And so she turned and was gone, leaving the sergeant staring down at the letter in his hand and shaking his head over it. Anthea walked on hastily, never looking behind, and so coming back to the house, threw herself down by the open window and stared out with unseeing eyes at the roses nodding slumbrous heads in the gentle breeze. So the irrevocable step was taken. She had given her promise to marry Cassidus whenever he would, and must abide by it. Too late now, any hope of retreat, she had deliberately chosen her course, and must follow it to the end. Begging your pardon, Miss Anthea, ma'am. She started, and glancing round, spied Adam. Oh, you startled me, Adam. What is it? Begging your pardon, Miss Anthea, but is it true as Mr. Bellew be gone away, for good? Yes, Adam. Why, then, all I can say is, as, as I'm sorry. Ah, uh, mortal sorry I be, and my heart, ma'am, my heart likewise gloomy. Were you so fond of him, Adam? Well, Miss Anthea, considering as he were the best, good naturedest, properest kind of gentleman as ever was, when I tell you as over and above all this, he could use his fist better than any man as ever I see, him having knocked me down into a dry ditch, though to be sure I likewise drawed his claret. Begging your pardon, I'm sure, Miss Anthea. What of what happened on account of me finding him a sleeping in your air, ma'am? When I tell you furthermore, as he treated me ever as a man, and weren't no ways above shaking me hand or smoking a pipe with me, sociable-like, when I tell you as he were the finest gentleman and properest man as ever I knowed, or heard tell on, why, well, I think is the word fond to be about the size of it, Miss Anthea, ma'am. Saying which... Adam nodded several times, and bestowed an emphatic backhanded knock to the crown of his hat. "'You used to sit together very often, under the big apple tree, didn't you, Adam?' "'Ah, oh, many, many a night, Miss Anthea.' "'Did he ever tell you much of his life, Adam?' "'Why, yes, Miss Anthea. Told me somewhat about his travels. Told me as he'd shot lions and tigers, way out in India and Africa.' "'Did he ever mention—' "'Well, Miss Anthea,' said he inquiringly, seeing she had paused. "'Did he ever speak of the lady he's going to marry?' "'Lady?' repeated Adam, giving a sudden twist to his hat. "'Yes, the lady who lives in London.' "'No, Miss Anthea,' answered Adam, screwing his hat tighter and tighter. "'Why, what do you mean?' "'I mean, as there never was no lady, Miss Anthea, "'neither up in London nor nowhere else, as I ever heard on.' "'But, oh, Adam, you told me.' "'Ah, for sure I told ye.' "'But it were a lie, Miss Anthea. "'Leastwise, it weren't the truth. "'You see, I were afraid as you'd refuse to take the money for the furniture, "'unless I make ye believe as he wanted it uncommon bad. "'So I haven't told ye as he bought it all on account of him being matrimonially took "'with a blonde lady up in London.' "'Then you went to him and warned him, "'told him of the story you had invented?' No, "'I did, Miss Anthea. First, I thought as he were going to up and give me one for myself.' But afterwards he took it very quiet and told me as I'd done quite right and agreed to play the game. That's all about it, and glad I am as to be off my mind at last. And now, Miss Anthea, ma'am, seeing you're that rich with Master George's fortune, why you can pay back for the furniture, if so be you're minded to. And I hope as you agree with me as I've done it all for the best, Miss Anthea. Here Adam unscrewed his hat and knocked out the wrinkles against his knee, which done he glanced at Anthea. "'Why, what is it, Miss Anthea?' "'Nothing, Adam. I, I haven't slept well lately, that's all.' "'Ah, well, you'll be all right again now. We all shall, now the mortgage be paid off. 
Shan't we, Miss Anthea?' "'Yes, Adam.' "'We had a great day over to Cranbrook, Master Georgie and me. He'd be in the kitchen now with Prudence, so eating a bread and jam. "'Good night, Miss Anthea, ma'am. If you should be wanting me again, I shall be in the stables. "'Good night, Miss Anthea.' So honest, well-meaning Adam touched his forehead with a square-ended finger and trudged away. But Anthea sat there, very still, with drooping head and vacant eyes. And so it was done. The irrevocable step had been taken. She had given her promise. So now, having chosen her course, she must follow it to the end. For in Arcadia it would seem that a promise is still a sacred thing. Now in a while, lifting her eyes, they encountered those of the smiling cavalier above the mantel. Then as she looked, she stretched out her arms with a sudden yearning gesture. Oh, she whispered, if I were only just a pitcher, like you. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 31 Which, being the last, is very properly the longest in the book. In those benighted days when men went abroad cased in steel, and upon very slight provocation were wont to smite each other with axes and clubs, to buffet and skewer each other with spears, lances, swords, and divers other barbarous engines. Yet in that dark and doughty age, ignorant though they were of all those smug maxims and excellent moralities with which we are so happily blessed, even in that unhallowed day when the solemn tread of the policeman's foot was all unknown, they had involved from themselves a code of rules whereby to govern their life and conduct. Amongst these it was tacitly agreed upon and understood that a spoken promise was a pledge and held to be a very sacred thing, and he who broke faith committed all the cardinal sins. Indeed, their laws were very few and simple, easily understood, and well calculated to govern man's conduct to his fellow. In this day of ours, ablaze with learning and culture, veneered with a fine civilization, our laws are complex beyond all knowing and expression. Man regulates his conduct to them, and is as virtuous and honest as the law compels him to be. This is the age of money, and therefore an irreverent age. It's also the age of respectability, with a very large R, and the policeman's bludgeon. But in Arcadia, because it is an old-world place where life follows an even, simple course, where money is as scarce as roguery, the old law still holds. A promise once given is a sacred obligation and not to be set aside. Even the blackbird who lived in the inquisitive apple tree understood and was aware of this. It had been born in him and had grown with his feathers. Therefore, though to be sure he had spoken no promise, signed no bond, nor affixed his mark to any agreement, Still he had, nevertheless, borne in mind a certain request preferred to him when the day was very young. Thus, with a constancy of purpose worthy of all imitation, he had given all his mind and thought to the composition of a song with a new theme. He had applied himself to it most industriously all day long, and now, as the sun began to set, he had at last corked it all out, every note, every quaver and trill, and perched upon a lookout branch he kept his bold, bright eye turned towards a certain rustic seat hard by, uttering a melodious note or two every now and then from pure impatience. And presently, sure enough, he spied her for whom he waited, the tall, long-limbed, supple-waisted creature, whose skin was pink and gold like the peaches and apricots in the garden, and with soft little rings of hair that would have made such an excellent lining to a nest. From this strictly utilitarian point of view, he had often admired her hair, had this blackbird fellow, as she passed to and fro among her flowers, or paused to look up at him and listen to his song, or even sometimes to speak to him in her sweet, low voice. But today she seemed to have forgotten him altogether. She did not even glance his way. Indeed, she walked with bent head, and seemed to keep her eyes always upon the ground. Therefore the blackbird hopped a little further along the branch and peered over to look down at her with first one round eye and then the other as she sank upon the seat nearby and leaned her head wearily against the great tree behind. And thus he saw a 
upon the pink gold of her cheek, something that shone and twinkled like a drop of dew. If the blackbird wondered at this and was inclined to be curious, he sturdily repressed the weakness, for here was the audience, seated and waiting, all expectation for him to begin. So, without more ado, he settled himself upon the bow, lifted his head, stretched his throat, and from his yellow bill poured forth a flood of golden melody as he burst forth into his song of memory. And what a song it was! so full of passionate entreaty, of tender pleading, of haunting sweetness, that as she listened, the bright drop quivering upon her lashes fell and was succeeded by another and another. Nor did she attempt to check them or wipe them away, only she sat and listened with her heavy head pillowed against the great tree, while the blackbird, glancing down at her every now and then with critical eye, to mark the effect of some particularly difficult passage, piped surely as he had never done before, until the listener's proud face sank lower and lower, and was at last hidden in her hands. Seeing which, the blackbird, like the true artist he was, fearing an anticlimax, very presently ended his song with a long-drawn plaintive note. But Anthea sat there with her proud head bowed low, long after he had retired for the night and the sun went down, and the shadows came creeping stealthily about her, and the moon began to rise, big and yellow, over the upland. But Anthea still sat there with her head, once more resting wearily against King Arthur, watching the deepening shadows, until she was roused by Small Porge's hand upon hers, and his voice saying, "'Why, I, I do believe you're crying, Auntie Anthea. Why are you here, all alone and by yourself?' "'I was listening to the blackbird, dear. I never heard him sing quite so... "'Beautifully, before. "'But blackbirds don't make people cry, "'and I know you've been crying, "'cause you sound all quivery, you know. "'Do I, Georgie? "'Yes. Is it cause you feel lonely? "'Yes, dear. "'You've cried an awful lot lately, Auntie Anthea. "'Have I, dear? "'Yes, and it worries me, you know. "'I'm afraid I've been a great responsibility to you, Georgie, dear,' "'said she with a rueful little laugh.' "'Fade you have, but I don't mind the responsibility. "'I'll always take care of you, you know,' nodded Small Porges, "'sitting down, the better to get his arm protectively about her, "'while Anthea stooped to kiss the top of his curly head. "'I promised my Uncle Porges I'd always take care of you, and so I will.' "'Yes, dear. Uncle Porges told me. "'Never mind, dear. Don't let's talk of him. "'Do you still hate him, then, Auntie Anthea?' "'Hush, dear, it's... "'Very wrong to hate people. "'Yes, of course it is. "'Then perhaps as you don't hate him any more, "'you like him a bit, just a teeny bit, you know? "'Why, there's the clock striking half-past eight, Georgie. "'Yes, I heard it. "'But do you, the teeniest bit? Oh, "'Can't you like him just a bit for my sake, Auntie Anthea? "'I'm always trying to please you, "'and I found you the fortune, you know, "'so now I want you to please me "'and tell me you like him for my sake.' But, oh, Georgie, dear, you don't understand. Because you see, Small Porges continued, after all, I found him for you, under a hedge, you know. <laughs> Why did you, Georgie, dear? We were so happy before he came. But you couldn't have been, you know. You weren't married, even then, so you couldn't have been really happy, you know, said Small Porges, shaking his head. Why, Georgie, what do you mean? "'Well, Uncle Porches told me that nobody can live happy ever after "'unless they're married first. "'So that was why I arranged for him to marry you, "'so you could both be happy and all revelry and joy, "'like the fairy tale, you know.' "'But you see, we aren't in a fairy tale, dear, "'so I'm afraid we must make the best of things as they are.' "'And here she sighed again and rose. "'Come, Georgie, it's much later than I thought, "'and quite time you were in bed, dear. "'All right, Aunt Theanthea, "'only don't you think it's just a bit... "'Cruel to send a boy to bed so very early, "'and when the moon's so big and everything looks so frightfully fine. "'Sides, well, what now?' she asked a little wearily, "'as obedient to his pleading gesture, she sat down again. "'Why, well, you haven't answered my question yet, you know.' "'What question?' said she, not looking at him. "'About my Uncle Porges.' "'But, Georgie, I... you do like him, just a bit, don't you? Please?' Small Porges was standing before her as he waited for her answer, but now, seeing how she hesitated, and avoiding his eyes, 
He put one small hand beneath the dimple in her chin, so that she was forced to look at him. "'You do, please, don't you?' he pleaded. Anthea hesitated, but after all, he was gone, and nobody could hear, and small porters were so very small, and who could resist the entreaty in his big, wistful eyes? Surely not Anthea. Therefore, with a sudden gesture of abandonment, she leaned forward in his embrace, and rested her weary head against his manly, small shoulder. Yes, she whispered. Just as much as you like, Mr. Cassillis, he whispered back. Yes. A bit more, just a teeny bit more. Yes. A lot more, lots and lots, oceans more. Yes. The word was spoken, and, having uttered it, Anthea grew suddenly hot with shame, and mightily angry with herself, and would straightway have given the world to have it unsaid, the more so as she felt small Porges's clasp tighten joyfully, and looking up, fancied she read something like triumph in his look. She drew away from him rather hastily, and rose to her feet. "'Come,' said she, speaking now in a vastly different tone, "'it must be getting very late.' "'Yes, I suspect it'll soon be nine o'clock now,' he nodded. "'Then you ought to be in bed, fast asleep, instead of talking such nonsense out here. "'So come along at once, sir.' "'But can't I stay up just a little while? "'You see, no. "'You see, it's such a magnificent night. "'I feel as though things might happen. "'Don't be so silly. "'Well, but it does, you know. "'What do you mean? What things? "'Well, it feels no me to me. "'I suspect there's lots of elves about, "'hidden in the shadows, you know, and peeping at us.' "'There aren't any elves or gnomes,' said Anthea petulantly, "'for she was still furiously angry with herself. "'But my Uncle Porges told me—' "'Oh!' cried Anthea, stamping her foot suddenly. "'Can't you talk of anyone or anything but him? "'I'm tired to death of him and his very name. "'But I thought you liked him an awful lot, and—' "'Well, I don't. "'But you said, never mind what I said, "'it's time you were in bed asleep, so come along at once, sir.' So they went on through the orchards together, very silently, for small Porter was inclined to be indignant, but much more inclined to be hurt. Thus they had not gone so very far when he spoke, in a voice that he would have described as quivery. "'Don't you think that you're just the teeniest bit cruel to me, Auntie Anthea?' he inquired wistfully. "'After I prayed and prayed till I've found a fortune for you. Don't you please?' Surely Anthea was a creature of mood to-night, for even when he spoke, she stopped and turned and fell on her knees and caught him in her arms, kissing him many times. "'Yes, yes, dear, I'm hateful to you, horrid to you, but I don't mean to be. Uh, forgive me.' "'Oh, it's all right again now, Auntie Anthea, thank you. I only thought you were just a bit hard, because it is such a magnificent night, isn't it?' "'Yes, dear, and perhaps there are gnomes and pixies about.' "'Anyhow, we can pretend there are, if you like, as we used to.' "'Oh, will you? That would be fine. "'Then, please, may I go with you as far as the brook? "'Well, wander, you know, I've, I've never wandered with you in the moonlight, and I, "'and I do love to hear the brook talking to itself, "'so so will you wander just this once?' "'Well,' said Anthea, hesitating, "'it's very late. Nearly nine o'clock, yes, but, oh, please don't forget "'that I've found a fortune for you.' "'Very well,' she smiled, "'just this once.' Now, as they went together, hand in hand, through the moonlight, small porters talked very fast and very much at random, while his eyes, bright and eager, glanced expectantly towards every patch of shadow, doubtless in search of gnomes and pixies. But Anthea saw nothing of this, heard nothing of the suppressed excitement in his voice, for she was thinking that by now Mr. Cassidis had read her letter, that he might, even then, be on his way to Dathomir. She even fancied once or twice that she could hear the gallop of his horse's hoofs. When he came, he would want to kiss her. "'Why do you shiver so, Auntie Anthea? Are you cold?' "'No, dear. Well, then, why are you so quiet to me? I've, I've asked you a question three times.' "'Have you, dear? I, I was thinking. What was the question?' "'I was asking you if you'd be awful frightened, supposing we did find a pixie or, or a gnome in the shadows.' And would you be so awfully frightened if a gnome, a, a great big one, you know, came jumping out and ran off with you? Should you? No, said Anthea with another shiver. No, dear, I think I should be rather glad of it. Should you, Auntie? I'm so awful glad you wouldn't be frightened. 
Of course, I don't suppose there are gnomes. I mean, great big ones, really, you know, but there might be on a magnificent night like this. If you shiver again, Auntie, you'll have to take my coat. I thought I heard a horse galloping. Hush! They reached the star by now, the star with the crooked, lurking nail, and she leaned there a while to listen. I'm sure I heard something away there on the road. I don't, said Small Porges stoutly. So take my hand, please, and let me assist you over the stile. So they crossed the stile, and presently came to the brook that was the most impertinent brook in the world. And here, upon the little rustic bridge, they stopped to look down at the sparkle of the water, and to listen to its merry voice. Yes, indeed, tonight it was as impertinent as ever, laughing and chuckling to itself among the hollows, and whispering scandalously in the shadows. It seemed to Antia that it was laughing at her, mocking and taunting her with the future. And now, amid the laughter, were sobs and tearful murmurs, and now again it seemed to be the prophetic voice of old Nanny. "'By force ye shall be wooed, and by force ye shall be wed, and there is no man strong enough to do it but him as bears the tiger-mark upon him.' The tiger-mark, alas! How very far from the truth were poor old Nanny's dreams, after all, the dreams which Anthea had nearly believed him, once or twice. How foolish it had all been! And yet, even now! Anthea had been leaning over the gurgling waters while all this passed through her mind. But now she started at the sound of a heavy footfall on the planky of the bridge behind her, and in that same instant she was encircled by a powerful arm, caught up in a strong embrace, swung from her feet and borne away through the shadows of the little copse. It was very dark in the wood, but she knew instinctively whose arms these were that held her so close and carried her so easily, away through the shadows of the wood, away from the haunting, hopeless dread of the future from which there had seemed no chance or hope of escape. And knowing all this, she made no struggle and uttered no word. And now the trees thinned out, and from under her lashes she saw the face above her, the thick black brows drawn together, the close set of the lips, the grim prominence of the strong square chin. And now they were in the road, and now he had lifted her into an automobile, had sprung in beside her, and they were off, gliding swift and ever swifter under the shadows of the trees. And still neither spoke nor looked at each other, only she leaned away from him against the cushions while he kept his frowning eyes fixed upon the road ahead. And ever the great car flew onward faster and faster, yet not so fast as the beating of her heart, were in shame and anger and fear, and another feeling, strove and fought for mastery. But at last, finding him so silent and impassive, she must needs steal a look at him beneath her lashes. He wore no hat, and as she looked upon him, with his yellow hair, his length of limb and his massive shoulders, he might have been some fierce viking, and she his captive, taken by strength of arm, borne away by force, by force. And hereupon, as the car hummed over the smooth road, he seemed to find a voice, a subtle, mocking voice, very like the voice of the brook, that murmured to her over and over again, By force ye shall be wooed, and by force ye shall be wed. The very trees whispered it as they passed, and her heart throbbed in time to it. By force ye shall be wooed, and by force ye shall be wed. So she leaned as far from him as she might, watching him with frightened eyes, while he frowned ever upon the road in front, and the car rocked and swayed with her going, as they whirled onward through moonlight and through shadow, faster and faster, yet not so fast as the beating of her heart, wherein was fear and shame and anger and another feeling, the greatest of all now, was fear. Could this be the placid, soft-spoken gentleman she had known, this man with the implacable eyes and the brutal jaw, who neither spoke to nor looked at her, but frowned always at the road in front? And so the fear grew and grew within her, fear of the man whom she knew and knew not at all. She clasped her hands nervously together, watching him with dilating eyes as the car slowed down, for the road made a sudden turn hereabouts. And still he neither looked at nor spoke to her, and therefore, because she could bear the silence no longer, she spoke in a voice that sounded strangely faint and far away, and that shook and trembled in spite of her. Where, where are you taking me? To be married, he answered, never looking at her. You wouldn't dare. Wait and see, he nodded. Oh, but what do you mean? The fear in her voice was more manifest than ever. I mean that you are mine. You always were. You always must and shall be. 
so I'm going to marry you in about half an hour, by special licence. Still he did not even glance towards her, and she looked away over the countryside, all lonely and desolate under the moon. I want you, you see, he went on. I want you more than I ever wanted anything in this world. I need you, because without you my life will be utterly purposeless and empty. So I have taken you, because you are mine, I know it. Ah, yes, and deep down in your woman's heart you know it too. And so I am going to marry you. Yes, I am, unless... Here he brought the car to a standstill, and turning, looked at her for the first time. And now, before the look in his eyes, her own wavered and fell, lest he should read within them that which she should fain hide from him, and which she knew they must reveal, that which was neither shame, nor anger, nor fear, but the other feeling, for which she dared find no name. And thus for a long moment there was silence. At last she spoke, though with her eyes still hidden. Unless, she repeated breathlessly, Anthea, look at me. But Anthea only drooped her head the lower, wherefore he leaned forward and, even as small porges had done, set his hand beneath the dimple in her chin and lifted the proud, unwilling face. Anthea, look at me. And now what could Anthea do but obey? Unless, said he, as her glance at last met his, unless you can tell me, now, as your eyes look into mine, that you love Cassilis, tell me that, and I will take you back this very instant, and never trouble you again. But unless you do tell me that, why then, your pride shall not blast two lies, if I can help it. Now speak. But Anthea was silent. Also she would have turned aside from his searching look, but that his arms were about her strong and compelling. So needs must she suffer him to look down into her very heart, for it seemed to her that in that moment he had rent away every stitch and shred of pride's enfolding mantle, and that he saw the truth at last. But if he had, he gave no sign, only he turned and set the car humming upon its way once more. On they went through the midsummer night, up hill and down hill, by cross road and by lane, until as they climbed a long ascent, they beheld a tall figure standing upon the top of the hill in the attitude of one who waits, and who, spying them, immediately raised a very stiff left arm, whereupon this figure was joined by another. As the car drew nearer, Anthea, with a thrill of pleasure, recognised the sergeant standing very much as though he were on parade, and with honest-faced Peter Day beside him, who stumped joyfully forward, and, with a bob of his head and a scrape of his wooden leg, held out his hand to her. Like one in a dream she took the sailor's hand to step from the car, and like one in a dream she walked on between the soldier and the sailor, who now reached out to her, each a hand equally big and equally gentle, to aid her up certain crumbling and time-worn steps. On they went together until they were come to a place of whispering echoes where lights burned, few and dim. And here, still as one in a dream, she spoke those words which gave her life henceforth into the keeping of him who stood beside her, whose strong hand trembled as he set upon her finger that which is an emblem of eternity. Like one in a dream, she took the pen and signed her name obediently where they directed. And yet, could this really be herself, this silent, submissive creature? And now they were out upon the moonlit road again, seated in the car, while Peter Day, his hat in his hand, was speaking to her. And yet, was it to her? Mrs. Bellew, ma'am, he was saying, on this year monumentous occasion. Monumentous is the only word for it, Peter Day, nodded the sergeant. On this year monumentous occasion, Mrs. Bellew, the sailor proceeded, my shipmate Dick and me, respectfully, ma'am, beg the favour of saluting the bride. Mrs. Bellew, by your leave, here's health and happiness, ma'am. And hereupon the old sailor kissed her right heartily which done, he made way for the sergeant, who after a moment's hesitation followed suit. "'A fair wind and prosperous!' cried Peter Day, flourishing his hat. "'And God bless you both!' said the sergeant, as the car shot away. So it was done. The irrevocable step was taken. Her life and future had passed for ever into the keeping of him who sat so silent beside her, who neither spoke nor looked at her, but frowned ever at the road before him. On sped the car, faster and faster, yet not so fast as the beating of her heart, wherein there was yet something of fear and shame. But greatest of all 
was that other emotion, and the name of it was Joy. Now presently the car slowed down, and he spoke to her, though without turning his head. And yet something in his voice thrilled through her strangely. Look, Anthea, the moon is at the full tonight. Yes, she answered. And happiness shall come riding astride the full moon, he quoted. Oh, Nanny is rather a wonderful old witch, after all, isn't she? Yes. And then there is our nephew, my dear little Porges. But for him, happiness would have been a stranger to me all my days, Anthea. He dreamed that the money moon spoke to him, and but he should tell you of that for himself. But Anthea noticed that he spoke without once looking at her. Indeed, it seemed that he avoided glancing towards her of set design and purpose, and his deep voice quivered now and then in a way she had never heard before. Therefore her heart throbbed the faster, and she kept her gaze bent downward, and thus, chancing to see the shimmer of that which was upon her finger, she blushed and hid it in a fold of her gown. Anthea? Yes? You have no regrets, have you? No, she whispered. We shall soon be home now. Yes. And are you mine, for ever and, and always? Anthea, you aren't afraid of me any more, are you? No. Nor ever will be. Nor ever will be. Now, as the car swept round a bend, behold yet two other figures standing beside the way. Yo-ho, Captain! cried a voice. Oh, please heave to, Uncle Porges! And forth to meet them came small Porges, running. Yet remembering Miss Priscilla tapping along behind him, he must needs turn back to give her his hand, like the kindly small gentleman that he was. And now Miss Priscilla had Anthea in her arms, and they were kissing each other and murmuring over each other, as loving women will. Our small porges stared at the car and all things pertaining thereto, more especially the glaring headlights, with great wondering eyes. At length, having seen Anthea and Miss Priscilla safely stowed, he clambered up beside Bellew and gave him the words to proceed. What pen could describe his ecstatic delight as he sat there, with one hand hooked into the pocket of Uncle Porges's coat, and with the cool night wind whistling through his curls? So great was it, indeed, that Betty was constrained to turn aside and make a wide detour, purely for the sake of the radiant joy in Small Porges's eager face. When at last they came within sight of Dapplemere, and the great machine crept up the rutted, grassy lane, Small Porges sighed and spoke. "'Auntie Anthea,' said he, "'are you sure that you're married nice and tight, you know?' "'Yes, dear,' she answered. "'Why, yes, Georgie.' "'You don't look a bit different, you know, either of you. "'Are you quite sure? "'Cause I shouldn't like you to disappoint me, after all.' "'Never fear, my porges,' said Bellew. "'I made quite sure of it while I had the chance. "'Look.' "'As he spoke, he took Anthea's left hand, "'drawing it out into the moonlight, "'so that small porges could see the shining ring upon her finger. "'Oh,' said he, nodding his head, "'then that makes it all right, I suppose.' "'And you aren't angry with me because I let a great big gnome come and carry you off, are you, Auntie Anthea?' "'No, dear. "'Why, then, everything's quite magnificent, isn't it? "'And now we're going to live happy ever after, all of us, "'and Uncle Porteous is going to take us to sail the oceans in his ship. "'He's got a ship that all belongs to his own very self, you know, Auntie Anthea. "'So all be revelry and joy, just, just like the fairy tale, after all.' "'And so at last they came to the door of the ancient house of Dapplemere whereupon very suddenly Adam appeared, bare-armed from the stables, who, looking from Bellew's radiant face to Miss Anthea's shy eyes, threw back his head, vented his great laugh, and was immediately solemn again. "'Miss Anthea,' said he, ringing and twisting at his hat, "'or I think I should say Mrs. Bellew, ma'am, there ain't no word for it. These days not as I know one know how. No words be strong enough to tell you the J-O-Y joy, ma'am, as fills us one and all.' Here he waved his hand to where stood the comely prudence with the two rosy-cheeked maids peeping over her buxom shoulders. Only, pursued Adam, I be glad, and, and mortal glad I be, as tis you, Mr. Bellew, sir. There ain't a man in all the world, or, or as you might say, universe, as is so proud as you be the husband to our Miss Anthea's was, and not now how, Miss Bellew, sir. I wish you joy, and a joy as shall grow with the years, and abide with ye always, both on ye. 
That is a very excellent thought, Adam, said Bidu, and I think I should like to shake hands on it. Which they did, forthwith. And now, M Mrs. Bellew, ma'am, Adam concluded, with your kind permission, I'll, I'll step into the kitchen and drink a glass of Prue's ale to your health and happiness. If I stay here any longer, I won't say but what I shall burst out of singing in your very face, ma'am, for I do be that happy-hearted, Lord. With this exclamation, Adam laughed again, and, turning about, strode away into the kitchen with Prudence and the rosy-cheeked maids, laughing as he went. Oh, my dears, said little Miss Priscilla, I've hoped for this, pray for it, because I believe he is worthy of you, Anthea, and because you have both loved each other from the very beginning. Oh, dear me, yes, you have. And so, my dears, your happiness is my happiness, and, oh, goodness me, here I stand talking sentimental nonsense while our small porges is simply dropping asleep as he stands. Afraid I am a bit tired, small porges admitted, but it's been a magnificent night, and I think, Uncle Porges, when we sail away in your ship, I think... I'd like to say around the horn first, because they say it's always blowing, you know, and I should love to hear it blow. Now, good night. Wait a minute, my porges. Just tell us what it was the Money Moon said to you last night, will you? Well, said Small Porges, shaking his head and smiling a slow, sly smile. I don't suppose you'd better talk about it, Uncle Porges, because, you see, it was such a very great secret. And besides, I'm awfully sleepy, you know. So saying, he nodded slumberously, kissed Anthea sleepily, and, giving Miss Priscilla his hand, went drowsily into the house. But as for Bellew, it seemed to him that this was the hour for which he had lived all his life. And though he spoke nothing of this thought, yet Anthea knew it instinctively, as she knew why he had avoided looking at her hitherto, and what had caused the tremor in his voice, despite his iron self-control. And therefore, now that they were alone, she spoke hurriedly and at random. What did, did Georgie mean by your ship? Why, I promised to take him a cruise in the yacht, if you cared to come, Anthea. Yacht, she repeated. Are you so dreadfully rich? I'm afraid we are, he nodded. But at least it has the advantage of being better than if we were dreadfully poor, hasn't it? Now, in the midst of the garden, there was an old sundial worn by time and weather, and it chanced that they came and leaned there, side by side. And looking down upon the dial, Bellew saw certain characters graven thereon in the form of a posy. "'What does it say here, Anthea?' he asked. But Anthea shook her head. "'That you must read for yourself,' she said, not looking at him. So he took her hand in his, and with her slender finger spelled out this motto. "'Time and youth to flee away, love. Oh, love them whilst ye may.' "'Anthea,' said he, and again she heard the tremor in his voice. You have been my wife nearly three-quarters of an hour, and all that time I haven't dared to look at you, because if I had I must have kissed you, and I meant to wait until your own good time. But, Anthea, you've never yet told me that you love me. Anthea? She did not speak or move. Indeed, she was so very still that he needs must bend down to see her face. Then all at once her lashes were lifted, her eyes looked up into his, deep and dark with passionate tenderness. Aunt Priscilla was quite right, she said, speaking in her low, thrilling voice. I have loved you from the very beginning, I think. With a soft, murmurous sigh, she gave herself into his embrace. Now, far away across the meadow, Adam was plodding his homeward way. And as he trudged, he sang to himself in a harsh but not unmusical voice, and the words of his song were these. When I am dead, diddle diddle, as well may hap, you'll bury me, diddle diddle, under the tap. Under the tap, diddle diddle, I'll tell you why, that I may drink, diddle diddle, when I am dry. End of chapter 31 End of The Money Moon by John Geoffrey Farnell